Good morning, and at this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? Recording to PC started. Recording to cloud, all set. Backups all set. And Sergeant Hannah, would you please start with your opening? Uh, good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations. At this time, would all panel panelists please turn on their videos? Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. Chair, we're ready to begin. Good morning. My name is Fernando Cabrera, and I am the chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations. We have been joined by my colleagues and members of the committee, quite a few. So let me go down the list. Council Member Majority Leader Combo, Council Member Powers, Cornegie, Lander, Adams, Ampli Samuel, Kalos, Lewis, myself, Miller, Rodriguez, and Ye Rodriguez and Yeager. Today, the committee will be holding an oversight hearing on the implementation of ranked choice voting, also known as RCV in New York City. In 2019, New York City voters approved with 74% of the vote, a ballot proposal to implement a ranked choice voting system for all local primaries, primary and special elections. This includes races for mayor, public advocate, controller, borough president, and city council. While this, is, while this is a new voting system for New Yorkers, it is not new. It exists in jurisdictions of different sizes across the United States. Beginning in 2021, New York City voters will be asked to rank up to five candidates in the order of preference, instead of selecting just one candidate in each contest. If one candidate receives more than 50% of the first choice votes, that candidate will be declared the winner. No candidates receive more than 50% of the first choice votes the candidate will, with the fewest numbers of first choice votes, will be eliminated, and voters who rank their candidate first will have their second choice candidate counted instead. This process will repeat as necessary until two candidates remain, at which point the remaining candidate with the most votes is declared the winner. Today, the committee expects to hear an update from the Board of Elections on their preparations to implement the system. 2021 is the biggest year for local races in recent memory with open contests for all citywide offices and two thirds of the city council seats. We cannot afford to get this wrong. Community outreach and voter education will also be critical to the success of the RCV rollout and I am pleased that the Campaign Finance Board has already begun planning their outreach campaign. In September, the board testified before this committee and, sh and shared a roadmap detailing its, detailing its efforts to engage community partners and prepare simple materials in multiple language, languages so that voters in next year's special special and primary elections are informed when they cast their first RCV ballots. I look forward to hearing updates from the board today on their voter outreach campaign. I also hope to hear a commitment from the Board of Elections to collaborate with the Campaign Finance Board around RCV in 2021 and beyond. Additionally, the committee will be hearing two bills, introduction number 1994, sponsored by council member Alika Ampresamiel in relation to a voter education campaign regarding ranked choice voting and pre-consider introduction sponsored by council member Lander in relation to the reporting of unofficial election night results for ranked choice voting. I will let the bill sponsors give more details in their statement. However, I wanna thank them both for their commitments to the voters of New York City. Change is hard, but I believe we can ensure that voters are equipped to face these changes. 
these bills will help us get there. Thank you to my colleagues for joining, joining today's hearing and the many staff working behind the scenes to ensure this remote hearing runs smoothly. I also wanna thank my committee staff for the work on this issue, called on the Dream Team, Committee Council C.J. Murray, Senior Policy, Policy Analyst Emily Forjom, Elizabeth Cronk, and Elizabeth Cronk, and Senior Finance Analyst Sebastian Bocci, and my Communications and Legislative Director Claire McLevain. In addition, I will be remiss if I did not acknowledge that BOE is dealing with a coronavirus outbreak in my home borough of the Bronx to those BOE employees who have gotten sick. Please know that we're thinking of you and we wish you a speedy recovery. I would like now to invite Council Member Lander to give a statement on his bill. Uh, let me I defer to Council Member Ampri Samuel, Samuel if she wants to go first. What was that, Council Member? Oh, I was just deferring to Council Member Ampri Samuel, whose bill I think of as ahead of mine in line here. Oh. Is that okay, Chair? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I, I appreciate that, Councilmember Landon, Lander. Um, thanks, Chair Cabrera, for holding this hearing and the opportunity to speak on my ranked choice voting voter education bill, intro number 1994, that was introduced in July. As we look at election reform around the state and country, we have to keep historical voting rights at the forefront of this reform. A robust multifaceted voter outreach and education campaign is an essential best practice. Voters in other states like ranked choice voting, but we must do our part to set up every voter for success. The transition to ranked choice voting from the current system is a major change. We have been using paper ballots since 2007 and confusion persists at polling sites throughout the city today. A new tally system invites a level of analysis that can be absolutely intimidating in an already fraught system. With this knowledge, it is our responsibility to provide purposed and all embracing education to voters. Anything less is voter suppression. The city charter called for a plan for a timely implementation of ranked choice voting. Today, we are just weeks before the first special election and the board of elections is scrambling to find a vendor. It is imperative that we, the New York City Council step in to ensure that voters aren't further adversely affected. My bill, 19, 1994, highlights the requirement for a comprehensive public education campaign that is necessary and it needs to happen now. We are looking at special elections and a news and world dominating pandemic that require ramped up and significant efforts to ensure that all voters are reached and this is a very difficult time. Through partnerships, there is an opportunity to raise awareness through traditional media, including local papers, radio spots, print materials available at public libraries. But I also want to say that funding for small community-based operations will go a long way in education efforts. As this bill highlights and outlines, mobilizing New York City's extensive public infrastructure like NYC kiosks, city agencies, bus, subway ads, and social media will benefit the voter education campaign. We can use the New York City's census outreach as a best practice model on how to reach New Yorkers, but we know that that too was a challenge. This is not about whether we should have ranked choice voting. That's a whole other story. That has already been decided. This is simply about making sure that voters in districts that have been historically disenfranchised are not further pushed out and left behind. That's the purpose of this bill, to educate the voters and how do we do that and to ensure that the agencies are doing what they are supposed to do. So thank you, Chair, for the time. And I look forward to, the, to today's discussion. Thank you so much, Council Member, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. Uh, before uh, we hear from Council Member Lander, let me recognize we also been joined by Council Member Eugene and Council Member Perkins. With that, let me turn it over to Council Member Lander. 
Thank you very much, Chair, for convening this hearing and for allowing me to defer to Councilmember Amphrey Samuel, whose uh, bill was introduced before mine. Honestly, I support my bill for reasons I'll say, but of the two, I think hers is even more important on today's calendar, and I'm proud to be a co-sponsor, and, and also I knew she would give an eloquent opening statement. So, um, um, you know, as she said last year, the voters in the city of New York voted overwhelmingly by referendum to adopt ranked choice voting. Let's remember it was almost three quarters of New Yorkers across all the boroughs with overwhelming majorities in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. Um, and I think they made a good decision. You know, my read on ranked choice voting around the country is more people participate, uh, more women and people of color are elected. Um, you get better, less hostile and nasty elections and you certainly avoid the need for expensive runoffs. But um, as Councilmember Ramprey Samuel said, whether you agree with what the voters voted last year uh, or not, ranked choice voting is now here and it is in our collective interest to make it work as well as it possibly can to make sure no one is disenfranchised, to provide good information, to make sure the results are reported clearly and to do our job in oversight to make sure it's being implemented effectively. So I'm grateful to you chair for convening this hearing so that we can make sure it is. Uh, I completely support Councilmember Amprey Samuel's bill to ramp up and increase outreach across all communities. Everyone is capable of ranking their preferences, but that doesn't mean everyone knows what it's going to look like on the ballot, how to do it, that this is the first opportunity to understand it and think about it in advance. We can achieve that. You know, we can help people understand what it is and make sure it's a successful election. So I really support her bill. My bill. Uh, relate, which is a pre-considered bill on the agenda for the first time today, would require the New York City Board of Elections to report on election night, not only the first place tallies, which is what may well happen otherwise if we don't pass this bill, but the round by round, uh, the round by round tallies, the tabulation of what's happening in round one, round two, round three, until there's a winner. That's how the final results are gonna be tabulated. That's what's gonna determine who wins these races. And if we only on election night report the first place votes without showing the counting, I think we're going to confuse people. I think some days later when they get the results, they're going to, you know, we're not going to have been transparent. We also have the challenge that we'll have more absentee ballots to count in all likelihood um, in the elections this year, just as we did in this past year. Um, but I think that's even more reason to make sure that the election night results that we report look like what is reported subsequently. It's my understanding that we'll hear about it today that the tabulation machines are perfectly capable of doing that um, and that you can see the results tabulated by column. So you know all the first place votes, but then you also see what happens in the subsequent rounds and ultimately who the winner is. Um, and even if on election night, we only have 70 or 75 or whatever percent of the votes it will be, still better to count all the votes, provide all the information so that we're transparent and giving all the information we can to people rather than having the kind of mirage of first place votes replaced by the later information of the ranked choice tabulation and counting. Thank you very much. I look really forward to the hearing. Thank you so much, uh, council member. And I will now turn it over to our moderator, council member CJ Murray to go over some of the procedural items. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. I am CJ Murray, Counsel to the Committee on Governmental Operations. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony today will be representatives from the New York City Board of Elections and the New York City Campaign Finance Board. For the Board of Elections, Executive Director Mike Ryan will be providing testimony and Deputy Executive Director Don Sandow will be available to answer questions. For the Campaign Finance Board, testimony will be provided by Executive Director Amy Lowprest and Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs, Eric Friedman. Panelists, I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your question. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the committee chair. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Executive Director Ryan, Deputy Executive Director Sandow, 
Executive Director Lowpress and Assistant Executive Director Friedman, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath once and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Executive Director Ryan. Yes. Deputy Executive Director Sandow. Yes. Executive Director Lowpressed. Yes. Assistant Executive Director Friedman. Yes. Thank you. Executive Director Ryan, you may begin your testimony. Yes, uh, Chair Cabrera and uh, council members, thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify on behalf of the board uh, on this uh, very uh, important issue. Uh, Chair Cabrera, I understand uh, that uh, this committee uh, has quite a robust uh, agenda. Time is limited. Uh, with respect to uh, intro 994, that uh, details responsibilities of the campaign finance board, not the New York City Board of Election. And, and in fact, 1057G places the public education aspects of, uh, of ranked choice voting into the uh, ambit of, of the campaign finance. That said, uh, the board is in fact standing at the ready to partner uh, with the campaign finance board to provide uh, any information and assistance uh, that the campaign finance board needs in order to uh, complete its mission. Uh, as uh, in, in reverse, under other circumstances, uh, the campaign finance board assists uh, the city board uh, when necessary. I know that uh, there have been uh, conference calls. Uh, everything is a Zoom conference these days. I know that there's been several of those uh, between the respective uh, entities. Uh, the board has also established uh, its landing page on its website, ready to be populated uh, with content uh, once that is all uh, completed. Uh, so then we get to the as yet unnumbered uh, intro uh, introduced by uh, uh, Council Member Lander. Uh, and I just would like to defer to the chair on how would we make best use of our time uh, with respect to that. If it makes more sense to get uh, right to uh, the questions uh, and answers uh, so that we're, we're, we make sure that we're answering the city council's uh, questions specifically. Uh, uh, certainly, I would like to do that. I would also like to say uh, that the board shares uh, with uh, council member Henry uh, Samuels uh, concerns that the public education piece of this is a very, very foundational element of the success of RCV and also of the ability of individual voters to participate effectively in the voting process and to have meaningful access uh, to the voting process. Uh, so uh, that underscores our readiness uh, as well to, uh, to stand shoulder to shoulder with the Campaign Finance Board uh, to make uh, certain that uh, all of that work gets done. That said, it is a concern as well uh, that that gets done effectively, and it must dovetail neatly with the uh, poll worker education piece, since these ballots uh, will look different uh, at the poll sites. And we want to make sure two things. One, that there is no actual interference with a voter's uh, right to vote, and also that there is no appearance of an interference uh, and that could even come in the form of a well-meaning poll worker uh, trying to uh, explain the ballot to the, to the voter and have it look like they're guiding them uh, in a particular direction. These are the sensitivities uh, that we all must deal with, CFB, uh, the board, uh, and the, uh, the council and the public uh, at large. So uh, that, that said, Chair Cabrera, uh, I, I please would take direction from you in that regard. Uh, thank you so much, Director Ryan. Uh, feel free to uh, address uh, Landers, Council Member Landers' bill. Uh, that way, uh, it will make it easier for our questions and where to direct our questions. Uh, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, the the other thing uh, I would be remiss uh, if I uh, if I did not mention, uh, we began. Uh, our official communication with the State Board of Elections regarding ranked choice voting on December 19th, 2019, uh, by way of written communication. Uh, 
uh, seeking uh, to have the messaging and the processing of potentially two or multi-page ballots uh, at the poll sites uh, and, and some changes to the election system that the city board is not permitted to do of its own volition. Uh, so that communication began uh, last December. In February, we met with our uh, election machines vendor ESNS to discuss ranked choice voting. Uh, and then shall we say, and then COVID-19, uh, which created uh, a, a pause for everyone. Uh, we resumed our communication with the State Board of Election on written communication, uh, not just verbal, on June the 17th. And there have been numerous uh, written communications back and forth. Um, last week, uh, it seems as if uh, the State Board of Elections uh, did, did not come to a decision on whether or not uh, approval or certification of the algorithm software necessary to process uh, the uh, election results, uh, that did not happen. So we are proceeding apace uh, with respect to our process. Uh, coincidentally, today is the last day to answer the request for proposals uh, that was published on November the 16th. And we all already have some vendors uh, that, have, uh, that have responded. We also have a backup plan because the current vendor that we use has a utility that allows for the processing of, of the results. So there is a plan in place uh, for that. Getting to the substance of, of uh, Councilman Lander's uh, uh, proposal or intro, uh, we share the transparency goal, uh, but we must say that under the present circumstances, uh, in order for us to process uh, round one, uh, beyond round one. We need access to what's called the cast vote record. The cast vote record resides on the portable memory devices on each of the individual DS200 machines that are deployed in the field. What we get on election night are the aggregate results by election district not the individual cast vote records. And in order to effectively process what happened in round one, who gets to move on to round two and beyond, we need those cast vote records in order to be able to make that process uh, complete. So leaving off to the side, the other issues associated with not a simple plurality, but a 50% plus one, which is the way that the, the, um, the uh, ranked choice voting must work. Uh, we need to be able to do that each round with a level of specificity. And we, under the present circumstances, we don't have, literally do not have the ability to have access to the cast vote records on election night. Now, moving on to some of the other concerns, we have recently seen a, a, a remarkable uptick in absentee balloting. And when you're doing math, and I, I don't mean to be uh, overly elementary about this, but when you're doing math and you're seeking to establish a percentage, having the full universe of, of numbers available to establish uh, the percentage is an essential aspect of that. And so if we have a large number of absentee ballots and particular campaigns um, are better at conducting an absentee ballot operation than others who appeared to be in third place on uh, election night could very well leapfrog uh, into first place. And then that, that transparency may become uh, murky to the to the general public. Like, how could this happen? We want full faith uh, in the process, uh, and I think that that's going to uh, include an effective uh, public education uh, program, but also that the board does not put out results that ultimately are potentially more confusing uh, to the voters uh, than they would be if 
we take it in stride and step by step. Uh, so uh, the, I think when you look at the results on election night, it all seems uh, kind of easy. You get votes and you do math and, and, and there they are. Uh, but we have worked very diligently to be extremely transparent in our election night results by making sure that we've sped up the process of completing that work on election night so people aren't waiting until three or four o'clock in the morning to find out uh, who uh, has uh, prevailed, apparently. Uh, and we do a very good job at that. This is introducing an entirely new layer to that. And the system is designed to process aggregate results based on election districts, not the individual votes cast uh, on election night. So we need access to those individual cast vote records in order to be able to process each subsequent round, because this is a different way of, of vote tabulation. And who makes it to the next round will affect the outcome. And so having a full uh, uh, complement of all of the votes cast is is the cleanest way to do it, uh, for sure. Uh, and on election night, the way that the system is set up, we just don't have uh, the ability to do that uh, presently. And I know I, I've, I've said a lot, so perhaps uh, it would be best that we pause there, and then we can hopefully get into a more technical uh, explanation of that, such as a lawyer and a non-tech person can give under these circumstances. Thank you so much, uh, Director Ryan. Uh, let me just share with my colleagues. I'm uh, probably only gonna be uh, asking questions just for about 10 minutes. I know we have a lot of colleagues that have questions, so I, I wanna defer uh, to them uh, quickly. Uh, so you won't have to be waiting long, and then I'll come back. Uh, we're wrapping up with a set of questions before we go to CFB. I wanna, focus on first uh, director Ryan in uh, in on the software uh, we on we understand that in October the the state board provided the BOE with a draft testing plan for the CRV tribulation software uh, what testing will be required under the draft plan and how long is such a testing expect, expected to take? So based on our current understanding of the position that the state board has taken, uh, the state board met on December the 3rd, uh, and this issue was, uh, was brought up. The state board commissioners did not come to a consensus on whether or not they will require testing, uh, either for approval or certification uh, for the algorithm a software. So I probably glossed over it in my statement, but that's what I said when I, that's what I meant when I said we will be proceeding apace. Uh, if the State Board of Elections is going to remain with its current position, which is no position, then the City Board of Elections is going to keep moving forward and do what needs to be done in order to complete implementation. We have, uh, as I said, we have the RFP out. We're getting responses back. Uh, we have a projected uh, contract date of January the 15th, and we have a fallback position in the event that that uh, is not uh, completed for uh, February, which is to utilize the utility uh, that ESNS uh, presently has. Uh, that's not our long-term goal, but we, it's been demonstrated to us. It works, and we would prefer to have a separate uh, vendor provide uh, that for us. And we also understand that it's possible that there is at least one entity out there that has um, a, a software that might be available uh, at no cost based on uh, general availability uh, and their interest in seeing RCV uh, be uh, more widely used. So what would happen if 
the state board determines the certification is required, uh, how would BOE conduct the upcoming special election? Let's say uh, the 10th, that they will take a bit longer than you expected it, which I would have, to be honest with you, be hopeful that they were already have told you either way. I don't understand why can they just tell you either way so you could go ahead because we don't, we're running out of time here. But what would happen at, at, in such a case? Uh, it, it does not appear that the state board is going to take action in that regard. And, and we're going to be able to choose uh, a, a vendor of our choice at, or uh, in the worst case scenario, use the backup, uh, which can work. Uh, I can't speak uh, for the state uh, board of elections, nor, nor could I speak for what actions they may take to attempt to prevent the city board uh, from moving forward. We have our mandate. Uh, the city charter is uh, our guidepost in this regard, and we are going to pr proceed forward with uh, implementation uh, unless uh, and until some higher uh, powered authority uh, tells us not to. So uh, Director Ryan, just so we can have it on record, you're confident then that we will have the software ready uh, and selected by January 15th. Yes, and if, and, and if not, we have a backup plan as well. Okay. Uh, as I said, that was already demonstrated to us last February. And as I have been wont to say, uh, in the halcyon days when we thought that RCV was going to be our biggest challenge uh, for 2020, uh, we had a meeting in February to get ready for, you know, uh, more than a year later. And uh, unfortunately for everyone, uh, you know, circumstances took a, a turn in a completely unpredicted and, and in some respects tragic uh, direction. Director, I, I'm going to direct attention to uh, a point that you made as to the cast vote record for the average layman person uh, who don't understand what a cast vote records are. Uh, what would be the process? What do you anticipate uh, will be a fair amount of time uh, to be able to put forth the result, the rank, the RCV results, and then uh, follow up with that. Why in some other cities or state, for example, Maine and other states, are they able to be uh, rather quick about it? And they're able to uh, be able to bring those results rather quickly. So in terms in terms of uh, the the overall results, uh, the canvas process uh, we've all become very familiar with. The the one thing I will say, uh, and perhaps we might be seeing some relief in that regard and get us closer to where Council Member Lander wants us to land. It it appears that the state legislature is in the process of taking a critical look on how we process all boards of elections, not just the city of New York, but all, all 62 counties, how we process absentee ballots uh, and, and the timing of when we can process uh, those absentee ballots. If some of those changes that we've heard uh, rumor might be happening are made, uh, we can canvas absentee ballots be up to uh, you know, the days leading up to election day. In which case, uh, it may very well be that those totals will be included in the results that we report out on election night and get us much closer to where uh, Council Member Land wants to land. Uh, so that's one uh, piece of the puzzle. And, and I would say that this is one of those moments where we as the board, even though we're a ministerial agency, we would you know, implore the city council and the state legislature to work hand in glove so that whatever changes are made square nicely with the requirements on the state law and also the requirements on the 1057 G and that we don't move headlong here to do something. And then it doesn't square well with, uh, you know, with what the state is proposing uh, 
uh, as as further changes to the process. I'm going to finish a little earlier uh, than I anticipated because I really, uh, we have a lot of council members that have questions and I know they're very eager. Uh, it's a very important issue uh, to them. And so with that, I, I want to pass it to our uh, council, to, uh, to the committee, and then I'll come back uh, wrapping up with some questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you've not yet raised your hand, please do so now. You'll have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Once I have called on you, please wait until the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your question. First, we will hear from Majority Leader Cumbo, followed by Council Member Powers and then Council Member Cornegie. Majority Leader Cumbo, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. I want to thank everyone that's here. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues for putting forth this legislation, but I, in all due respect to my colleagues, I, I have to go off the grid for a moment on this because this is such an incredibly important issue um, with one of the largest transfers of power as far as elected leadership and seats. This is a really important issue. And I feel very passionately um, in what we've seen in the national elections of the role that African-Americans specifically played, uh, particularly women and our seniors. And I believe that there is an impossibility to educate people in the amount of time necessary on what ranked choice voting will mean. Sure, it's simple to just say, fill out the bubble, but at the same time, Individuals that will be voting will not understand the calculus and the complications of the ability to fill out those bubbles and what those bubbles will mean as far as they uh, fill out the ranked choice voting forms. So my, my question in many ways is how much um, is the city prepared to pay to even educate people on ranked choice voting, given into consideration that the census that the city put in over 40 million, and I believe the state somewhere in the ballpark of $70 million. Are we prepared to do that? I'd also like to know what is NYCHA's plan? How are we gonna reach out to our NYCHA residents in order to inform them that also have one of the largest black and brown populations in the city of New York? I also wanna know everything from when uh, individuals have to turn in their ballot, what percentage of them actually turn over the ballot because they've been educated to know to do that. When it comes to the judges and you have to rank maybe three or four out of six, how many actually complete that process? They say all throughout the, the country that ranked choice voting is working well for communities of color. Well, New York City is a, a totally different city and I would also add that we don't know in those cities how much those cities spent on education. We don't know the percentage of black and brown communities there. We don't know what was the outreach plan. We don't know any of those factors. And given the pandemic, I have no confidence in our ability to reach our seniors, to reach those who are sheltering in place. And I do not feel that it is a good use of our funds at this time um, somewhere in the ballpark of $40 million when we have food insecurity, when we can't get food to our seniors right now. We need to have our priorities placed in other ways. So my, my first question really is, what is the NYCHA plan at this moment? How many, what has been the community engagement process thus far? And I know with the census, the elected officials had a huge role and responsibility in getting out the vote. We have not been educated on ranked choice voting at all. There has not been one seminar. No one has asked us to participate. How much money is being invested in ranked choice voting? Majority Leader Combo, was that question directed to, to me? Um, I, I would say on both the, on, for the Board of Elections, yes. Uh, so we engaged in or a anyone very- anyone qualified to answer those questions. Right, I think, uh, under the circumstances, that question would be more aptly directed to the campaign finance board, respectfully. All right, I need them to jump in quick because I'm on a timer. All right. Campaign um, finance board. Thank you. thank you very much. 
Um, so we have been planning and doing research for about a year on how to educate voters about ranked choice voting. I haven't given my testimony yet to, to explain the plan, but we um, have a robust plan to partner so with you're a variety. You're still formulating of the plan. And we're six or seven months out of the election with special elections coming up. So we're formulating a plan at this point? We have a plan. I mean, we've spent the past year formulating the plan and we have a plan for how to implement the education campaign for ranked choice voting. You're contradicting um, what you're stating. You're stating that, you that you're creating a plan, that you have a plan and that the plan has been implemented. It can only be one of the three. We're in the process of creating, we have a plan and we're in the you're process. Creating of or you have a plan. Well, that's, what this, that's what this hearing is about. You have, have a, plan a plan or you're creating a plan. We have so, a plan and we are in the process of implementing that plan. Well, so, that's insufficient with an election, a special elections a, a month or two away and a, and a citywide election. Time seven expired. Uh, one thing I'll note, Councilman Vernon, and, and yes. we appreciate the question. Um, and and I, there are many details of the plan and how it's being implemented in our testimony. But I would like to note that NYCHA is one of our community partners that we've worked with over the years uh, throughout this year and we'll be working with through next year to provide uh, information to voters about how to cast their vote with confidence. It's an impossibility to begin the process of reaching out to NYCHA at this time. If you have not already had a plan and had been working a plan for the last year to reach out to our NYCHA constituents and others, you know, this is going to be an issue of broadband. This is going to be an issue of accessibility. This is going to be an issue of how do you educate people during a pandemic where they have to social distance, people shouldn't be coming into people's homes as they did for census. It's an impossibility to educate those that are most disenfranchised, that don't have computer access. We've seen with the breakdown in our education system that do not have access uh, to computers, to internet, that are not able to be visited by people. The people that are gonna benefit the most from this are those with internet access, those that are younger, those that can download apps, and those are not what we have seen, the voter base that impacted national elections. Those individuals, African-Americans, Latinos, there is no way to effectively communicate because I've run a campaign. There's no way to effectively communicate to those individuals between now and election day. This is going to be a way for those that have the ability to um, understand the calculus and teach a complicated calculus to individuals to say either you should ranked choice vote. Either you should only vote for three people. Either you should vote for five people. Like there's gonna be a calculation of manipulation that for those that are most in tune will understand how to operate. Those that are essential workers that are fighting for their lives, that are trying to educate their children, that are single parents at home are not gonna have the time, capacity or energy to learn about the new calculus for ranked choice voting. It's an impossibility. This needs to be suspended by the charter. And in addition to that, it needs to be postponed for another election year. When the voters voted for this, we were not in the middle of a pandemic. This is an emergency and this is not the best use of our time or our resources. So essentially you've answered all of my questions because I was at least hoping that you would say that over the last year, we have been educating people about ranked choice voting, but there's still a plan that's being thought of, that's being written out, that's about to be implemented. I didn't even hear what is the budget amount that is being put forward for ranked choice voting. That's my final question. I appreciate the comments and, and happy to talk more after we've uh, provided information in our testimony. I'd like to know the budget amount. Um, Right now, the budget for just particularly for ranked choice voting, but since is million dollars. Is how much? Also is how much? A million dollars. A million dollars. And we spent $40 million on the census and didn't even really get a huge turnout in that way. So you're going to utilize a million dollars to implement a plan that's still in the thought process. This is like, this is like the most flagrant that that is that justice is, that I've seen politically ever. This is a political injustice to our people. And I'll finish my comments and questions there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member. 
Thank you. Next, we will hear from Council Member Powers, followed by Council Member Cornegie, and then Council Member Lander. Council Member Powers, you may begin Time. upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time thank starts you. now. Uh, thank you for the testimony. I'm just going to go back to um, the Board of Elections for a minute here. Um, I might have heard this, uh, but I wanted to just clarify again. After the um, uh, after election night, how, how long or, or on election night, how long do you believe under ranked choice voting it will take for the Board of Elections to be able to tabulate? We know there'll be we know there'll be paper afterwards, but how long do you think it'll be to take to tabulate the uh, results for election day under new ranked choice voting? Well, I think that's going to make a uh, it'll be a difference between you know, what we can do for February and what we would do for a full citywide, right? The smaller uh, the, the the contest, the more concentrated it is, the quicker we get the machines back, the quicker we can do the uploads. And we can do that, uh, presuming that we have access to the facilities in the in the, the next day, uh, we can do that within within several days, four to five days. But, but you also got to keep in mind that uh, we have to receive the absentee ballots as well up to seven days. Uh, after the elections for primaries. Uh, thankfully, it doesn't apply to, uh, ranked choice doesn't apply to generals because for militaries, that would be 13 days. Uh, so we do need the full, and, and I know we want to separate it between absentee ballots and election day ballots, but a ballot is a ballot is a ballot. A vote is a vote is a vote. Everyone has their uh, right to have their vote not only counted, but but meaningfully counted. And so we need that full uh, 100% universe of votes so that when we're tabulating the rounds, we're doing it with transparency and not using the uh, rubric of transparency to create a lack of transparency because results will seemingly change, uh, you know, from minute to minute as more votes get added to the process. Yeah, I, I recognize that, but that happens now also. <laughs> see changes in outcomes based on like this year that happened in a number of places. What I want to know is let's just say February, for an example, on election night, what do you anticipate we will know in terms of where the race stands under ranked choice voting? As I'm using so, the February one, since that's the most. That's so the based one. on based on our reading of uh, 1057G as it presently stands, we would we would publish the first place, uh, first position votes for each of the candidates. But, but council council member powers, and I, I I don't mean to be overly argumentative, so please don't take it that way. I'm so why, why why ranked choice voting is different is because the results are the who is in the next round depends on the results from the previous round. Right. Okay. So, so you so, might so, so, am, am I right to say your concern is that we're gonna publish the first place votes on election night. And then it's going to take you a sequence of days to do round two and round three or the other subsequent rounds. And you're concerned about the, the changing of the race and the results as a result of that? No, it's it's the reverse. If we were trying to make an effort to publish the rounds on uh, unofficially on election night uh, and then we add the paper in. Who survived the first round may change based on the paper. Okay, okay, I got, I got and you. With each, I got and you. with each subsequent round, that's that's our concern. So you might have a candidate you think survived to round two, and ultimately when we had the paper in, didn't survive to round two, and that's going to happen with multiple permutations, okay. and we don't know how many candidates are ultimately going to be uh, in the mix. Okay. The more I candidates just, you add, the, the more difficult the math becomes. Just based on timing, I just want to – sorry, yeah, I, I got it. I got I you. Um, I want to ask two questions. One is poll worker training. When do you expect you'll be doing poll worker training for this? I do think that's going to be an important, in addition to education, getting the people in the poll in place to be able to explain this to folks. And I'm going to ask, I'm asking that because also in Manhattan, for instance, we have a state race, which is the district attorney's race happening concurrently with the uh, citywide races when we get to June. So how does the work, how will the voting work for the two different races? That particularly might include the poll worker aspect of it, but want to know timing of poll worker training and what type of training you expect will happen. And then also how do you deal with a district attorney race happening concurrently with a citywide race or, or the city races? So the timing of the training is right after the first of the year, we're going to have to engage training uh, the poll workers that would be utilized for, um, for the February 2nd 
but I also want to throw out a couple of dates just so that the record is clear. We have to mail out the military ballots for the February 2nd special election by December the 18th. Uh, and we have to commence conducting early voting for the February 2nd election on January the 23rd. Time. So we have a very limited window um, uh, to do some training for uh, for uh, February. And then uh, after that uh, election was concluded, we would then uh, turn our attention to uh, the, the training of the poll workers that we need for the full uh, citywide uh, election in June. Now, the city charter uh, does not permit uh, ranked choice voting contests to be on the same side of the uh, of the uh, ballot as non-ranked choice voting. So if you have one you know, series of contests, they'd be on one side, anything implicating ranked choice would be on the other. But the other thing that you also have to factor into this uh, is that uh, several of the parties have reorganization years, which also make for a busier ballot because of all of those uh, re uh, party positions that are uh, assembly district and then ultimately election district based. So we have a lot more, potentially a lot more candidates uh, on, the, on the ballot uh, for those party positions uh, than we would under other circumstances. Got it. Okay. So your answer, I'll, I'll end there, but your answer basically on the, the state and city thing is you'll have to have put them on different sides, but it's yeah. you also have to educate folks about what they're doing on, you'll have to poll workers being able to do, I think some aspect of this, which is to be able to, you know, instruct and educate folks. Correct. And, and we also, when doing that, want to be sensitive to uh, the instructions to the poll worker to make sure that they don't appear to be telling people who to vote for, as opposed to simply just, this is a new process and this is how you have to vote. And those two things are very uh, different, but also very significant. Okay, thanks for the answers. Thanks for the- Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just, um, just give a, a point of order for my colleagues uh, to reserve any questions regarding CFB after the testimony because in fairness to them, they haven't testified yet. And then we'll, we'll have another five minutes uh, for everyone to ask any question if you choose to do so. So you actually have more time than you thought you had. <laughs> okay. All right, let me give it back to the committee council. Thank you, Chair. Uh, next, we will hear from Council Member Cornegy, followed by Council Member Lander, and then Council Member Adams. Council Member Cornegy, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. So I uh, uh, couldn't help after that first testimony of being a little bit angry, so I'm gonna stick to my prepared remarks as not to get too emotional. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Thanks to Chair Cabrera and the Committee on Governmental Operations for holding this oversight hearing on the implementation of ranked choice voting. Shirley Chisholm became the first black woman in Congress because she mobilized women voters in Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights. Those powerful visionaries changed the country. If a voter was say 21 years old during this election in 68, she'd be 73 years old today. While our country had the vision to empower African-American voters with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, we're in danger of doing the opposite. We're disempowering that 73 year old voter because he had failed to meet the benchmarks to inform her about the new ranked choice voting process. Because of COVID-19, the voter education essential to the success of ranked choice voting never happened. That mobilization of awareness, raising, and education is absolutely necessary to ensure that Shirley Chisholm voters are aware of ranked choice voting, how it works, what it means, and how to participate. We have to recognize the reality of the digital divide. Not everyone has access to the online resources that most tech savvy voters access. We need to be sure we are reaching people attending community board meetings, black association meetings, precinct council meetings, and their family, friends, and neighbors. That is websites, videos, fact sheets, ballot samples, outreach and engagement programs, promotional materials, language accessibility. That's why intro 1994 is so important. That is that we are now less than two months away from the first planned election with ranked choice voting. One would hope the Board of Elections would have provided more detail. On July 28, 2020, the council discussed intro 1994, which I believe is necessary for the success of ranked choice voting. Back then, we called for a November 15th deadline for a few key benchmarks by the Board of Elections. A brief video explaining how ranked choice voting works, a fact sheet explaining how ranked choice voting works, 
and an example of how a ranked choice ballot could look. If you look on the Campaign Finance Board website, none of these three benchmarks have been accomplished. Not only that, if you search for the words ranked choice voting on the Board of Elections website, you get zero results, except for some minutes from February 2020. So the Board of Elections was aware of the challenges in February, but took no concrete action. We're required to follow the city charter. Do we really want to have an election that doesn't fully include women who voted for Shirley Chisholm? We need participation of all our communities. By not completing the necessary steps for ranked choice voting to succeed, we're failing these women and we're failing all New Yorkers. Let's do all this, let's do all the steps laid out during the implementation plan of ranked choice voting, and let's face the fact that we're not, we will not be ready for the elections in February and or the elections in June. Thank you. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we will hear from Council Member Lander, followed by Council Member Adams, and then Council Member Yeager. Council Member Lander, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you very much. For this panel, I'm going to really focus on the legislation. And uh, I think there's some broader issues after we hear from the CFB and the things that my other colleagues are talking about. So um, I guess a couple of things, and I'll just put them all out there. First, it is my understanding um, uh, that the DS200s can submit their cast vote records via secure modem. Uh, I understand that that is separate from the election district level uh, data, but I, at least as I understand it through Fair Vote and some other um, uh, some other folks, that the DS two hundreds are able to do that. So I guess I want to understand. I assume we're submitting the election night data on secure modems anyway, and not just like on old dial up accounts. So I guess I'm not sure why that secure modem can't provide the cast vote records. But my real issue here is, y you're right that things will change from election night to a few days later. You gave the example that someone who is in third place could go into first place, but we still report those results on election night and we know it might change when the absentee ballots come. And a few days later, if the absentee ballots put the third place voter in the third place candidate in first place, then those are the results and they come out when those ballots get counted. By the logic that we wouldn't wanna do that because it was confused people, we just shouldn't report anything on election night. We should wait until all the absentee ballots are counted. And then we should tell people when we've counted all the votes, here are the results. And that would be the best way to make sure we didn't provide any misleading information up front. So if you wanna say, let's do that, let's just wait, not give any election night data in order not to confuse people that things will change. And when we've counted all the absentee ballots, then we can tabulate the ranked choice results and then we'll tell people who won. And you'll have some very anxious candidates for a couple of weeks, but you know you have that anyway because the results are gonna change. But it doesn't make any sense to me to say, um, like it's not as though you're just gonna say, here's who won. You're gonna show in columns. Here's round one, all the first place votes in round one. Then in column two, you're gonna show all of the first place votes with the last place candidate eliminated and now who got the most? And sure, if subsequently, as a result of absentee ballots, a different candidate's in last place, then when you show the new column two, the column two will change and you'll have a different one candidate eliminated, just like if the third place voter had moved up to second place before they moved up to first place, that would change over time too. But to me, what you want to do is show people the same thing on election night that you show them when you update the votes a few days later, that you show people when you update the votes when all the absentee ballots are counted. And what's more confusing is, is shifting like totally what you're showing people. And I, it just doesn't, I mean, I, it just doesn't make sense to me that you would go ahead and give people first place results. Um, and then it, you know the tabulations, but you're gonna withhold it until all the absentees are counted. Mm -hmm. Like you are gonna show people something that's much more different than those initial results. So um, if we can't do it, we can't do it. But it's my understanding that the cast vote records can be submitted by secure modem um, and that we could show people on election night. Yes, we've only counted 70% of the votes so far. The absentees are coming. But based on the ones we've counted, here's all the data we have. We're giving it to you in a chart. It's going to change over the next few days. And as it changes, the chart will look different. And which candidates are in the final two, which candidates are eliminated in the first round, that's gonna change just like it might've changed that the third place elected candidate might now be in second place or might now be in first. 
I guess maybe it's just I have a little more optimism. Yes, we absolutely have to do good outreach. Councilmember Ampri Samuel's bill is essential. But I really believe that the reason New Yorkers in every borough voted for this is that they like the idea of ranking. They're, they know how to do it. They know how to make their preferences. And with some good education and outreach, they're going to be able to rank the preferences on this ballot. They're going to like that they have this opportunity. They're going to, I think, intuitively understand that it actually supports a broader and more diverse array of candidates. And then when we show them the chart, they're going to be like, oh, that's interesting. That's different than I saw it before. But I understand with some good education how that counting takes place. And we could give that to them on election night. And then we can give them the updated results once all the absentee ballots are counted. So my time is up. I guess I want to mostly ask about the, um, the cast vote records and why they can't be transmitted by secure modem, uh, because I think on just what to present, we just have a disagreement rather than a set of questions. So to answer that first question, uh, uh, council member, it's very simple. New York state law does not allow uh, the publishing of election results by secure uh, motive. Uh, How there do we is do it on election night. Then what are you? Uh, well, so what happens on? So let, let me get to the to the first piece of it to really answer that question. Uh, the DS two hundred machines have the capability of either being uh, hooked up to a hardwire network or use an air card feature. New York State election law does not allow that uh, to avoid any potential tampering uh, with the election results. So what we do on election night is. There are two portable memory devices in each DS200. We remove the unofficial results stick on election night and upload uh, those results via uh, the, uh, the tablets that we deploy at the poll sites. And we rely on the uh, encryption uh, and, the, and the air firewall, uh, wireless firewall that we have uh, in place. So those results are not the official results. The other uh, sticks, the, uh, the other portable memory device remains with the, uh, the, uh, the DS200 uh, locked and secured and sealed in place. And when those machines are retrieved, uh, they are brought back to our various warehouse facilities. Uh, and as they are received and processed, uh, those results are then uploaded uh, into uh, the uh, election management system uh, separately uh, by an entirely separate process from election night. And the reason it's done that way is if something were to happen to alter the results from election night or sticks were not uh, completely uh, read, uh, the official results would still be in place. And if something goes wrong with the official results stick, we have the ability to uh, process the paper ballots uh, that are in uh, the, uh, the the securely in the blue ballot bin lines. So it's sequential and separated for a reason. Uh, and that's to maintain system uh, integrity. So what you're suggesting, uh, council member, is, is not possible. And the way that the uh, unofficial results are presently captured uh, in the system are in the aggregate by election district. So right this minute, it's not set up to accommodate uh, what you're suggesting. Now, once the vendors are, uh, the vendor is, is finally selected and we get back together with ESNS and we talk to the, to the algorithm software vendor, if there's a way for us to change the process moving forward to make sure that it's more transparent, well, certainly uh, we're happy to do that and we're happy to work uh, with the city council uh, to make sure that we can include whatever accommodations we can. Okay, so just for this year, and this will be my final question, I appreciate the, the indulgence, Chair. You, you, it sounds like you could do it in the few days after election night once you've got all the sticks back at BOE, but that you're proposing not to do that, that you're proposing to put up first place ballots on election night and people will just know first place from in-person and early voting, and then you're going to wait however long it takes to, you know, the seven mandate, the mandated days, plus however long it takes to count them and wait till the end of that process, not only to add the absentee votes when they come, but then to provide for the first time the tabulation by round. And I, I just, I mean, to me, that feels like people really are then going to feel more bait and switched than if they had seen the results 
earlier in time. I think it will be more confusing for people to understand what happened in these elections if if they're waiting that long to see what happens in the ranked choice rounds. And, you know, uh, it may be that that anxious candidates are gonna be gnawing their knuckles, but that's not the purpose of this hearing. The purpose of this hearing is what gives the voters the most transparent clarity about how the counting oh. is working. And for my money, you do a lot better when you provide people with the information that you have when you have it and treat them as adults who are able to understand what's going on uh, to say we don't really trust them. Getting all this new information is just going to confuse them more. I, I mean, that's government being arrogant about the intelligence of its voters, and and I think it's a mistake. So anyway, I, I'm going to leave it there. I got a lot of colleagues who uh, who want right. to testify, and I appreciate and, all the points. And to just made. and just to put a fine point on it, uh, I won't speak to the the last uh, portion of your of your comments, Council Member. But uh, with respect to preference and comfort level. Uh, one of the things that caused us to a, a bit of concern was that the intro was to be effective immediately, which would then affect the February uh, uh, election. And, and we do have some time between now and June to really work collaboratively okay. together uh, with people that have, I'm talking, I know uh, Majority Leader Cumbo, I know what you're talking about on the public education piece. I'm simply talking about the mechanics I, of tabulation. I That's would be totally limiting. Open. If, if you could implement this bill for the, the June uh, primary and couldn't do it for the specials before then, I would be certainly glad to talk with you about amending the bill to have this cover the June elections when the vast majority of the city is going to experience its first round of ranked choice voting um, right. you know, and live with the first place tabulations for the couple of elections that we have. Between. What I just want to be clear, the city charter made a bright line division between the responsibilities of the campaign finance board and the Board of Elections. And what's happening here is those separate responsibilities are becoming mixed in this conversation. And I don't wanna step on the Campaign Finance Board's ability to make their own case for what they need to do. And I'm We're speaking narrowly to my bill about right. election night tabulations, which is exclusively about uh, the Board of gotcha. Elections. Gotcha, and so I'm just, and I'm just talking as well about the mechanics of what we have to do the work that we can control. And all I'm saying is we're happy to work with others to see if adjustments can be made to assumptions that we made mechanically, not public education, not any of those other things, just the mechanics of vote tabulation, which is a little bit more esoteric than these other, you know, and largely more important issues. I think that some of the other council members are addressing. I agree on that, which is why I wanted Council Member Jeffrey Samuel to go first. And I, I don't want to spend more time talking about tabulation here when I agree that education is, is more important. So I'll, I'll end here and we can follow up this conversation offline and afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Lander. Next, we will hear from Council Member Adams, followed by Council Member Yeager, and then Council Member Miller. Council Member Adams, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony so far. Um, I will be amplifying the sentiments of my majority leader later on uh, in this hearing. However, um, uh, Director Ryan, um, just getting back to today. Today is the deadline uh, for vendors to submit the RFPs in today. Has the BOE ever in recent history issued an RFP for a vendor to provide vote counting software for an election with a deadline of only three weeks. I'm gonna move on to the next one, think about that. And I'm also I'm interested in your answer about uh, the free software in which city-wide elections, comparable to New York City's population, has the free software that you referenced, the universal ranked choice voting tabulator been used? How do we compare that to the population of New York City? Also, when taking a look at District 24 and the elections coming up in Queens right now, a subject very, very near and dear to my heart, um, uh, we, we, we know that uh, Council Member Lanceman's seat was projected to be, it was rumored to be uh, vacated shortly. So I, I'm just wondering about the, um, the, the, the uh, failure uh, to respond in a timely manner uh, to that election coming up as quickly as it's coming up. We're looking at uh, uh, the, the, if, if the BOE suspected that a special election would be scheduled at the beginning of the year, why did it not move more quickly to contract with its in-house vendor, ES&S, 
to acquire the ranked choice voting tabulation software instead of waiting to issue an RFP 10 days after the mayor declared the February 2nd special election. Uh, and also, I'll ask this and I'll let you respond. I've got a couple more, but the clock goes really fast in these hearings. Um, the the um, a BOE uh, uh, representative told the Queensborough Board, I was in that meeting in October, that it would focus on the implementation of ranked choice voting following the November general election. And a spokesperson later said in a statement that, quote, the Board of Elections is ready to implement ranked choice voting and begin a public education campaign and poll worker training immediately following the December 22nd City Council special election in Council District 12. If the BOE won't be ready to implement a ranked choice voting public education campaign until the 22nd of December, would its failure to not educate the absentee military voters in Council District 24 by that time serve to, in effect, disenfranchise them? Um, I will stop there. I've got more, but I will stop there. And if the clock allows, I will ask more. Thank you. So with respect to your first uh, question, uh, Council Member, uh, the software uh, firmware that we use presently to tabulate is approved by the State Board of Elections. So we have not issued an RFP with respect to tabulation ever before because we were never called upon uh, to do so. We use the state uh, process. We have been working with the State Board of Elections for a determination whether or not they were going to require some type of uh, approval process or certification process of the algorithm software. So if you're asking why it didn't happen till now, we did not get an answer from the State Board of Elections whether they were going to impose their authority. And if we were going to uh, expect that a, a fair process would be, uh, would be utilized for the vendors, the vendor has a right to know what's gonna cause them to be eliminated from contention. And if a state certification process was going to eliminate a vendor from contention, they would have a right to know that before putting a bid together. And that's why this process trailed as far as it did. But the other thing is we're in the middle of a pandemic too. And the Board of Elections hasn't closed its doors, not one day, not one day. And so we, had a, we haven't not stopped working since uh, this pandemic started. And at one point we had about 75 employees reporting to uh, work every day. And we still got through the petition process uh, in June and had candidates on the ballot because people stayed here and worked uh, tirelessly. So if we're going to talk about delay and not getting things done, we can't talk about that delay as if it's happening under normal circumstances. <laughs> it's happening in the midst of a pandemic. And I share uh, Leader uh, Cumbo's concerns in that regard because we went straight from the middle of a pandemic to conducting a presidential primary. The presidential primary was thrown back on the table with no notice, uh, two weeks notice. Then we had to go through the whole summer of certification with an unprecedented amount of absentee ballots. We put the infrastructure in place in order to process those absentee Aye. ballots better for the November general election. And in the meantime now, as, as Chair Cabrera said, we have, and, and we certified on time, and as Chair Cabrera said, we have, uh, a special election going on in the Bronx right now, and we're dealing with a COVID outbreak in the Bronx and having to come up with a uh, staff rotation and all of those things. And by the way, we're all human beings too. And we have families and we have concerns and we have health uh, concerns and pre existing conditions and all of those things. And so, you know, I, I'm, I, please don't mistake my passion for my employees as disrespect to this uh, proceeding. But all of us here, our employees, management at the Board of Elections, the safety and security of our employees has weighed heavily on us uh, for many months now. And we're all looking for that light at the end of the tunnel. And we're all on the same team. And I would hope that we can all row together uh, to make the process work as best as it can for all voters in the, in the city of New York and also uh, you know, understand that our staff are not robots, that they're human beings, and we're doing uh, the best we can under very, very difficult uh, circumstances. And the type of work that we do 
uh, to put on elections does not lend itself uh, so much to remote work. And, you, you know, we had, a, we had a decision to make in the lead up to, Nova, uh, to, to June. We cannot allow VPN, virtual private network, access to our voting records. Because if there was some type of outside uh, interference, then the voting records could be potentially corrupted and then we wouldn't have an election to conduct. So, you know, voting machines cannot be programmed in the, in the living rooms of employees. They have to be done at warehouses. The, the voting uh, records have to be managed in a closed network environment with utmost uh, security. These are all challenges that other agencies uh, don't necessarily face. They can do some of their uh, public uh, you know, contact remotely. The board can't do that. We have to be open to receive petitions. We have to clock them in, you know, and, and it's, it's a very, very difficult and challenging time uh, that we're all in. And so thank you for uh, uh, indulging me in that regard, but I, you know, but that's where, where I land on that council member. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from council member Yeager followed by council member Miller and then council member Ampri Samuel. Council member Yeager, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I, I appreciate the, uh, uh, the reflection you made earlier about uh, reserving questions for the campaign finance board uh, till they testify, but I, I have no questions for them. I will address their testimony, which I've already read, uh, notwithstanding. Um, but before I do that, I, I would first remind uh, my colleagues and my fellow New Yorkers that uh, we have had ranked choice voting in this city. It was school board elections. And I remember spending hours and hours as a teenager uh, in, the, in the public schools after the ballots count, the day after day after day after day, uh, you know, this person thought they got elected until the next box was opened and counted. Now, I recognize that electronic systems today uh, would, would necessarily uh, result in a different method of counting and a different uh, uh, time for that to happen. Um, but uh, we still are encumbered by state law, which requires a week to wait until absentees are received and opened um, and the like. Uh, I will, without, without quoting, um, but I will uh, align myself with the majority leader, with Councilman Cornegy, with Councilmember Adams, on the words that they said and the questions that they have about uh, this new process. Um, uh, I'll also say something that hasn't been said yet. Maybe it doesn't get this to be said in polite company, but this is the city council. Ranked choice voting is racist. It is, it, it is designed to be racist and its intent is racist and its result in New York City will be racist. It is designed to prevent minorities from electing their own. I say that as somebody who spent my entire life in public service and in political service, trying to elect black and Latinos to public office, including the first Latino Democratic nominee for mayor of the city. The idea that we would now, in the midst of everything that's going on in this city, try to create a system that restricts, that changes the way people vote. And frankly, uh, the idea that it's coming from the sector of our politics that raised so much uh, um, umbrage to the idea of New York City being removed from the Voting Rights Act's pre-certification requirements, and yet seem to have no problem with changing the manner in which an enormous number of New Yorkers will cast their ballots is ridiculous to me, but at the same time, it's understandable. If you look to who's supporting it, you understand why they're doing it. I understand it, and we'll hear later from people who will testify and you will understand from them as well why they're supporting it, to institutionalize the type of government that they want at the expense of the type of government that most of New Yorkers want. Now, a lot has been said about 74% of New Yorkers voting yes on ballot question one, which the Campaign Finance Board mentions in page one of its testimony. Campaign Finance Board also spent uh, three or four pages uh, lauding the virtues of ranked choice voting, which frankly, with due respect, Madam Director, is not your job here today. You're not here to tell us why ranked choice voting is a good thing. You're here to tell us how you're going to get that message out to New Yorkers and explain how ranked choice voting works. But notwithstanding, I'm not encumbered in any way 
by the notion of 74% of New Yorkers having voted that way because my community rejected ranked choice voting. My district rejected it. My district rejected all five of those bad questions last year. And my district overwhelmingly rejected ranked choice voting because they understood. Now, speaking of understanding, you devote um, uh, time, campaign finance board, Madam Director, in your testimony, your eight pages, which you'll read for 20 minutes in a few minutes, but I've already read it, so you can save me the time and I'll save you the time, uh, to the focus groups that you've had. And I'll read one quote. Because of the anticipation of ranked choice voting, I'm seeing more candidates be nice to each other, lovely thing, and socialize with each other and talk about their similarities and differences instead of being negative or divisive, which we can all appreciate. That's wonderful. That doesn't sound like anybody I represent. That sounds like you spoke to some folks in Park Slope. That doesn't sound like the communities I represent. I would love to know the demographics of the people you had in your focus groups. Now, to your voter guide, which I read every year, I read every election, I will also tell you in my life, in two decades, almost three, I look younger than I am, perhaps, I have never met anyone who wasn't a candidate for public office who read the magazine you send out. Not a single person. The idea that you're going to promote the education of this new system through your magazine and then followed up by, and I quote from page four, the online RCV resources, which are a core part of your outreach plan to voters. Time. You're behind. You're leaving behind, Mr. Chairman. I know I have another five minutes coming up when they uh, subject themselves to the victim chair, but, uh, and I'll wrap up quickly, uh, but you're leaving behind the people in New York who, who Councilman Cornegie is talking about, the people who voted for, for Shirley Chisholm. You're leaving behind people of other languages. You're leaving behind people who are new to voting. You're leaving behind people who are finally getting their arms around marking a paper ballot after years on a lever machine. You're leaving those people behind because we're gonna be online. And, and this will be my last point before I move on, because I think this is very important. As you indicate, we have two elections immediately scheduled. We have two elections potentially scheduled in March. The first election being, I think, February 5th, February 2nd, followed by February 23rd, followed by two more in March, special elections. Yet, you recommend that, and I quote from page seven, the implementation date be moved to June 1st, 2021. How can we do that? We have people about to vote in mostly minority neighborhoods in New York City, in Far Rockaway. We have people who are getting ready to vote in a couple of weeks, and, and you're not going to be in a position to tell them how to do this. And I, I will yield back to the chair because I know the time is pressing, um, but, but I, I want the, the, the board, please, to ponder these as you get ready to do this. And please, please, I beg you, do not waste our time. Do not waste our time here today by telling us what a wonderful system the ranked choice voting system is. That is not your job. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we will hear from Council Member Miller, followed by Council Member Amprey Samuel, and then Council Member Rodriguez. Council Member Miller, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Council Member Yeager. For, for your your testimony, let me also say I think I would be remiss because we're we're talking uh, very specifically about the importance of implementation around ranked choice voting, the education, and the preparedness of such implementation. Um, I'd be remiss if if I did not say if not for the request of the Black Latino Asian Caucus and its allies in this council, we would not be having this hearing here today. The fact of the matter is that this hearing was scheduled for Friday the 11th. Many people that are on this call with us today, we were on a call Wednesday night preparing for next Friday. And we got an email on Thursday morning at 9.30 saying that it had been pushed up. So we're talking about preparation. It seems to be preparation or the lack of seems to be the mode of moving ranked choice voting uh, uh, forward. And so um, to the detriment of so many New Yorkers, it is so obvious that, that um, communities of color are going to be disenfranchised. But there are so many others as I, I, I go around uh, the city of New York, I have prefaced it in hundreds of Zooms that I've been on uh, since uh, this pandemic, um, there has probably not been one that I have not asked about ranked choice voting. And 
less than 10% of any of those calls. And most of the time, the people that attend these Zooms are, are sophisticated electric. And, and they, um, for the most part, don't know what ranked choice voting is. And then that 10% dips even lower when you ask them to explain it. And so outreach, education is, is just super important. Uh, the one thing I do agree with the uh, 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 chair over here is, is, is that uh, the integrity of, of any election is, is, is vitally important. And what we've seen and what we are coming out of in the general election, certainly we, we, we don't want to duplicate that. And before I get on and ask my question, this thing about inclusiveness and getting people to participate, the fact of the matter is, is 13% of the registered voters in New York participated in this off year election that implemented ranked choice voting. And of that 13%, 70% uh, of that actually turned the ballot over. So there is your mandate uh, for ranked choice voting. Um, so if, if, if we can talk about uh, preparation a, a bit here, and I am, I am super disappointed that the BOE did not uh, provide testimony in advance or even uh, read uh, testimony, uh, which talks about preparedness. I was on the same call with my colleague, uh, Borough Board call uh, in, in October, uh, uh, talking about preparedness um, for uh, with the BOE, talking about preparedness, and they lauded their ability to roll this out, and, and clearly we have not seen that. So implement, in their implementation plan, it did not provide any details of public education campaign it intends to develop but it would conduct outreach engagement efforts with community-based organization, conduct roundtable discussions and planning sessions with such groups right. in public messaging, around public messaging, and is appropriately targeted to reach the highest number of voters. Um, the question would be, to date, how many of these uh, RSV, RSV roundtables, discussions and, and planning sessions uh, have occurred and what, what community-based organizations um, were, were involved in those. Uh, and, I, and I know that in, in, in the past, this line of questioning had been passed off to campaign financing, but fact of the matter is this is in your implementation plan. And so we would like to hear that. Furthermore, um, the, the, the city uh, did not provide a statement on the Board of Elections fiscal needs for RSV implementation uh, during the 21 budget. Presum presumably, it was due to um, uh, the pandemic that we are facing, but uh, certainly uh, the budget um, implica implications uh, 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 would certainly have an outcome on this, and, and we'd like to know about that. And then we certainly would like to know about those roundtable discussions and those target audiences. And let me, before you answer, just say and reiterate what was said time and time again. Right. Those target, target audiences are black and brown communities of color. Just look at Atlanta, look at Arizona, look at Detroit, look at Philadelphia, and look at Milwaukee. That not just saved the Democratic Party, just saved America. I think we got this democracy down pat. Uh, if you want to answer those questions and uh, based on um, the roundtable discussions as well as the budget, please, sir. So in, in terms of the prepared testimony, uh, we were anticipating that this uh, would be uh, on December the 11th. Uh, we had just completed a certification of a presidential election. We're operating uh, shorthanded and on short notice, the, uh, the hearing date was moved up. Uh, so we, I'm sorry, if I may, we were told it was moved up because this was the day that the board of election would be available. Absolutely. 100% incorrect. The date was moved, having nothing to do with the board of elections. The only thing that we asked for was if it had to be on the seventh, that it be later in the day than 10 o'clock in the morning and an hour and a half accommodation was made. Uh, so this was absolutely not our choice. We never indicated to anyone that we would not be available on December the 11th. Uh, and a matter of fact, just so that we're clear, I was having a medical procedure on December the 10th and still coming in on December the 11th. 
uh, to be ready to testify. So, so no, that's not correct. Uh, in any event, I'm going to reiterate what I said earlier, which is the public education piece of this falls in the ambit of the campaign finance board. That's where it lands. Our role here is mechanical. We're certainly happy uh, to assist the campaign finance board in any way uh, that we can and provide them all of the information that they need for the implementation of the public education plan by the design of the city charter falls within the ambit of the campaign finance board, not the board of elections. Other than the fact that we're a board and they're a board, we're not the same. And so we have to limit our discussions here to our role. And I'm sure that you'll have an opportunity to could we talk about the budget? That. Could we talk about your budget then and 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 how this is impact, impacting implementation? And 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 I'll substitute that question out then for um uh uh for um absentee ballots. Right. So the the budget really doesn't change all that much for us except for the uh the uh the uh, the acquisition of the software uh, that's that's going to happen and some uh, additional uh, poll worker training, uh, but it's not it's not a budget breaker for us in the in the way that a robust public education program uh, would be having just come off one where we spent uh, quite a bit of uh, city resources to make sure that everybody was educated about the presidential election. Uh, so uh, we're talking about a limited. Uh, resources from our end because it's not a it's not a um, hardware acquisition. The hardware that's presently in place can tabulate uh, the votes uh, accordingly. Uh, we build ballots anyway, and they're printed on the same paper, irrespective of how many candidates uh, there are or how many choices there are. Uh, and and the the balance of it is training uh, for us and the software. And from what I've seen. Uh, the software potentially, and I don't want to get too far ahead of the RFP process, but potentially uh, the software costs are minimal in comparison to our overall budget and maybe even uh, non-existent if one of the vendors that provides uh, you know, public access to their, uh, their software is, uh, is, is made available to us. Uh, so... Uh, you know, we will be engaging in some, uh, you know, public education with respect uh, to, to videos and how to fill out the ballot and such. And we'll supplement uh, what the campaign finance uh, board does. But it's not a major uh, budgetary impact. And you're right, Councilman uh, Miller, uh, that uh, everyone's, I think, budget testimony in uh, the lead up to the uh, to the uh, budget process uh, in March uh, and, and April and May was uh, truncated and in some cases eliminated because of COVID. And, and absentee ballots, what is your responsibility there? Oh, with the absentee ballots, we would have to uh, process them and, and, and mail them out the same way uh, that we would, whether ranked choice voting is uh, implemented or not. So at, 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 as far as this, uh, the, the timeline for the February 2nd, what, what, what does that look like in terms of uh, Board of Elections responsibility in getting out uh, the materials to those absentee voters? We have to mail them out by December the 18th to the military uh, voters and to the temporary federal voters, that being individuals who may be residing overseas who indicate that they intend to return to the United States. And then other absentee voters? Other absentee voters would be processed upon request of the absentee voter. I think the entire universe of potential voters for the uh, this, this first one coming up in Queens is about 90,000 voters total. And, 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 and the entire universe, they would have to, uh, those ballots would get to them by when? When is the last uh, absentee ballot? going out when when is the first of the last group that would 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 be would, would qualify for absentee ballot when, when so would that go out so the first group has to go out by december the 18th then we would turn our attention to what we call our permanent absentees anybody who has said right. that they have a, a disability and they uh, want that 
uh, and they, they would get processed. Uh, and then we process requests as they come in. And theoretically, you could, you know, up until the day before Election Day, uh, come in and vote uh, in office in person, which is technically an absentee vote. So it continues right up and through, uh, you know, to Election Day. And, and are we taking into consideration this COVID universe? The second wave that we find ourselves in currently and, and, and going into in this? Well, well so uh, you, you know, still. We, what provisions are happening? Sure, we're still in a, we're still, the, the current state of the law still is that voters have to request an absentee ballot. So if they request it, we'll fulfill uh, the, the request uh, as we did uh, with uh, upwards of a million uh, absentee ballot requests for this uh, past uh, general election. And, you, you know, uh, there was like over 700,000 for June. So we've become uh, fairly well versed in the processing of absentee ballots on a large scale uh, recently and by necessity. Uh, and so uh, this would be a much more limited universe of potential requesters, uh, you know, right around 90,000 as a as a, a full universe. And then some lower number of them uh, would request absentee ballots. Okay, uh, could you expand that through June? So what, what that absentee ballot may look like in the current COVID environment? Well, it really does come down to voter choice. The voters have to request the absentee ballots. I know that there's some proposals in the state uh, legislature that may change uh, how that occurs we, based on what we saw for the general election. Right. So um, I, I don't know if I necessarily understand the question, right? Because temporary illness on the COVID uh, was extended uh, through the end of the year. I think it can be extended again uh, by executive order, but executive orders are only good in 30 day chunks uh, from the governor. So we, we just have to continue to monitor the process. I will so tell I'm you. I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. But, but based on what you just said, without an executive order, uh, we, we would have to revert back to the normal absentee process and you cannot check uh, the, the temporary illness uh, COVID box. Uh, I would have to double check. I think that there was definitely some legislative action that extended that through the end of the year, but I think it expires December 31st of 2020, I believe. Uh, okay. But- I wasn't, uh, I didn't prep, have that uh, at the ready, but I believe it is December 20, uh, 31st, 2020. And then after that, uh, additional either legislative change or, or executive action would be required to, uh, with, with regard to the signature requirement for an absentee ballot uh, and also using COVID-19 as a, under the temporary illness uh, designation on the application. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your indulgence. Thank, Thank you, you Councilman. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Council Member Amprey Samuel, followed by Council Member Rodriguez, and then Council Member Kalos. Council Member Amprey Samuel, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. I'm starts now. Hi, thanks. Um, just because of all of the different questions, um, I literally had my questions lined up and um, clearly things have been a little bit all over the place and um, my emotions have gotten the best of me since I've been sitting here. Um, I just wanted to be like, just really first say that I really wish that CFB and BOE would have been able to, um, to testify together because if we're talking about um, the machines and the process and, and um, training poll workers and everything else. And we're talking about like just the customer experience and what's happening now, it just makes sense that CFB and BOE would have testified together so that um, we can have a real conversation as to how the overall voter is um, going to be able to go through this process. And I think that's a problem in New York City. Every agency, every board works in silos. That's a huge problem. And um, I really wish we would get to a point where that's not the case because it allows for one agency to say um, or use the excuse, that's not my um, role. That's not what I'm doing. That's not my focus. 
when indeed where everything that happens with the Board of Elections is um, definitely goes hand in hand with what's happening at um, Campaign Finance Board, um, especially when we're talking about um, voting and training and education and everything else. And that's, that's from my experience. I was a district leader 20 years ago. And, um, and this was before CFB. And so um, you'd like CFB really playing this role in, in educating voters. It was the Board of Elections that was, you know, that took on that role and responsibility and making sure that the poll workers knew what to say to the workers. Um, uh, so anyway, um, yeah, again, that's my feelings. Um, uh, Council Member Landa, you said good education, resources and outreach is what's really needed. And I just want to, you know, like highlight that good education, resources and outreach. That is key. That's true. But what does that look like today? Right? We had this whole conversation about what's going to happen on the day of election and the day after the election. Um, but a big piece of it is how do we get people to the polls during the damn pandemic? Right? And, you, you know, Board of Elections talked about safety and security for all New Yorkers. How do we make that happen today? During the pandemic, you know, it's the, I read through CFB's testimony, like the first four pages is talking about um, why our, our CV is appropriate and, you know, why it's important. That's not what we're talking about. You know, we're talking about the fact that we need to make sure that voters are educated and that they know what they're doing and they have, community-based organizations have the resources that they need to get people to the polls, right? And when they get there, they know what they're doing at the polls. That's what this is about. And we're kind of like dancing around all this other stuff. And the real question is, do we have a system in place that speaks to the fact that not only were we in a pandemic, but there were also serious racial tensions that led to pure violence in this city and around the state. So I don't want to get to a point where we are, election reform is important. And that's what this is, you know, we've always been um, advocating and voting for and talking about uh, um, election reform, but let's not rush reform at the detriment of real uh, change in making sure that people can actually get to vote. Like, we talked about the fact that we were in a pandemic as if we are not in one right now, as if the numbers are not on the rise, right? So how can we even go forward without really speaking to whether the Board of Elections, with all your lessons learned, with canvassing ballots and everything else, with all those lessons learned, can you really make sure that this new system is implemented in the way that speaks to safety and security, that speaks to real education, and that speaks to making sure that people are not disenfranchised. Because again, there is a real difference in New Yorkers. We talk about the tale of two cities, we know what it is. And so to just like move forward and disregard that whole big piece of it is disrespectful within itself. And so, you know, whereas I had this list of questions, you know, I, I really, I, I'm just kind of pissed off that we have to wait, you know, it's one, almost 1.30 before CFB could even speak to what they're doing, right? And that's the, 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 the a big piece of all of this, um, you know, the timing of it. Um, and so I, I, I'll just end with that, but I also, I, I also want to just kind of highlight the fact that in the CFB report, and I and I say this, and I have to jump off because I have to right. at one thirty. But in the CFB report, it actually speaks to all of the planning, right? But this planning took place during the pandemic, and so how do you incorporate all of what has to happen if we're in the middle of it? And how can you be assured that you can't? Like I ain't even gonna ask that question. You can't. There's no certainty. Everything is different. The world is different as we know it. And so we're just simply saying that, you know, in my bill, there's an education piece of it, but can you realistically be able to pull together that education, those resources and the amount of time that's needed? And so those were my questions. And um, after reading the testimonies, I know what the answer is. And just from this conversation, I know what the answer is. I don't think we're there, but it's necessary. And that's why this legislation is so important to ensure that that happens because clearly city council always has to step in to make the, like, I wish we can just rely on agency policies, but sometimes we have to put things in the bill and the law to, to, to make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're acting in the way that they're supposed to be acting. Um, 
So just a comment, um, but as a question, BOE, can you tell me what you're doing with uh, rank choice? What, what are you doing with CFB right now um, as far as just the training piece of it? Uh, as uh, first uh, council uh, member, we share the concerns. We're members of the community too. We share the concerns that everyone uh, has uh, stated here today. And we want, whenever this is implemented, we want it to be implemented effectively. Right now, we're acting under a mandate. Uh, both us and the CFB have been mandated by the city charter to, to put our best efforts to move forward to do this. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, we have had uh, our in respective staffs have uh, interfaced uh, with respect to uh, implementation. We, as I stated in my testimony earlier, have um, uh, created a landing uh, uh, page on our website to populate that with, uh, with information. Uh, but again, in terms of the public education piece of it, we cannot uh, infringe on the city charter's mandate of the campaign no, finance just, board. Just, just to be clear, just one, one real quick question is just a no. Um, you're operating under a mandate, but right now, today, do you think that we should move forward with um, implementing ranked choice voting in the 2021 um, primary and special elections based on what you have um, in front of you? If we were not acting under a mandate, do you think that we should be moving forward with implementing ranked choice voting in 2021? So the difficulty with an answering that question is we are acting under a mandate. That's the problem. No, no, no. So, I, I, so, I, so, so in the pretend world, we're, not, act like we're not. I'm just, that's the question. I, I understand that we might be testifying virtually, but we're testifying for posterity and we're not in a pretend world. We're in a real world and the real world has us mandated to do this. And we don't have the authority one way or the other to say we're going to do it or we're not going to do it. We're mandated okay, to do so, it. So unless in the event we was to change the mandate. Let's say that we you know, implemented a law. We were able to put a policy in place that says that this should be postponed. Would you be able to, would you say that um, we should not be moving forward with the election because you know, thank God, we're now, there's a mandate in place that postpones it. We, we would go back to business as usual, which from a practical perspective is certainly more straightforward for us. But there's been other mandates that have been thrown at us, like we had to spin up mailing absentee ballot applications to all, the, all voters in the city of New York that were eligible to vote in the June primary on no notice. Because so of the pandemic, right? Because of the pandemic. Because of the pandemic, Everything correct. that has been changed has been because of the pandemic that we're still in, correct? Correct, right. absolutely. So we would be, uh, we have enough alacrity to adjust to, uh, to changes in circumstances. And if a higher authority changed the circumstance and told us uh, to begin marching in a different direction, then we would do that, certainly. The same way that we're going to make every effort uh, to make sure that RCV is implemented if there are no changes. And we don't have a choice because we're doing this by legal mandate. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. I wish people can just speak on what their opinion is as opposed to, you know, the legalese around with the. Um, uh, so so it, it is what it is. I, I understand, but I'm also an employee of the board and I answer to 10 commissioners as well. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, we have a legal mandate. We're going to fulfill that legal mandate. And if that mandate gets changed and there's a new mandate, we'll fulfill the new mandate. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. And council member, the reason why we didn't have CFP uh, and the BOE testified at the same time is because we wanted to give council members that extra time. Uh, as it is, every member has gone over the five minutes. Uh, and imagine if I had CFP in there as well. It's not perfect either way, as you know, you chair as well, uh, a committee. So uh, we're trying our best to, I know this was, uh, was going to be a hearing that uh, everyone is passionate about. So I wanted to give really council member as much time as possible. Um, and so and so with that, and, and thank you. Thank you for, for your question. With that, let me pass it on to council member Rodriguez. Time starts now. Thank you, chair. Uh, my first question, if you can give me like the right answer is, so who had the right 
to make a decision on postponing the implementation of the ranked choice voting? Honestly, I, I'm not. I'm not certain. I know that it was there was a charter revision commission and panel. Uh, okay. Ultimately, the charter revision commission made a recommendation on to what the proc uh, should be on on the ballot. The voters voted. The city council uh, acted to take the proclamations that were passed and uh, come up with uh, language uh, so that 1057G uh, could be, uh, uh, you know, appropriately uh, detailed and and ultimately implemented. And then 1057G said. The CFB uh, does the public education piece and the Board of Elections does the operational piece. I, I, I don't know who, under whose authority uh, that could be uh, suspended, but if it were suspended properly, uh, then the Board of Elections would act under the new mandate. So, but basically this is a local law. So the council is before the, after, beside the referendum, the legislative body is the council. As you say, the board of election, you execute campaign finance board too. So could we say that the council is the one that has the authority to decide on between the, a, 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 from here to this election, if a decision to postpone the ranking choice <laughs> voting happen? I think that that question would be better posed to the attorneys for the council. Uh, but, this is the city, but this is a city matter, right? Yes, it's this is a okay. city. This is a city charter matter, and and the council, the city, New York City Council, has attorneys uh, that could pass on to what its authority is. And certainly, it's not for me to, uh, for me as the executive director know, but, of the board. But, 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 but for you, my question: You know that this is not a state. This is not. You just say we cannot make the decision. We just execute as a campaign finance board too. And, and, and if the decision is made to change it, we will execute it regardless of what the, the direction we take. I just want to be sure that you as an agency and campaign finance board also recognize that this is a city matter, right? Yes, it's it's a matter of the city charter. Okay, Correct. thank you. And, thank you. and, and a question, which community can you say is the one that has a higher voting turnout in the city of New York? Uh, honestly, the last uh, month or so has been a, a blur and we really have, I personally haven't uh, dived into uh, the numbers. I can tell you that we had record turnout uh, in the city of New York. Uh, I would imagine that's fairly uh, evenly uh, distributed, but uh, I, I don't have those numbers right in front of me. But can, can, can we agree that on this community has lower turnout, voting turnout, the middle class and upper class community? Uh, that is... That has often been the case, but I think your question was specifically for this election, uh, did that pan out that way? And I don't well, know the general, answer to that in question. In general, usually in city election, can we agree that the underserved community, Bronx, Upper Manhattan, even though we're doing better, other places in Brooklyn, the underserved community has a lower turnout than middle class and upper class? Uh, I, I, I don't think that I can answer that question with any level of specificity. But what I can say is city only elections, mayoral elections of the of the big three, as I'll call it, presidential general, uh, presidential general, uh, you know, uh, gubernatorial and mayoral. Mayorals okay. are the if, least attended, which then okay. is yeah. the city council if, races as well. Yeah. If you don't mind, I'm sorry to cut you off because of the time. Yep, uh, no all, problem. All my respect to the work that you're doing and you and, and the team of the board election campaign finance board. Look, it's clear. Where do we have the higher turnout? Upper West Side, middle class, upper class. Where do we have the lower turnout? The Bronx and other places where underserved community people live. Our people are very smart. They know how to make decisions. But I feel that if the city doesn't invest the resources, and if we don't have the time to educate voters, from here to the next few months, we will put voters in disadvantaged community, in, in, I'm sorry, in underserved community, in disadvantage. Because those members of the community with a high academic skill, those in the upper middle class, they will know how to navigate the system of the ranked choice right. voting if we don't educate. Can we agree with that? 
Council member, you are a, have and will continue to be a very effective advocate uh, for your uh, constituency. Um, and, and I applaud you uh, for that. Uh, but again, we have to follow the legal mandates of what we're required to do. And we will do that unless a new mandate uh, is uh, is given to us and tells us to do something different. And I, I hope that you no, can... I, I do agree a hundred percent. And, and, and I don't, and I'm, I understand your role and I also appreciate all the hard work that you have done and even dealing with, with people like us back and forth, pushing you guys. <laughs> it's, it's not easy to be in your shoes right now. Right. And, and especially during this pandemic. So I know that you will execute whatever is the direction that we're giving you. I just want to share with the voters. I just want to share to the progressive New Yorkers that we are heading toward putting together a New York City election where we don't have the time, where we have not put in the resources to educate all voters across the board. They are smart. I know my people. However, there's a reason why we have to invest much more and have the time in order to execute the run choices voting across the five boroughs. So we don't put an election in June, putting voters in disadvantage in the working class community that they have more challenges to learn how to navigate the system. So that's a statement in Espanol. Yo lo que estoy diciendo es que este sistema nuevo de votar se debe de posponer porque en la ciudad de Nueva York la persona de escasos recursos votan menos en su vecindario porque tienen más desafíos para salir a votar que la ciudad necesita el tiempo necesario, los recursos necesarios para educar a los votantes para no hacer una elección en junio donde los votantes de clase media y clase alta tengan más ventaja de poder salir a votar y estar más educado en el sistema de votar. Por eso me sumo a la voz de pedir de que el Rank Choice Voting sea pospuesto para otras elecciones y que no se haga el año que viene. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we will hear from Council Member Kalos, and then we will go back to Council Member Adams, who was inadvertently muted at the end for five minutes. Council Member Kalos, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. I want to thank everyone for coming out. I want to thank my brothers and sisters at the uh, NAACP for uh, coming out. I was talking to uh, the President, uh, Dr. Hazel Dukes, about just the uh, issues with the uh, commission, uh, the second charter commission, and the fact that the first time a lot of folks heard about ranked choice voting was when I was uh, going around the borough of Manhattan telling people about what was actually going to be on the ballot. Uh, and so um, I want to make sure that NAACP gets all their answers from the Board of Elections and uh, the Campaign Finance Board today, uh, because if, as we are moving forward with this, we need to make sure that their concerns are addressed. So I guess, first question, Mike, I just need a, a quick yes or no. If as of today, this very moment, can you guarantee that we were able to move forward with ranked choice voting? From the mechanics of conducting an election, yes. Okay. The thing that you're still waiting for is just how to count the ranked choice voting ballots. Right, which which is a limited portion of this, and it is it's in the background. It really doesn't uh, call the questions that are being asked here today. How we tabulate votes on okay. a machine is one thing, but there's a lot of larger questions that are being asked here today uh, that that have nothing to do with how the votes are counted. My, my, my next question is, um, when you send out your material, because I've been getting better and better materials from the City Board of Elections. Uh, I went from getting an ID card to now I get a, a card that I can just put on my keychain uh, with a barcode that tells me where to vote. Uh, does the City Board of Elections intend to include information on ranked choice voting as part of the materials you will send out to voters uh, ahead of the election anyway? Yes, and we, we have our annual information notice that's mandated to go out around the middle of uh, April by, uh, by state law, but we also uh, have to do education for the voters that are coming up that will be voting potentially by January 23rd. 
And Proceed. will there be information on ranked choice voting on the vote.nyc platform? Yes. yes. If anyone in this, uh, anyone here wants presentations, wants Q&A, uh, wants you to come into communities, particularly communities of color, are, is the Board of Elections, do you have a unit that can come out and, and do that education? Well, we have honestly suspended uh, in-person uh, appearances uh, like a lot of others. Can you, uh, can you do it over Zoom? Uh, yeah. Certainly, but, but again, I, I wanna go back to it. The mandate for the public education piece of it is with the Campaign Finance Board. We're happy to supplement uh, their efforts, but we can't step on them. Uh, so, so if the, but, sure, but hear me out. If the, if, if the city charter wanted the Board of Elections to conduct the public outreach, it would have mandated that the Board of Elections conduct the public outreach. It did not. It mandated sure, that the, so, the campaign uh, finance uh, board do it. I want to respect the, the chair's questions. I just. I, other members had asked the CFB, so will the CFB agree to come and do outreach anywhere that uh, residents, uh, I, I let the record reflect that Eric Friedman from the CFB not, nodded yes. So um, I guess the, the last piece is there was a lot of arguments about modems versus VPN versus that, this, that, or the other thing. I think it is incredibly important that during ranked choice voting, uh, the information come out exactly who, who chose first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and had their that ballot spoiled at the end because they none of their five choices got chosen in races with more than five candidates. Uh, currently, you transmit the election results over I over tablet devices um, that read cards from the machines. Um, why can't we use that same technology in the same way of transmitting information as we do currently? So it's not the technology that's the issue, it's the setup. And as I indicated, that we transmit aggregate vote totals based on election districts, not cast vote records. And I know that sounds like it's in the weeds and it is in the weeds because I'm, we- I'm a software developer. So the question is whether or not you, you send a record where it says the serial number of the ballot and how the machine read each piece versus uh, the aggregate number, which is less data, admittedly, uh, we're still talking about very small text-based data and we're talking about kilobytes, not megabytes or gigabytes. Why not just be able to transfer Hi. each vote record? So as, as I indicated to um, uh, Council Member Landa, our immediate concern with that intro was that it's effective immediately. Okay, that's fine. I, I, I want to respect the time and I don't want to go too far over the five minutes. I just want to say I, I, I hear my brothers and sisters in the council. I hear the concerns of the NAACP. I, I see you and I will be doing everything I can to support you and uh, the community and make sure that folks know what's going on so that no one is disenfranchised. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, next, we will turn back to Council Member Adams to finish up her questioning. Thank you very much for coming back to me. Um, Director, thank you for hanging in there with us. I was actually trying to uh, to speak back to you. Um, the clock was still running on me and I was unable to unmute myself. I truly appreciate your passion and your concern for your workers. And I wanted to jump back in there just to say that I appreciated that. Um, and we don't disagree on that. And I think that the whole purpose of this is to, is to amplify the cause of all of this and the reason why we have to pause this, and that is because of the effect of COVID-19, not just on your staff, but also on the New York City Council, on all of our voters, on everybody across this country. And I think that that really is the point to be made today. We have to put this thing on, po on po a pause for exactly what you have been relaying. COVID has changed everything. Your staff can't be in the field. My staff can't be in the field. New York City can barely be in the field right now. We have no business going forward with this without the proper education to all of our citizens. So with that said, I'm gonna go back to my question about District 24 and that's where I'm gonna end it. Has the Board of Election begun recruiting ranked choice voting poll workers for both early and election day voting in Council District 28? If so, how many poll workers have been recruited for ranked choice voting 
uh, for the February 2nd election in uh, District 24 in Queens. Thank you. So the, the poll worker recruitment calendar runs from basically J July 1st uh, through June 30th. So we have uh, our pool of poll workers uh, that we use for the, uh, for the general election, and those would be the same individuals that we would draw from. In addition, there were some number of uh, poll workers that uh, received training, but we didn't have enough positions uh, to uh, to uh, uh, have them work uh, for the uh, for the general election. So that's the group that we would be pulling from are the folks that are already trained. And then we would have to give them some supplemental training uh, with respect to the ballot layout uh, and the manner in which um, ranked choice voting uh, works largely to prevent the poll workers from giving a false information to the to the to the voters, but also not to not to become too active uh, in 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 assisting uh, the voters in that regard, because we do get a lot of uh, when we get criticism about poll workers, uh, you know, in special elections or primary elections, it's that they would voters say that sometimes the poll workers seem to be telling them how who to vote for when when often it's just uh, trying to assist in the mechanics. So this requires even more sensitivity uh, than normal circumstances to make sure that, uh, you know, the poll workers are, are effectively communicating with the uh, voters to make sure that they're not overstepping uh, any lines that they should. So you're saying that recruiting has already been done and that the pool is already set to, be, to begin and the uh, training uh, will still take place over the next few weeks? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I'd also, um, before I stop, thank you again, uh, Mr. Chair, um, for letting me come back in. And I, I just also like to, to give a special thanks to my colleague, Kalman Yeager, uh, Council Member Yeager, for his sentiments that were spoken um, in, in so much truth for a lot of us. Uh, he said a lot of it in authority and power. Um, some of us were going to wait till we come back around to question CFB on the items, but um, he said it wonderfully. So I thank my, my colleague, uh, Councilmember Yeager for his statement today. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Executive Director, as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember. And I and I would like to say I, I really believe that we're all on the same page. We want our elections to work. Uh, and if I appear to be uh, circumspect with some of my answers, it's because I'm respecting the mandate and recognizing that we don't get to make the mandate, but we have to implement the mandate. And if the mandate changes will implement whatever the changes are. So thank you. Thank you. We'll now go back to Chair Cabrera for any further questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Director Ryan, I'm going to uh, give you a series of rapid fire questions uh, so we could wrap up and then we could move into uh, session with CFB. So if you could give me uh, the short answer to this question, I would really appreciate it. Uh, so let's talk about uh, trained poll workers on RCV. Will you be relying on CFB provided materials to train them? Uh, and if not, would you rely on other materials or both? Uh, so we've been working on our own uh, uh, training materials. Uh, but certainly if we're not, uh, we're not, you know, no pride of authorship, if there's other materials that can uh, be helpful and that can uh, clarify things for the poll workers, we're certainly happy to, uh, to incorporate those into our training process. But uh, we've developed the, uh, the, the ballot, the sample ballot, and, and that's largely going to be uh, our focus of emphasis. Yeah, let me encourage you uh, to uh, to coordinate with CFB in terms of getting the material. That way, uh, we we have not only in the same spirit, uh, but technically the same information. I think we need to be united in terms of information. Uh, would the training be uh, conducted remotely or in person? I assume it's going to be remotely, right? It will probably be remotely. That would be uh, the likely uh, outcome for all of the reasons that everyone stated. And we were able to implement uh, online training uh, in the lead up to the uh, presidential, uh, and it went uh, it went very well. And the BOE interpreters, uh, 
how would they be trained in RCV? Uh, in the same way. Same way. Uh, what kind of instructions will poll workers be given to voters regarding how to complete the RCV ballot? Well, we'd have to tell them uh, the 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 rank, uh, you know, the ranking system, the way it works. What what I have been uh, privy to from other jurisdictions is that uh, they have short uh, little palm cards, if you will, uh, that that can be handed out that give a very uh, supplement a very specific script uh, that should be crafted for the poll workers to make sure that they stick to the script. And then if uh, the voter needs uh, a, a little refresher, that material can be given to the voter to take with them to the privacy booth uh, as they go through the process. So there, there will not be any explanation taking place. When I go vote, I go to the table, right? Would there be an explanation taking place there? Or basically, here's the handout. You can look at it. How did, is there a question that going to be asked regarding RCV? Do you understand how the rank choice? I'm just trying to figure out. So, so in, in, in terms of implementation, on a, there's two, two aspects to it. There's what are the poll workers uh, going to say? And then there's when are they going to say it? In the past, if a voter has not um, asked for any additional information, they get that ballot, they go about their business. Uh, but I know that our, our respective staff, CFB and ours, have been talking about the voter education piece. And under these circumstances, it may very well be necessary to be a little bit more uh, proactive in that regard when the voters come up, because they might not even be aware that the ranked choice voting uh, is, is happening until they get to the until they get to the poll sites because so we all pay very very close attention to this. But mm -hmm. you know the voting public has other things on their minds besides elections. So you anticipate uh, the waiting will be a little longer, right? Uh, because uh, it's the first time we they're dealing with RCV. Uh, I, I would I would say you know certainly that's a, a potential uh, a potential issue. Uh, unfortunately for us. We have one breathing down our neck in a few weeks. And so we're paying more attention to February right this minute uh, than we are June. Uh, in, you know, uh, well, we, we also have December 22nd uh, going, uh, you know, in the Bronx, which doesn't implicate RCV. And early voting is starting uh, this coming Saturday. Uh, so we have a lot on our plate. We have an election coming up. We have another election coming up in February the 2nd, another one coming up February 23rd. And then depending on some of the life choices that some of your colleagues make, uh, we may have more after that uh, and, and seem to be disproportionately affecting the Bronx and Queens. So uh, about uh, that uh, February special election, uh, when would the board post a sample ballot? When do you anticipate? For the February 2nd? Yes. Yeah, so we, we intend to get the final ballot approval from the commissioners um, on uh, tomorrow okay. uh, so that we can be ready to mail out the militaries and the overseas. And then once that's done, uh, then the staff goes about the business of building the election day ballots. And once the election day ballots are built, then they're posted to uh, the website. And you anticipate that will be one in a couple of weeks? Next, next week or so. Okay. And when will the sample ballots uh, be posted for the June primaries? We're not there yet. Uh, we, have to, we have to know who's running first. And if what's happening in February is any example of what candidate interest is going to be for June, uh, we had over, uh, over 10 candidates uh, uh, put in petitions uh, for February. Uh, now those hearings are not completed, so I don't know how many of them will be left standing after the hearing process is completed. Uh, but uh, there's, there was a lot of interest in the in the February special. I pr presume there's going to be a lot of interest in the primaries in June. Uh, and the more candidates there are, the more complex the ballot becomes. Uh, the more complex the ballot becomes, the more the voters are going to have to consider when they go to when they go to uh, uh, vote. Let's talk about uh, election night results. Uh, does the board plan to bring all the memory sticks from all sites to the main office or they're gonna go by borough office? 
No, they, they, all of those uh, unofficial results get collected and dropped off at each respective borough office. Typically, we have upwards of 90, somewhere in the neighborhood, 96, 97, 98 percent of those results are processed through on election night. But the official results sticks remain with the DS-200 scanners and then get uh, picked up uh, on a scheduled basis uh, after election day. So when when Brent Lander, uh, Councilmember Lander was uh, talking about his bill, wouldn't a simple solution would be just to bring uh, the uh, the memory sticks to to the main office, or you could do it actually by borough uh, as well, and there be able to get all the tabulations, and then put out the raw info. And there's nothing stopping us from doing that, right? There are there are t- typically in a citywide election upwards of 1,200 locations. Uh, that have a minimum of two scanners per location Mm -hmm. uh, and often have many more, which is why we do the unofficial results total upload from the poll sites on election night. And those are published results based on aggregate totals for election districts. The, The results totals that are taken off of the official uh, sticks. Once we collect those machines back, those are the ones that have the individual cast vote record. And that's where the tabulation needs to be done for the rank choice and the tabulation for each round. And I know it sounds technical and it is technical. Uh, and I'm telling you that the system is not set up presently uh, for that intro uh, to be able to be implemented. Now, I'm not telling you that we couldn't put uh, tech heads together on our staff and on uh, the the, the uh, machine vendor staff, ESNS, and then this other vendor that we're going to bring in to do the tabulation. And maybe when all those techs get together, there's a different way to do it. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that right now it's not set up that way. And when I saw the implementation date of immediately implement, you know, upon signing, that caused us concern. Uh, you, you know, you can always evaluate. You can always evaluate and say, "Hey, down the road, can we do something different?" Of course, we could look at that. Yeah, and I think the, the sponsor of the bill uh, is more than willing to uh, look at the June uh, elections rather than the special elections. So he's willing to accommodate. Uh, maybe we should look at what San Francisco is doing, and and get, you know, they they're a bit ahead of us with this, not because of BOE's fault is because, you know, they're being added longer than we have with RCV, but we can learn from them how they're able to, to get it uh, done in a rather. And, and with, chair, with it, in that part. regard, there's a couple of things, right? One, one of the, the vendor that's ultimately chosen may bring some operational knowledge, technical knowledge to the table that we didn't consider. Good point. Right. And secondarily, there may be changes to how absentee ballots are processed coming from the state uh, legislature that will compress uh, the time frame for the processing of those documents uh, more than what's presently uh, done. So all of those things, I think, can you know need to need some time to breathe a little bit and 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 play themselves out uh, before we look to change something before implementations even happen. Let me jump uh, quickly, and thank you for that answer. Uh, Let me move quickly to uh, voter education, and and I know, and we're gonna talk to CFP now, uh, but in the mailer that you do prior to this 2021 special and primary election, would there be any information there? And if so, uh, just to be clear regarding RCV. Yes, there will, and and I think we really need to work with uh, the campaign finance board to uh, on content and what's the best way to deliver that message. Uh, you know, I'm certain that uh, you know if they uh, have links and such, we can include those links. Uh, you know, in the mailer as well as any 
hard copy information uh, that needs to be uh, that needs to be included. But yes. Uh, and then the mandate is uh, we have to do that in the middle of uh, legal mandate. We have to do that in the middle of April uh, by state law that mailer has to go out. And there's other implications to it other than voter information. It's another way that the list maintenance of the voters is conducted because if there's returned mail that comes back, we have certain other obligations besides just uh, informing the voters of, of the information they need. I, I think also it would be helpful just to resound what Con, uh, Councilmember Cornegy, I believe it was him, and I think he made a good suggestion uh, that to put forth a video, you know, a, a, a to the point video on the website. I think a lot of people are um, a very, we, we, you know, we're a video center society. So I think that we, that, that will be helpful. Uh, and and maybe a q and a section uh for that Le, uh regarding uh how would the board train its telephone operators to fill uh, uh to to the field uh regarding questions from the public uh i'm sorry miss uh miss okay. Yanda, she stepped away uh no she, she was just she i could was, jump well, send the yeah. question to another one yeah. she needs her inhaler i apologize okay uh, no, no, we want to make sure she's okay. Yeah. Are you okay? Are you okay? All right. So they're going to get they're going to get her uh, her uh, asthma inhaler. Yeah, please. Uh, that was asthmatic, so I know what that's like. Yes. Uh, so uh, she just stepped out. So I'm I'm sorry, uh, Jack. Can you? Yeah. The question was: Will the board train its telephone operators to field questions from uh, the public? Uh, regarding RCV? The answer to that is yes. And also we had tremendous success and I'd like to give a little a shout I'm out sorry, as they I'm say. Sorry. I'm sorry, to, the, rather than will, how? How would uh, they do that? So we do it the way that we always do. We give them scripts, but we've also worked very closely this last go round and very successfully uh, with 311 uh, and they uh, assisted us and they also gave us some tips on how to be uh, more effective on, on our end. And, and uh, the uh, deputy commissioner, whose name is escaping me right now at 311, was very, very helpful to us. And we expect to be able to continue to tap into that resource for the good of the city, uh, the New York City citizens. Great. And will the board respond to voters' question via social media and email? Uh, yes. Yes, we do. Uh, I realize I'm a bit of a dinosaur in the social media age. It kind of escapes me, but uh, Ms. Vasquez and uh, other members of our staff uh, seem to be uh, up to speed on that. And we got very, um, we got very broadly based compliments for our social media efforts in the lead up to this past election, uh, as well as the, the, the videos and such and the links that we provided uh, online, uh, primarily uh, with respect to filling out the absentee ballots, because that was a big question uh, that needed to be uh, addressed in, in this election. Let me uh, ask you the last two questions on the state election law in certain instances. Ballots must be hand counted. The charter requires the board, as you know, to promulgate rules for handing, for hand counting RCV ballots when necessary. Uh, so here are the two questions. How would the board hand count RCV ballots if necessary? And when will the board promulgate rules on hand counting RCV ballots. So this has been an uh, a element of the elections process where the board of commissioners here in New York City have been a leader. Uh, we had one half of 1%. Uh, if, a, if a contest is within one half of 1%, New York City has a longstanding policy of doing an automatic hand recount. And we already have uh, detailed procedures in place uh, that would just need a, a little bit of uh, uh, tweaking uh, to accommodate how you tabulate after each uh, round. So we're already doing that. And uh, the state legislature uh, recognized uh, the uh, utility of that process and has now mandated that it be done statewide uh, across all 62 counties. And that law goes into effect January 1st, 2021. 
So it already exists. And uh, what is in the city charter is supplemental uh, to the board's process of, or policy, I should say, and now the, the current state law. Director Ryan, I want to thank you. Uh, I know we had uh, two hours. We've been at it for two hours, and now we're going to hear from CFB. But I want to thank you for answering the questions. I want to thank you because you don't have an easy job, and I recognize that you basically execute whatever the law says. Uh, and it is up to us legislators to be able uh, to change the laws and, uh, and to um, literally push the, uh, the agenda of the people uh, through legislation. And so looking forward to continue working with you uh, and to look closely what's gonna happen uh, in February and March uh, and to be in preparation for June. So thank you so much. So, so thank you. And in the spirit of the holidays, thank you for putting that nice little bow uh, on that package uh, at the end of the questioning. Uh, and uh, uh, to Councilman uh, Yeager and uh, my uh, my fellow uh, practitioners of, of Judaism, happy Hanukkah. I know that's coming up for you. And to everyone else, uh, happy uh, holidays, Merry Christmas, and all of those good things. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, I, I turn it back uh, to the committee council. Thank you, Chair. Uh, next, we will hear testimony from Amy Lowprest and Eric Friedman of the Campaign Finance Board. Executive Director Lowprest, you may begin your testimony when ready. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Chair Cabrera, members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. Um, I'm Amy Lowprest, and I'm the executive director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. With me is Eric Friedman, who is our assistant executive director for public affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the legislation before us and on the CFB's plans for ranked choice voting, education, and outreach. In November 2019, 74% of New Yorkers voted yes on ballot question one, bringing ranked choice voting to New York City in primary and special elections for municipal office. The New York City Charter requires the CFB to conduct a robust public education campaign to inform voters of the new election system. As you know, the CFB is already mandated by the Charter to encourage voter registration and engagement by all eligible voters, but particularly among underrepresented populations. Currently, 19 other jurisdictions across the United States use ranked choice voting. While there is an understandable concern about introducing an unfamiliar form of voting to a new audience, this is not the first time New York City has been a leader in building stronger, more inclusive local democracy. In 1988, New York City adopted its landmark public financing program, becoming one of the first cities in the country to do so. When New York City successfully implements RCV next year, we will be the largest, most diverse jurisdiction in the country to implement this important reform. In doing so, New York City can build on the positive results we've seen in the jurisdictions that have implemented RCV elections. Research shows that jurisdictions that have adopted RCV elect more diverse representatives who are more reflective of their population. In its first year implementing RCV, Minneapolis elected its first two transgender council members. Seven cities that use RCV have either achieved or surpassed gender parity in their city legislatures. In cities in the San Francisco Bay Area, candidates of color won 62% of RCV races compared to 38% before the change. In the 13 largest municipalities that use RCV, six have female mayors and four have black, Latino, or Asian mayors. Other studies show that RCV encourages candidates to campaign differently. Though RCV voters, through RCV, voters will ultimately hear from more candidates who are not only campaigning for first place votes, but also second, third, fourth, and fifth place votes. This complements the city's matching funds program, which give opportunities to candidates to run for office and also encourages them to reach out directly to individual voters. Notably, campaigns become more civil, civil in elections that use RCV. A 2014 study of California RCV cities indicated that voters in RCV cities perceived less negativity in campaigns than in plurality cities. Further RCV would eliminate the need for costly runoff elections, which could save up to $20 million per election. 
In addition, RCV gives voters more say in who represents them by allowing them to help choose the winner, even if their first choice does not win. Therefore, candidates who win in RCV elections are the candidates with the broadest support among the electorate and who then have the broadest mandate to lead their constituents. Along with our partners inside and outside of government, the CFB's voter engagement efforts during this past year were aimed at helping voters understand unfamiliar methods of voting in New York and the rest of the country. The New York and the rest of the country was forced to rethink election administration entirely in order to make voting safe and accessible. Disseminating consistent and accurate information was a unique challenge in 2020, as state legislation, court decisions, and executive orders changed elections on what felt like a daily basis in the early stages of the pandemic. For voters, 2020 was their introduction to two new forms of voting, voting by mail and early voting. In order to maximize public safety and introduce these voting methods to many voters for the first time, the CFB, along with the Board of Elections, the Mayor's Democracy NYC Initiative, and other civic groups led education and mobilization campaigns, encouraging voters to vote before Election Day. These efforts resulted in 36% of general election voters voting early and 23% voting by mail compared with 6% voting early and 36% voting absentee in the 2020 primary. CP staff successfully provided accurate and consistent messaging to voters throughout this challenging year. Introducing RCV to 2021 primary voters alongside these efforts to familiarize more voters with vote by mail and early voting, many months before RCV would be implemented, would have increased voter confusion and uncertainty during a uniquely confusing time. Our focus was on providing voters with the information they needed to participate in the November general election for president, federal and state offices that do not use RCV. Additionally, there is a special election in Council District 12 on December 22nd, which will precede the implementation of RCV. We do not believe it is wise or appropriate to begin a broad-based RCV education campaign as New Yorkers are preparing to cast ballots in traditional plurality elections. The CFB remains dedicated more than ever to giving voters the timely and accurate information they need to cast a ballot safely and effectively, including a robust educational campaign about ranked choice voting. Eric Friedman will explain our education plans and discuss the bills before the committee today. Thanks, Amy. As noted, the CFB is responsible for a robust educational campaign to inform voters about ranked choice voting. We've been actively planning to support the implementation of ranked choice voting throughout this year. And as the chair noted at the start of the hearing, we've previously shared an overview of our plans as part of our testimony to this committee at its September 25th hearing. Though it is new to New York City, we have every confidence that voters will understand RCV. Indeed, Voters make ranking decisions every single day. If the item they want isn't available at their grocery store, they pick their next choice. Research in other cities demonstrates that simple, clear education campaigns can and do prepare voters to participate successfully. For instance, exit polling of voters in Minneapolis showed that more than 90% of voters understood ranked choice voting well, their first time voting under the new system. In addition to our longstanding voter education efforts, including the city's official voter guide, the CFB has been conducting successful voter engagement and get out the vote initiatives ahead of special, primary, and general elections for a decade. We are confident our outreach for ranked choice voting will provide the simple, clear information all New York City voters need to vote with confidence. As we have for previous outreach efforts, we will rely heavily on our partnerships with community organizations who know their neighborhoods and communities best. We've successfully registered new Americans at naturalization ceremonies with Dominicanos USA. We have registered voters in partnership with NYCHA and with individual NYCHA developments and reg registered students on National Voter Registration Day with CUNY Votes and the Brooklyn Voters Alliance. And we plan to leverage these partnerships, among others, to spread the word about ranked choice voting. We'll implement a train the trainer system so our partners have the tools to best communicate with their own audiences. Already, the Department of Youth and Community Development, Department of Education, several of the library systems, YVOTE, and the Citizens Committee for Children are working with us to incorporate RCV 
into their own training programs through our train the trainer approach. We'll also supply partners with a one pager explaining the essentials of ranked choice voting translated into the officially recognized city languages. Our first goal is to educate voters who will use ranked choice voting in special elections this February and March. The special election in Council District 24 scheduled for February 2nd will be our first opportunity to roll out our initial communications and outreach materials to the 85,000 registered voters in that district. We plan to mail a postcard to every household with a registered voter in Council District 24 and to all registered voters in Council District 11, 15 and 31 prior to special elections scheduled or anticipated in those districts. We'll also direct voters to our online RCV resources, which are also a core part of our outreach plan to voters. As we did for the 2020 elections, we're preparing to publish a frequently asked questions page on our website for the 2021 ranked choice voting elections. The FAQ will serve as an all encompassing resource to answer RCV questions and will be updated regularly over the course of 2021 in response to voter questions and comments. Like our other materials, the FAQ will, will be available in the Federal Voting Rights Act languages. Our website will also host an explainer video, an example of a ranked choice voting ballot, and visual demonstrations of how winners will be determined through ranked choice voting tabulation. These materials will all be shared on social media through organic posts and targeted paid advertising and distributed by our community partners. For the June primary elections, our 2021 citywide voter guide will also include information on how to mark an RCV sample ballot. The voter guide is mailed to every household in New York City, giving us the ability to speak to all 4.8 million registered voters about ranked choice voting. Best practices from other jurisdictions show us that it is critical to provide voters with accurate, timely, and accessible information. Our messaging will be voter centric, easy to understand and responsive to voter needs. We're working with the Center for Civic Design, which has hands-on experience with ranked choice voting communications efforts around the country and knowledge of best practices in design and usability. They're testing out designs for our voter guide and other materials based on usability studies. And they will be making recommendations that reflect the lessons learned in other jurisdictions and help us introduce ranked choice voting to New York City in the most accessible way possible. To help us meet the specific needs of New York City voters, CCD is conducting interviews with a diverse cross section of New Yorkers from all five boroughs with a specific focus on those underrepresented populations that, that comprise our charter mandate. 100% of respondents are voters of color. 84% speak English as a second language. We've included a small sample of what we heard from voters during these interviews in our written testimony. I will share a quote from a voter who noted straightforwardly that this is new to me, but it's just another way of voting. While we anticipate the CCD's work will be essential to ensuring our ranked choice voting outreach will be as impactful as possible. Their research suggests that New Yorkers may quickly understand the benefits and the process of ranked choice voting. The CFB has concerns with the substance of both pieces of legislation before the committee, and we appreciate the opportunity to address them here today. Um, I'll speak first briefly about Council Member Lander's bill, which aims to require the New York City Board of Elections to report the complete ranked choice tabulations with the unofficial results on election night. Uh, we, we will absolutely defer to the Board of Elections for their analysis of the practical considerations, which were just discussed at length. Uh, we will reiterate that the counting of absentee ballots does not start until a week after Election Day and not finalized until weeks later. Due to COVID-19, nearly 25% of voters voted by mail in November. If this trend continues, as is likely, the unofficial election night results will only reflect the choices of 75% of voters who cast ballots in person increasing the likelihood that the results will shift between the unofficial results and the final certified count. We propose that the council's focus should be on providing, re providing resources to the Board of Elections and supporting changes to state election law that will help make the process of counting absentee ballots more efficient. As is clear from our testimony, we fully share the goal of, of interim 1994 to educate as many New Yorkers about ranked choice voting as effectively as possible. Our staff are already carrying out most of the work this bill requires. 
For example, Local Law 29 agencies will be included in our education campaign, and we are currently planning to train LL29 agency staff and provide the agencies with public education materials. As discussed in detail, we are fully incorporating ranked choice voting educational content into our website and social media plans for 2021, as well as the online, print, and video voter guides. We are going beyond the requirements of this bill and asking our potential debate sponsors to incorporate elements of our ranked choice voting education campaign into their plans for the CFB sanctioned debates for citywide offices. Noting that, we have some suggestions that will align intro 1994 with the planning we have underway. First, we propose that the implementation date be moved to June 1st, 2021. Having some of these larger items completed entirely by January 1st, 2021, less than one month, less than one month away, is impractical. As we mentioned earlier, most of our written and digital ranked choice voting education materials will be ready in time to share with voters for the District 24 special election, but the projects that will reach the most voters will take longer to produce. However, we do propose striking the bill sunset provision. We do intend to, to integrate ranked choice voting educational content into our regular get out the vote and voter education campaigns for city primary and special elections, particularly because other elections will continue to be conducted under the traditional plurality winner rules. As such, we do not believe it is necessary to limit the requirements in the bill only to elections in 2021 and 2023. Second, we suggest that the bill grant more flexibility for CFB to adopt best practices based on research and observation of what has worked in other jurisdictions. For example, requiring at least two pages of the voter guide to be dedicated to ranked choice voting is overly prescriptive. As noted earlier, we're working with the Center for Civic Design to solicit, to solicit feedback from a diverse subset of New York City voters to ensure the voter guide and our ranked choice voting messaging will best meet their needs. It's possible that a requirement to devote two pages of the guide solely to ranked choice voting will run counter to what we learned from CCD's usability studies. We are planning to fully incorporate our CV education into our voter guide, but need the flexibility to determine how best to do it based on our research and on feedback from voters. Third, we must highlight that the translation services required in this bill would require a significant amount of additional funding. Currently, we've budgeted for translation services covering the, covering the four languages required by the Federal Voting Rights Act, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and Bengali. The CFB would need substantially more funding to contract with translation services providers for the six additional designated citywide languages. Like many other city agencies, the CFB has worked with OMB to make difficult but necessary cuts to our agency budget during this difficult year. And this is one requirement we cannot meet without additional resources. We've passed along our comments about improving both bills to council staff and we are happy to, to discuss them further as the bill moves through the legislative process. There is no doubt that we have a tremendous undertaking ahead of us. Successful implementation of ranked choice voting will require assistance from all corners of New York City. As we've described in our testimony, the CFB has a strong, sound plan to fulfill our charter mandate and provide New Yorkers the information they need to confidently and successfully cast a ballot. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much uh, for uh, your testimony. Uh, I'm going to defer the usual practice of me starting with questions. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna allow for the other council members, my colleagues uh, to ask questions and then I'll come back uh, and uh, ask my questions and then we could continue the hearing. With that, I, I'll turn it back to the uh, committee council. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you would like to ask a question, you have not yet raised your hand, please do so now. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Uh, first, we will be hearing from Council Member uh, Majority Leader Cumbo, 
followed by Council Member Cornegy and then Council Member Kalos. Majority Leader Cumbo, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. I just want to continue with the line of questioning from the last hearing. Mr. Friedman, I, I heard your testimony in terms of uh, ranked choice voting being synonymous with grocery shopping. If you want something and you don't, it's not there, you can pick something else. This is very condescending because as we all know, ranked choice voting is not simply about voting your preferences. It is a very complex calculated strategy where if you vote through the ranked choice voting process, or if you don't, if you vote for two candidates versus three candidates versus five candidates, you can come up with completely different outcomes depending on how you utilize this system. And those that are more sophisticated, that have greater resources, deeper pockets, and greater bandwidth into uh, the internet and other forms of social media are going to be the victors throughout this system. So let's be clear about this. It's not just simply ranking your choices. It's about understanding the complex calculus and strategy of how you now have to win elections. That's one. Uh, number two, you spoke also about the community partners. I didn't hear any community partners uh, from any black or Latino communities. Do you have any black or Latino communities confirmed and contracted with at this time to implement ranked choice voting? So uh, let me take the second part of that first. So we have been, um, as noted in our testimony, working with a broad range of, of civic organizations around the city uh, from, from every community in New York City uh, to help spread the word about. I'm uh, asking help... for a specific contract with organizations at this time, because you're talking about rolling out uh, a process in two months and then later on in six months. Do you have a contract signed that I could then speak to that provider and say, tell me more about your contract and the work that you're going to be doing in the next couple of weeks. So I'm happy to, to follow up with you. After, I don't I'll have a complete answer list of, no. and I I'll, I'm happy to follow, I'm, Council Member, I'm happy to follow up with you after the hearing with a complete list of the organizations we've been working with. A lot of the work we're doing is in partnership and, and you know, we, have, we are not putting contract, we have not been putting contracts out which, which further goes to amplify what's been the, the theme throughout this conversation or this hearing. You're not ready, you're not prepared. You also testified here both that the amount of money for ranked choice voting is a mere $1 million, okay? Compare that to the census, which was $40 million and all the work that went into that. Do you think that we could have spent a million dollars on the census and simply mailed a postcard and that that would have been sufficient to get the turnout that we received? So I'm happy to have the opportunity to, to elaborate a little bit on, on the answer we provided earlier because I think um, you know, our, our voter education campaign is frankly working on a different model than, than is usual. Okay, you also spoke um, about the other cities that are using ranked choice voting, uh, Minneapolis and many others that you named. Can you go down the line and tell me how much their cities spent on ranked choice voting and how long their educational campaigns went on for, specifically city by city? That's not information I have at my fingertips, but what I will tell you about- well, then That our, was, our that was an irrelevant part of your testimony because if we don't know how much money they spent, we don't know what their educational plan was or their timeline, nor do we know the percentage of African-American and Latino voters, then that is a very unfair uh, comparison for you to include in your testimony at this time. So I'm just going to conclude um, with that. Um, you've also not been able to answer the NYCHA plan. I'm also just going to assume that you have no concrete plan for how to reach our seniors, those in our hospice, those in our nursing homes, and many others that are on lockdown right now. We can't even get into our nursing homes during this pandemic. So this particular program, I'm just going to say, this is the, the greatest gross negligence that I've ever seen governmental malpractice, and I am going to do everything in my power to fight against this with the power of all of my ancestors behind me, because too many people fought and died for the right to vote, and it's going to be too difficult to explain to our communities, similar to the Electoral College, how the person with the most votes did not win the election. So this is something that we are going to have to account for and answer in our communities. And for many of these good governmental groups, many of whom do not come from the communities that look like me, 
how they can explain and justify spending $1 million, a mere $1 million, a token that's not even going to cover the cost of a mailing to every New York City voter, how that is justifiable. That is political malpractice. I'm going to continue to work with my colleagues. And I'm going to utilize my time in office to do everything to have the mayor suspend this portion of the charter, which is how we would get this done and across the finish line. Our voters deserve the opportunity to have every right to vote in a fair, transparent, well-educated election. Thank you. So I, I, I appreciate your comments and your questions, Council Member. Uh, the one thing I just want to add about that figure so the $1 million is, is devoted to our marketing promotional budget. There's an additional $1 million that is budgeted for improving our print and online voter guides to help us use them uh, and de develop them as a tool that is built around helping voters um, make their ranking decisions. And that, of um, course, also it, doesn't it, include it, the cost of the voter guide. Right. So the total cost of printing, translating, mailing, uh, the voter guide, producing the videos that go with the voter, voter guide and advertising to promote the voter guide is uh, about eight and a half million dollars. So I want to make sure that figure is located in the context of our broader voter outreach and engagement efforts. Thank you for that. I just want to say, please don't insult my intelligence with the addition of an additional one million dollars and a voter guide. What I've explained to you before is that there is a complex, complex calculus strategy on how to win elections that will not be covered in that government voter guide, as well as the fact that $2 million is also not ample or sufficient to do the level of outreach where black and brown communities, particularly those of our seniors and those in our nursing homes and those in hospice care and others need that additional level of support that will not be covered by $2 million. So I'll just close there. I have a democratic conference to lead at this time. And um, I will continue to fight with each and every one of my colleagues alongside them to overturn this. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader Kumbo. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Council Member Cornegie, followed by Council Member Miller, and then Council Member Adams. Council Member Cornegie, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Muted. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you again. I want to start by echoing the sentiments of my colleague, Carmen Yeager, who I, I'm really surprised that there was so much in your testimony about the advocates, almost seeming like ad, ad, advocating for ranked choice voting instead of explaining us about, it, about, its, impl, uh, about its implications and its application. Um, that's a little disturbing to me. Secondly, I want to talk about the fact that a lot of the organizations, you were asked if contracts have been signed with major black and brown organizations. A lot of those organizations are on the call and have already sent me texts saying that they haven't been reached out to. So some of the prominent black organizations who are responsible for the dissemination of information in black and brown communities are literally on the call and have not gotten uh, reached out to in terms of disseminating this information. So I don't know who you're reaching out to, but I'm, I'm, I can look at the panel here right now and see so many prominent organizations that stand in the gap for black and brown people in terms of advocacy and they've not been reached out to. So that's concerning to me. Now, the question I have for you is, is it true that the outreach that was necessary, that was prescribed to be done and milestones that were prescribed to be met were not reached because of COVID? I, I would. I, I just want to make sure that I understand the the, the milestones you're speaking about, Council Member. Um, are you speaking about the the items in the in the bill that's under under discussion today? Yes. And, and um, the 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 um there, there were milestones that were supposed to ha have been reached in terms of the videos, in terms of all of those kinds of things that I detailed within the context of uh, my testimony earlier. Uh, I know the answer is no. Um, how do you feel that, it's not, that you can go forward uh, with this program knowing that those milestones weren't met? Milestones for education. Uh, in my committee, I'm the chair of housing and buildings. There were milestones that were supposed to be met in terms of legislation that was put forward uh, that we didn't meet and we had to push it out because we weren't able to get the education process done in housing and buildings, right, around uh, a lot of very important issues um, uh, in terms of information. 
uh, how is it that we wouldn't? So I, I'm not even here to argue the merits of ranked choice voting as a, as a practice. I'm saying that there's no way having missed the, the milestones for education. And by the way, having six kids, I know if you miss a milestone, you don't make it up, right? It's not like you can double up uh, uh, to get to a milestone. We've missed considerable milestones that were prescribed in the education package. Um, what, what, uh, what's your response to that? Like, how do we, we can't make it up. We don't have enough time to make up the, the robust education. A lot of us who are progressives and who believe that we should be moving forward with an, uh, a voting system that's inclusive to all voters stood by and, and, and fought for actually the ability to be progressive, but we had a reasonable expectation that education would be the cornerstone by which we move forward with ranked choice voting or any monumental changes. And that literally has not happened. By your own estimation, how do we move forward? So as, as noted in, in our testimony, um, a lot of the planning around the items that you're speaking about is underway. Um, you know, we do have a, we have, we have started our planning to produce a video. Um, as mentioned, we are including um, ranked choice voting throughout the voter guides that we have planned for this year. We have mailings that we have planned in those council districts that have special elections coming up. So, um, you know, I think one of the one of the one of the things to, to point out is that we really look at, you know, the efforts that we've that we've been engaged in throughout this year as as a success story and a demonstration of how we can be successful and, and impactful in talking about ranked choice voting with city voters. Um, we. Uh, you know, we saw between June and July more than 20 times as many people utilize early voting as did in June. Um, you know, so we, we were, despite many challenges of this year, we're confident that we'll be able to meet these benchmarks. Um, you know, we're on track with rolling out our campaign, um, the plan that we've shared with the GovOps committee back in September. Um, and that will begin January 1st. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, that's, that's that's you, what I'm provide. saying is you've already missed the benchmarks. Now you're setting new benchmarks, but you've already missed the ones in during the period of COVID. And I'm saying that you can't just make them up. You can't just start all over. You can't start all over with an election that's in February and, and, and have realistic benchmarks Time that you can reach to educate voters is what I'm saying. Like you've already missed the benchmarks. So to tell me that in January, you'll start new benchmarks because really that's what it is. You missed two significant benchmarks because of COVID, not your fault, not my fault, mother nature. Uh, 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 and a pandemic caused you to miss those. You don't just make it up is what I'm saying. Like you don't just now say in January, you had a prescription that was in some estimations, not the best prescription, but it was a prescription. And those of us who, who worked within the context of, of talking to our voters about a new system, gave them a reasonable assurance that they would be educated to the fullest extent. Nine out of 10 prime voters, which are seniors in my district, do not have not even heard of ranked choice voting, let, know, let alone how to implement it. So I, I, I want to be clear again, um, just, so, just for, for, so we understand, there are no benchmarks uh, included in, in the charter, uh, as far as we're aware. Um, you know, the, 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 the provision of the charter that governs ranked choice voting takes effect January 1st. So we're, we're on track with our planning to start implementing January 1st. The, the products that we've talked about, uh, you know, the, the production is, is underway. So I, I want to, if there's more detail you can provide us with about, um, about the benchmarks leading up to January 1st, uh, I'd be happy to take that back and, and look at it. But, um, you know, our planning is on track uh, and, and you'll start to see the results of it as soon as January 1st. Well, you're saying to, to this body that there were no educational milestones that needed to be met a year ago before you went through with this. We are not aware of any benchmarks in the charter provisions that implement ranked choice voting. Okay, so so I'm I'm told, and I believe that that's patently false, that there were there were no education milestones that you didn't have to begin the education process till January, which certainly fly in the face of my support for uh, ranked choice voting. So okay, you, I that Sorry, I, I, I I just that seems patently false to me. That there were no milestones, no benchmarks that needed to be met over a year ago in order to move this forward. You may say the charter didn't include it, but certainly your prescription and movement of education was a portion 
of getting us to a place where this is even implementable. I have no more questions. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we will hear from Council Member Miller, followed by Council Member yeah. Adams. Council Member Miller, you may begin yeah. upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, so, obviously, I, I think that we don't want to rehash all the questions around planning and preparedness that was um, the questions that were asked during the first round that we know was more specific to the role of, of campaign finance. Uh, and and uh, as uh, uh, Council Member Cornegie just indicated that there were certain benchmarks, which, which included uh, reporting, whether it was uh, Board of Elections or whether it was CFB, um, for, for this all to get underway um, in late December is, is really a, a, a travesty, but it's really consistent with what this is and consistent with what we've been saying. Let, let me just... <laughs> Let me just contradict some of your data a little bit. And we talked about the Minnesotas of the world and, and the, the uh, San Francisco's of the world. Fact of the matter is, we know what took place in San Francisco with an African-American mayor up by 20 in, in high double digits and, and, and barely won by 1%. Uh, be, be because of ranked choice voting. We also know that last year at the same time that we were enacting uh, ranked choice voting here in New York, California Governor Newsom uh, through executive order vetoed uh, uh, an attempt to expand uh, ranked choice voting throughout the land of California. Uh, let me also read from the uh, Minneapolis uh, Somalian American candidate from a who, who said that after he lost, that he was in favor and he was the favorite to win ranked choice voting, but lost to a candidate that was supported by wealthier white voters. He said, I was promised that it would be, it would increase the voter turnout and encourage communities of color and more diverse communities to get out and vote and more civil discourse, but that was not the case. Um, there is one commonality in, in, in the places that you mentioned also and in, in, in some of those, the, those places that, that differ from really here in New York City and the democracy that we know. That the fact of the matter is, is that those communities um, that uh, the majority community of, uh, here in New York City is, is far from that of, of San Francisco, certainly where African-Americans make up less than 4% of the population, Minneapolis and places like that, where folk of color are the majority here in the city of New York. So just, you know, this process in, in, in general to apply that logic, I, I, I just don't see it. This it's, 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 is, um, as, as my colleague have called it a number of things, I, I just, you know, it is, it is you know, it, really circumventing the democracy that we have come to master and without the type of education. Could you just um, talk about, again, how we reach those marginalized only because that they are a senior population, those who speak second languages, those who our outreach generally happen in, in, in churches, synagogues, and mosques, in senior centers, how, how do we make up for that? How do we, in particular, when we have seen in most recent times of school reopening that 50% of African American and, and communities of color do not have access to technology nor merely access to broadband. How then as a primary function of achieving these goals do we rely on technology? Keeping in so, mind that we are in the midst of a, a second wave of this pandemic. So I, I want to start off by saying I think we share a lot of the same goals here. I mean, we want, um, you know, since uh, since ranked choice voting was adopted uh, by the charter referendum, you know, we we are committed and, and really, I, sh I think, share this goal of making sure that that um, it's adopted evenly in every community across New York City, uh, evenly, completely and fully. 
Um, so to your question about the digital divide, I think you know a lot of us were forced when uh, when the pandemic struck to rethink a lot of the um, you know the outreach strategies that we were relying on before the pandemic hit. Um, we've re we, we have um, you know in response to restrictions on gathering in, in public spaces, certainly built out our digital capacity uh, and, and and relied on it pretty heavily through this year. But I think we've we've also relied. Time expired. Um, just as heavily on our partnerships with communities around, with, with organizations around the city. I think we have to- uh, Again, I'm this. sorry. Yeah. Are there any organizations in Southeast Queens, which happens to be a top three voting block in the state of New York consistently? And if so, what, what, what are those organizations? So I, I, we're happy to provide the committee with a complete list of, of organizations that we're working with. And, and I encourage you because look, we, again, have to approach this work with humility. The Campaign Finance Board is not going to be the best messenger in every community in New York City. Um, and that is why it is so important. That is true. And what communities are they the best messenger? I, sorry. I think, I mean, also, I think what Mr. Freeman is trying to say is that we, I mean, we have a group, a list, and we are happy to share the list that we're working with. But we also welcome any organizations that, you know, that you are associated with or know to also provide additional training, the trainer and outreach work um, and develop partnerships with them too. Uh, okay. That is absolutely part, you know, we welcome that uh, from all the council members from, because you know your communities better. We, you know, we have, we'll, we have done outreach. We have a list of organizations we're working with, but again, we are happy to collect names of organizations, big and small that you're, that you are in your communities that we can also reach out to and provide training programs and materials to them. Okay, thank you. So, so, and, and finally, um, as you aggregate and disaggregate the data of rent choice voting throughout the country, could you tell me where uh, in, in some of the states where rent choice voting had been instituted and repealed, such as Vermont, North Carolina, Michigan, Washington State, and Colorado, why in fact was rent choice voting repealed in those states? So I, I, don't, have, I, I don't have all the information about the events in, of those states at hand, but again, happy to, to come back uh, and discuss okay. further at another at another time. I do want to I do want to add uh, just to what Amy uh, said in response to your last question. Um, for for communities that aren't uh, reliant on broadband and the internet to get all their information, we do have the voter guide that's mailed to every household. We are in um, you know we are investing in out of home advertising, including with local businesses um, in communities across the city. So we've definitely we're closing now in the midst of COVID. This is paramount to poll tax at this day and time. And and uh, I, I I yield the time. Thank you so much for for for, for attending. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Councilmember Adams, followed by Councilmember Yeager. Councilmember Adams, you may be in upon the search and announcement. Time starts now. Thank you very much. And thank you for your testimony so far. Thank you for being here and again, hanging out with us pretty much today. Um, you know, I, I am concerned. I think that's an understatement. Um, I'm very concerned. The farther we go along in this hearing today, the farther um, many of us know about uh, ranked, choice, ranked choice voting, the implications of ranked choice voting. We understand the law perfectly uh, and that the law must be enacted. That is no question. Um, our, our stance pretty much is that we're not ready for this in New York City. We are not ready for this. And I think that it was, uh, that it's a little disingenuous to hear about the virtues of ranked choice voting more than hear about what we need to make ranked choice voting successful right now. And I think that that's the piece that we've been missing throughout this hearing, quite frankly. Um, I'm, I, again, I'm just, I'm very, very, very concerned. Let me just go back to um, the, the, so, something that my colleagues um, if, if the reach of online voter education campaigns is typically limited to already engaged audiences, how exactly does the CFB plan to target hard to reach communities in the middle of a worsening dark winter pandemic to inform them about ranked choice voting? How are you going to make that happen? Um, how, how do you intend to target the city's black voters with a digital ranked choice voting education campaign when nearly half of all black households 
don't have internet access due to a lack of reliable broadband and almost a quarter of them can only do so with a smartphone. How are you going to do that? Um, you also uh, let us know the, the voter analysis report indicated that the CFB would conduct focus groups to get messaging feedback from uh, underrepresented communities. To date, it would be nice to know how many focus groups with underrepresented communities in mind has the CFB conducted uh, and which neighborhoods were represented? And also, does the CFB believe that uh, uh, in-person outreach to underrepresented communities will be possible while a, a pandemic is surging right now? I am concerned. I'm very, very concerned. How are we going to get to our senior centers, our houses of worship, the key places where people of color get their information about voter education? How are we going to do that when those institutions have been shuttered for months and months and months. How are we going to do that? How will the CFB be able to reach out to our seniors in a significant way about ranked choice voting? Whether you, you, you know, I, I, I'm concerned. I'm very, very, very concerned. Um, I, I'm just gonna also throw out there, there are some uh, terms out there that our voters need to be aware of. They need to know about ballot e exhaustion. We're looking at a number of candidates right now coming into these elections, particularly in, in Queens, and I'm going back to District uh, 24 again. So according to the 2019 City Charter Commission's final report, ranking a larger number of candidates can help ameliorate the issue of ballot exhaustion. And if the number of candidates a voter can rank is increased from three to five, the risk of ballot exhaustion naturally declines. The commission saw fit to cap, rightfully so, to cap the maximum number of candidates that can be ranked in a ranked choice voting election at five. Now listen, there are reportedly 11 candidates running in the special election for Council District 24 in Queens right now. This is happening on February 2nd, 11 candidates. We're capped at five and at least nine in Council District 31 coming up in February as well. What is the risk of ballot exhaustion in a ranked choice uh, voting election if the number of candidates running exceeds the number that a voter can rank? I'm concerned, I'm very, very concerned. How does CFB propose to educate rank choice voting election voters about ballot exhaustion and about anything else that I've just brought up. Thank you very much. So uh, I'll, I'll try to take some of those comments in reverse and thank you for the question. So, um, I mean, you talked about the number of voters being num you know, larger than five in some of these, in some of these uh, special elections coming up. Um, it, I mean, I mean, I, I look, one of the things that one of the one of the things about ranked choice is that you can rank more than one voter, which is which is provides a broader uh, a broader look at voter preference uh, than we have currently in the winner take all system. So again, I think what Time. we've learned as we look at the way this is rolled out in other jurisdictions is that keeping it simple is really important, and and, and information that is simple and clear and straightforward is the best way to get voters the information that they need in order to participate fully and meaningfully. I do wanna add one thing about uh, your comments about kind of access to broadband. Um, a lot of the material that we're producing um, is, not, is not meant just to be viewed at home on a laptop desktop. Um, we are um, producing materials online that are accessible, really mobile, mobile first. Um, so for folks who rely on smartphones, um, you know, our materials will all be accessible to them. You know, one of the things we've done during this year, as we've really tried to shift towards uh, away from that in-person outreach, is um, text out the vote banks uh, before before this year's elections. This is another way to reach to reach voters who aren't um, reliant on kind of broadband internet um, while still maintaining you know physical distance in public safety requirements, which again, I think we've heard a few times, we would anticipate that, that those are still, you know, will still be an issue um, uh, throughout this coming year. I, I appreciate that. Um, again, what I'm, what I'm hearing again is the tone of just minimizing how important this is. Um, and again, I, I'm disturbed, I'm very disturbed. I'm disturbed 
about a comparison of ranked choice voting with grocery shopping. I just mentioned 11 candidates on a ballot. What that means to the voting public and the way that our voting public, particularly, particularly in one of the largest voting blocks in Southeast Queens, we have an educated voting block. We will now have to, among other things, educate voters on a number of candidates unheard of because of the number of seats that will be vacated in, in the New York City Council. We are going to have to make sure that, that our voting public is educated on our mayoral candidates who are coming out every day, it seems like someone else jumps in the race. So we're not just saying, look at your favorite person, one person, one vote, which by the way, is the way civil rights history teaches us how to vote as a people, one person, one vote. We are now putting in front of the voting population of color. You must educate yourself on upwards of five candidates now to make your best choice and to hope that your candidate wins with 50% or more of the vote. I'm, I'm very, very concerned, but thank you very much for your testimony today. So the, the one thing I would just add, we absolutely sure. share your urgency um, and that uh, you've said, we, we, are, we, are, we are keenly aware of, of the high volume of candidates getting ready to run in next year's election. Um, you know, we're seeing them come through the Master Funds program. We're preparing the voter guide uh, to, to communicate, uh, help those candidates communicate to voters effectively about what they do in an office. And, and again, I, I, I do, please don't mistake uh, my answers as, as um, an indication that we don't share the urgency that I think you're feeling. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Council Member Yeager. Council Member Yeager, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, just, to, just to be clear and to follow up on, on my previous uh, uh, time, uh, I don't think anybody in this committee, I don't think anybody in the council holds the Campaign Finance Board accountable for the results of last year's referendum. Uh, but I also think that it's important to note what the results were, as one of my colleagues indicated earlier, um, approximately 500,000 people in a city of well over 8 million voted yes on this question. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's far less people than voted by absentee ballot this year's election in the city. Uh, it was a tiny minority of New Yorkers, and in many of the communities of, of uh, the members that you're hearing from today, uh, there, was, there was a low turnout. Uh, traditionally, the year before the presidential election in New York City is an off-year cycle, we call it here, and there's really nothing of great import on the ballot in many people's estimation, and so they don't come out, and there was a tiny, tiny turnout. And that's the result that we're dealing with today. So it's not to hold the campaign finance board accountable for the adoption of the measure, but I think it's, it's necessary for us to talk about what we're seeing. And you know, when I hear colleagues, frankly, who don't look like me, talking about things like poll taxes, um, uh, things like voter suppression, um, and, you know, thinking about what that means in a city like this, they have the credibility that I don't uh, to talk about these topics. Um, but my family also came here from countries where, we could, where they could not exercise their right to vote to choose their leaders. It's a sensitive topic for a lot of people in the city, um, regardless of where you come from, regardless of where you represent. Like I said, in my community, I'm comfortable defending the, the position of my voters who chose to reject this question. But having said all that, you know, I want to go back to the education aspect because I think it's important. You know, Eric, um, uh, Madam Director, we know each other for a long time, and you know, I, I can't, I can't recall if, if the director and I ever had these conversations. But Eric, I think you and I have had conversations about the voter guide, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm pretty sure that in our many times of talking and and coffee, um, we've talked about that. You know. Uh, and I'll say it for myself, I really, I said this before, I don't believe anybody reads that magazine. And, and I don't think you disagree. It may, you may not want to word it the same way, but people are, it's junk mail when it shows up. And uh, to, to the majority leader's point about the million dollars and you know, quibbling over whether it's a million, two million, three million, whatever the case may be, the idea that we can educate the voters of New York City um, uh, in a way that, that you yourself in your testimony, Madam Director said, that you were not comfortable beginning the education campaign in this current uh, calendar year because, uh, and I, I note page three, 
uh, to, because of the confusion and uncertainty you didn't want to create. Um, and now we have these four elections right up against us, but at the same time, you're saying you, you don't want to have the rollout uh, uh, be written into law until June, just several weeks before uh, the citywide primaries. These things all don't mesh. And, and when Councilman Miller talks about his concern, when Councilman Cornegy talks about his concern about the seniors in their district, you know, I have the same concern about seniors in my district. Um, not being able to get the information that they need because, A, they're not getting this magazine, they're not opening up, they don't have the access to the internet that we have all learned is, is the only way we're functioning today. But so many New Yorkers don't have that access. How often are conversations at this council uh, on, on these floors uh, uh, take place about the idea that we have people in New York who do not have access to the internet, we're constantly trying to figure out ways to get them access to the internet. How are we going to educate folks? And I don't know if this is a question that even has an answer because you've taken the position that you can do it. And throughout your testimony, uh, Director, you, you, you uh, expressed confidence that you're going to be able to accomplish it. I'm not saying you're not going to do everything you can. What I'm saying is if you do everything you can, it is still set up to fail. It's just not enough time. And uh, uh, Madam Director, I, I would suggest that the same powerful voice that you're giving us today to tell us why you believe as an agency, ranked choice voting is good, ranked choice voting can happen, ranked choice voting is fair, all the wonderful things you say about it, I think you can recognize the obvious that no matter what the CFB does, no matter how hard you work to make this uh, a reality in terms of your mandate to provide the education, it will fail. There will be New Yorkers who are not going to understand this, not because they're not smart, but because of the nature of the way they have voted for so many years, because of the age demographic difference, frankly, the- the, uh, the Time expired. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I, uh, if I may for a few moments, the differential between um, uh, what the, the, the race of the, of the average younger voter in New York City and the average older voter in New York City is, I think is relevant. I think those are the things that Councilman Cornegy, Councilmember Adams, Councilmember Miller are talking about, um, uh, the majority leader is talking about. Um, I'm not in a position to invoke my ancestors in this battle like the majority leader did. Um, but I, I, I think the passion by which some of my colleagues are bringing to this conversation uh, ought, to, ought to give you pause on whether or not your confidence is well-placed. And that's the suggestion I make, uh, uh, Mr. Freeman, um, you know, I'm an honest guy when I talk to you, I've always been. Uh, Madam Director, you know, I believe in your work. Uh, and, and we've had many conversations about it. But I think that you have to look really deep into whether or not you can faithfully represent to the city that you're going to be able to accomplish this in a way that we all ought to just say, okay, it's going to be good. Don't worry about it. And, and with that, I, I yield back because I'm not really sure I even gave you a question. But please, uh, uh, Madam Director, Eric, if, if there's anything you want to add, feel free. Well, I, I will reiterate what I said. Um, you know, this is the mandate that the voters has given us, and we will, you know, do everything we can to meet that mandate. Um, and you know, I think that uh, Eric has outlined what our plans are uh, extensively. Uh, again, you know, as of this moment, the, the charter requires us to educate voters, and we will be doing that for the implementation of ranked choice voting you know, starting with the February 2nd special election. Yeah, mm -hmm. but Madam, my, Madam, Madam Director, my question is really, I know, I know you're going to do it. I, I don't believe there's a task that you've ever been charged with in the charter in your 15 years as director that you've said, I'm not going to do it. I know you're going to do it. I know you're going to work hard at it and you're going to do it in, in a very strange environment where many of your staff are re working remotely. It's complicated. You're not all sitting in a meeting. I know you're going to do it. My question is whether you can you can faithfully represent that when you've done what you what you can do, will it be the best possible result? Or does it make sense as so many of my colleagues uh, in the BLAC have suggested that there may be a conversation necessary to postpone this for at least an election cycle so that the board, the board of elections, the council, the city can get their arms around this in a better way. Is there is is it your belief, right, without, re without regard to the fact that a charter mandate has taken place, is it your belief that when you've done everything in your power to do and in your tools to do, that the voters of New York City will be as educated as most possibly can and that this will be a success? 
And if, and if yes is yes, then yes is yes. I mean, I can't answer for you. I can only ask. So I, I appreciate the question and I appreciate you speaking straightforwardly as, as, you, you, as you always do. Um, I, I'll say this again, I, I wanna look at this past year as, as kind of an example and a proof of concept of how, how we can successfully communicate uh, confusing and sometimes changing circumstances around elections to voters. Um, our, the budget that we have to devote to this effort this year is greater than the budget we had to help promote early voting during this past year. When we saw, as noted again, a 20 times increase in early voting between the June primary and the November general election. Um, we believe we can successfully fulfill our mandate, ensure that, that communities around the city are, 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 are participating evenly, fully uh, in choosing the direction of the city going forward. Um, and, and, you know, I, again, I, I appreciate the, op the opportunity to respond, um, but, you know, we, uh, we have what we believe is a strong record at this task um, and believe that we are set. Um, again, I, I dismiss none of the comments we've heard today. Uh, I, we appreciate them all and understand the urgency. Um, that is why we are focused, um, as the charter directs us, on those voters who are underrepresented among vo the voting population at large. Um, and so we feel confident going forward. We are more than happy and eager to work with any member of this body or any um, organizations that you feel might help us best communicate in your communities. Because again, I, I don't come before you to represent that the CFB um, you know, knows the landscape in each and every district around, around the city. Um, we, we, are, we will rely on many hands to help us in this task. All right. I, I just want to, Mr. Chair, if I, if I may just make one final point and then I, I will yield back. Uh, I just want to also point out that, you know, the Voting Rights Act languages that you referenced in, in page eight of your testimony and, and, you, and you suggest that more funding is necessary for translation services. There are hundreds of languages in the city that are spoken that are not reflected in the obligations of the board, uh, not your board, the other board to, to translate on the ballot and in your own board to translate a voter material. And on a vast, uh, uh, really monumental change in voting like this, we're talking about, you know, hundreds of, I mean, my, my community, for example, Hebrew, Yiddish, Farsi, Arabic, Russian, I mean, there are some languages that are covered, there are some languages that aren't. You're talking about hundreds of languages and the ability to get this message out into literally hundreds of papers throughout the city, hundreds of different methods, thousands of possibly of different methods. Are you able to estimate what you would need Forget about what you designed to spend, but can you come and I mean, you may not be able to do it right now, you know, Eric, Madam Director, you may not know the numbers, but could you actually come to an estimate of what that could cost 10, 20, 30 million? I mean, what is the number that you think for such a vast education campaign? I'm not suggesting I'm okay spending that kind of money. I'm just, just asking what you think it could be, because I think obviously as the majority leader indicated, a million dollars is a pittance on this conversation. I think, I mean, you know, the, there's two questions there and I think we'll be happy to like, get back to you on kind of our thoughts on those. But if I can parse which the two questions is, one is the question of language access and translations, which are necessarily as um, the population that speaks them, it becomes more expensive. And so that's, you know, we've, we've budgeted for the languages that we are mandated to cover. So that, you know, so we would, uh, that there's a language translation. Then there's also, I think, built into your question, the access to, <coughs> excuse me, um, to uh, local media and uh, newspapers that are the ethnic media that is across the city. And that's another matter of, you know, additional expense. But obviously, um, let us get back to you with an, with an estimate of what that number would be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Thank you, Madam Director, uh, Mr. Friedman, for, for your time and for the great thought that you put into this. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member. I'll yeah. now turn back to Chair Cabrera for further questions. Thank you so much. Director, uh, I have a few questions, uh, but let me just say right off the onset here, uh, I, th I think one of the takeaways from today's hearing is that we need a larger investment. Uh, my own humble recommendation is 98%, and I believe uh, 
of Americans, actually this data, it's not what I believe, uh, have a television. 50% uh, people in my community don't have access uh, to the internet, but just about every household have a television. We need to do a big TV campaign. I know we rely a lot on social media, uh, but the, there's something to be said about uh, television outreach. If you could get us back with that number, we want to be helpful. We, we want to get it right. This is the first time that we're going to be implementing uh, RCV. And we want, we want it to be a good experience. Uh, we, we want the credibility factor to be there. Uh, we don't want anybody to feel disfranchised uh, throughout the process. And I, I, I'm conservative about spending uh, when we don't need to, but uh, we're talking about democracy here. And most likely, most of the, if I could keep it real, most of the people who are gonna be elected now uh, in June, most of them, 97% of them will be there for the next eight years uh, due to the data that we all know about regarding the power of the incumbency. Uh, so if you could get back to us, again, we wanna be helpful uh, regarding that issue. So uh, let me get into some questions uh, regarding, by the way, I, I wanted to ask you, based on what you've seen in the other cities, the rollout of the educational piece, what normally, how long that usually takes? Like how early, how early do they tend to start? You, you have seen cities start in providing the education for RCV. So uh, I'm happy to come back with, with more details um, on, on some of those campaigns that are um, as, as they went in other cities. As I said, we are um, through our work with Center for Civic Design, you know, working with them to kind of collect and gather the best practices from around the country, in addition to doing specific research on, um, on needs, the particular needs uh, that, uh, of New York City voters that they're conducting through those focus groups that uh, were being discussed earlier. Um, but when did you start a conversation with them? Yeah, for, for certain. Um, I mean, I think generally the, the sort of best practice that um, to keep in mind is that, you know, the vast majority of voters really tune into the, the election and the process of making their choice very close to that election within that last month. Uh, I mean, something to keep in mind as we have these discussions. And again, I, 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 I want to be clear that we understand the urgency that everybody's spoken about today. Most of New York City doesn't vote in a ranked choice voting election until June. Um, and so um, I, think, I think we can, you know, keep both of those ideas uh, in our, together at the same time. Um, you know, as we've discussed in detail, our plans are underway. Um, you know, look, if, if um, you know, you spoke about resources, um, you know, and, and I think we've made some suggestions that may help, help us manage uh, this, you know, the, um, the push to do kind of some additional work within the budgetary constraints that we and, and really much of city government are dealing with right now. Um, and that's something that, uh, again, in, in light of, of, of the pandemic and, and um, you know, the city's fiscal situation is out of our hands. Um, you know, but uh, if, if, there, if there are resources, um, you know, those additional translations we were talking about before require resources, a, a broad-based campaign to, you know, on television would require uh, resources. I think the plans that we do have uh, going into this year, we're happy to share with the committee. Um, you know, there, there, I think is, there is some television involved in addition to the social media and, and other, other marketing and promotional efforts that we have envisioned. And, and we'd be happy to share details with the committee. And so the, the, the design group that you're working with, have they made suggestions as to how early RCV education should take place? Uh, you know, 
I mean, again, I think they are, what I've said about voters paying attention one month before the election is something we, we've heard from them as well. It's something that I think they've observed uh, in other jurisdictions. If you'd like more detail, we're happy to, to kind of talk to the Center for Civic Design and, and provide that information to you. Yeah, we'd love to get those details because they're going to matter and uh, they're going to come up later on. And so we, 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 we want to plan that makes sense. It's almost, to be honest with you, this is almost like a political campaign, right? How you will run a political campaign, you're running an educational campaign. It's almost the same tools uh, that you're going to be utilizing. And so we want to make sure that our voters uh, are definitely well informed. Um, let me turn, you know, as you know, the bill re requires CFB to provide information regarding ranked choice voting in 10 designated citywide languages. Uh, what are the languages that CFB already plans to provide this information in? Are you adding new languages? Are you sticking to the 10 uh, that we have right now? So well, we, right now we plan to translate into the language, the five languages that we've always, the lang languages provide the materials and languages we've always provided materials in English, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, um, and Bengali. The addition as we, uh, that's with the colloquy with council member Yeager, um, you know, that we, we, there will be, would be additional costs that we have not budgeted for to uh, expand those translation services. And we'll get back to you on those precise information. So I, I, I wanna add one thing to, to the answer Amy provided. It's, you know, some of the discrete um, materials that are uh, proposed in the bill that we already have as part of our plan, like, like a one pager and some of the materials that uh, frequently asked questions for the website. We do anticipate working with our partners, um, you know, through city government to help us get get those additional citywide languages covered. When it comes to the biggest ticket um, items that we have in the plan, when it comes to you know uh, video production, when it comes to the voter guide that, that you know that will provide information about the hundreds and hundreds of candidates we anticipate running uh, in this fall in this 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 year's primary. Um, you know, those materials will be very, uh, you know, expensive and time consuming to, uh, to translate. And so those are, are not currently in our plans. Uh, how are the translations vary for quality? So, you know, we, when we, when we work on um, those, you know, the, those materials such as the voter guide, um, you know, we, we, we work with two separate vendors. Uh, to prepare those materials. We work with one vendor that does translation for us and another that does quality assurance uh, to ensure those translations are accurate. That's good. Um, so we, you know, we have, um, you know, we, uh, you know, that, that applies to the videos that we produce for, um, you know, candidate statements on, um, through our, on, uh, the, the scripts that we're provided from candidates are translated through that same method. You know, we, have been, you know, as of, I believe last year, maybe earlier, been including ASL translation in those statements uh, to make them more accessible for more voters. Um, you know, to the extent that's possible, we are we are working with uh, the city's, uh, the mayor's office for people with disabilities to ensure that you know the video materials we're producing are as accessible to as many of of, of their constituents as possible. So, like we're we are you know, putting as, as much thought as we can into, you know, into ensuring that, that the materials we, we produce can reach as many voters as possible. Um, again, I think, you know, the part of the box that I think we are all in, um, and I don't, I don't mean to suggest it just applies to us, um, you know, that, you know, we've run up against the limits of what, um, what is available to us um, in terms of resources. Uh I know I brought this up when I spoke to uh, Director Ryan. Uh, can you share with us uh, how you're coordinating uh, with New York City BOE to ensure that there's adequate training materials to train poll workers and interpreters on RCV? Um, so as Executive Director Ryan noted in his testimony, we have throughout this year developed a, a very strong collaboration at the staff level. Um, it's absolutely been a necessity this year to ensure that 
you know, we are providing voters with information that's accurate um, and timely. Uh, and so, you know, we've, we've always kind of relied on each other through the years. This year, we, we've really found, I think, um, we, we found it essential that we, you know, improve those channels of communication and strengthen them. So, you know, a, a, as he noted, we are, you know, we are more than willing and will provide the BOE with our materials as, as, as they are developed. Um, we will be sharing with them the results of our, uh, of, of the interviews and, and, and the focus groups that the Center for Civic Design is, is, uh, is conducting. Um, you know, speaking to voters with a single unified voice is, is really important. It's what's going to ensure that the message penetrates and gets everywhere into every community. Um, and and we're, we're looking forward to, to continuing uh, that work in partnership with them. Um, you know, one, other, one other thing I, I do want to mention and add just in terms of kind of channels that we have available to us. Um, you know, I want to make sure I, I, I include uh, our candidate services unit. Um, you know, which has direct communications with candidates um, pretty regularly. You know, we, you know, the information that we uh, and communications materials that we are putting together will be available, shared with candidates. Um, we have materials that, that are, you know, that they are ready to share, um, you know, to talk with candidates about how to kind of manage, um, you know, manage their approach to these ranked choice voting elections from the perspective of the campaign finance program. So that's also material and information and guidance that, uh, that we have available. Uh, how will CFB evaluate its outreach efforts during the special elections to inform the primary election voter education campaign? So when we, you know, when we uh, started this planning and, you know, we looked at our, what metrics we would want to use to, to judge our success, um, and, and kind of done this, um, done this well. Um, at the end of the day, we want to look at how many candidates rank at least a second choice, or had, sorry, how many voters rank at least a second choice. Um, and one of the, I think, you know, the number of special elections um, certainly was, you know, it, it just moves up everybody's timetable for, for certain, but it also provides us with an opportunity to, um, you know, to, to improve and iterate our efforts. Um, you know, th through through the, the winter and, and the early spring as we get ready uh, for June of 2021. So in addition to um, in addition to those interviews and focus groups we're conducting, you know, we have opportunities to, to communicate to voters and see what the results are. Um, you know, we so we're looking we'll be looking closely at how many candidates actually utilize the ranking uh, in those special elections. We're also speaking we've, we've speaking with Baruch about the possibility of of conducting surveys uh, in those uh, in those districts to, again help us to to refine and ensure that you know the messages that we're bringing to June when we're speaking to the broadest possible number of voters are going to be as effective as they can possibly be it'd be interesting to find out in a survey in the special election how many of them were aware of of, of RSV prior to voting, that way you could get a good ratio, right? And whether the tools that we're using right now were effective. I think that's probably gonna be your best measure uh, and, and help us for June. In some ways, these February elections, I know that, you know, we gotta get on top of them, but they're gonna be helpful for our June election uh, and get some some good data there. Let me close with this question before I uh, pass it along. I see Councilmember Lander and Miller, they have questions, but as you know, the city campaigns uh, to achieve a complete count in 2020 census had a, had a great outreach to LEP immigrant communities. And I mean, those, those communities I have found and uh, is they're not as, uh, you don't find us as often as other communities in Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. They're more likely to be found a lot of time in WeChat, uh, WhatsApp, uh, and the such. Uh, what kind of outreach are you going to be doing in, in, in social media channels uh, like those? Uh, and when would, the, when would you begin that type of outreach? if you are reaching out uh, for the June 2021 
uh, primary. So I, I don't have you know all of the details of, of, of what we're devoting to every specific platform, um, you know, at, at hand. But again, I'm happy to come back uh, and share those with the committee as we're able to pull them together. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the comment. I think it's, um, you know, I think we are as as the charter directs, um, you know, fo certainly you know keenly focused on communicating with. Uh, with communities with uh, large proportions of, of limited English proficiency voters. Uh, it's something the charter directs us, uh, directs us to, to, to do. Um, you know, we've, we, you know, we came into 2020 and 2021 with a, with a plan to target those communities and make sure that we are, um, you know, again, providing them with all the information they need to, to, to vote, you know, and really starting with, you know, why to vote and why local elections matter. Uh, and, and providing with all the information they need to know how to vote. Um, it's something we worked at through this year. Um, again, a, a challenging year, which really kept us from doing some of the in-person uh, outreach that we wanted to do. Um, but that will, be, that will be a continued focus for us going forward. So I appreciate the question. Happy to come back with more details, um, more specific details. And also that. that's part of why our strategy also incorporates this important component of working with our partners. Because again, you know, we, you know, you know, we, we can provide, you know, trusted, reliable, clear, concise, and accurate information. And, but, you know, really the way that that's best communicated to any particular community, um, in particular, you know, the underserved communities really is, you know, uh, will be benefited by hearing that information from, you know, community organizations that they already have a trust in. So, you know, so that partnership uh, model is really very important to reaching those particular communities um, because, again, we can produce clear, concise, trusted information, but again, getting it in a way that people will receive it and understand it and, um, and it, the way that the best received by them, I, you know, I don't want to speak for every single community in the city of New York. I think that we have incredible community organizations throughout the city who will be much better to give that information, get it into their hands and have them reach out to those communities. You know, uh, let me just share that uh, my first language was Spanish. All I knew how to say was yes and no, that was it. Uh, it was a scary experience just to communicate, forget about voting, just to communicate with anyone. To be honest with you, at the beginning, I would just answer no to everybody uh, just to play safe. Uh, and, and part of the reason I believe in some of our communities with this limited English proficiency, uh, there's a low... Um, voter turnout is because of that fear and rank choice what i think in in those districts where you have the lower voter turnout each vote is going to be mean even more uh in terms of you know pushing somebody up uh who might not have started first and i think this is part of the fear uh that has been spoken about uh, today. Personally, uh, I agree with Councilmember Yeager. Uh, you've been given a responsibility. You didn't get to determine <laughs> whether we were going to have RSV. Uh, and I want to be clear about that. And, and anybody who puts that on you is, uh, is unfair. Uh, it, it was put up for voters. Uh, and unfortunately, happening in a year that it was a lower voter turnout. Maybe that was done by design, maybe it was not. But uh, we just wanna get it right. We wanna make sure that the process was fair, uh, that everyone would get the right information. And I know you have the same goals. Uh, and I just wanna make sure that you get all the tools that you have uh, so your hands are not tied at the end of the day. And so with that, I know we have, I wanna turn it back to the committee council because we have two more questions and then we're gonna to turn to the public. Thank you, Chair. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Lander. Council Member Lander, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Council Member Lander is still muted.
Do we need to unmute him or? He, yeah, he's. Or he. Right, how's him. this? Okay. okay. All right. I know some people would like if I were kept muted much longer, but I appreciate the opportunity to go ahead and ask my question. And I know that some folks on here have been waiting all day. So I'm just going to ask one question um, because it does seem to me, and this gets to actually to the chair, to your point about, you know, television. Um, I think that actually goes to Eric's point that actually the vast majority of voters don't start paying attention to the election till right up before it's on. And, you know, they look across a number of traditional channels to get their information. Now, the Campaign Finance Board is in the best position to know at least how the candidates think um, that what are the best channels for reaching the voters. You're providing matching funds and in exchange for the matching funds, you collect a lot of information about where candidates spend money to communicate with constituents across platforms to reach their voters. That's not a perfect proxy. And, you know, I mean, like we don't have like, it's not necessarily evidence-based, but it's at least one good guess as to where folks who are trying hard to win elections think voters are looking. And I wonder what opportunities there would be. I mean, you've prepared good materials. Um, I know you're working on that. There's a set of ways the bill requires that you put them out on the website and through the voter guide. You know, what it seems like I would love if we could do is take the information that we have about how candidates spend to reach voters and try to use that for a, you know, as strong a campaign as we can to reach voters across the different languages. You know, that's ethnic media, but it's also television. It takes money for sure. We're gonna spend, as I think it, we rightly should, lots of public dollars on campaign finance matching funds to enable voters to communicate without relying on millionaires and billionaires. So we're gonna take public funds to do that. So I'm all for using some public funds more than we've allocated so far, and then doing it across the set of platforms where we think voters are looking for their voting information. So I, I love the idea of using the census you know, platform. I like the idea of using your platforms, but I just wonder if it's possible to also use the channels that candidates are using um, as a guess that that's a place on television, on certain forms of media that candidates themselves in their districts are using, you know, you guys luckily have the ability to do that. So what's the possibility if there's an adequate budget provided of, you know, putting some ads up on TV and looking across the other platforms, ethnic media and the way, based on the ways that candidates are spending their dollars, assuming that's sort of the, the best place to go to reach the, the voters. Um, so I, I appreciate the question, and, and and again, you know, I know that there there are there are many many demands on uh, on the city budget at, at the moment, and and I I don't know that I uh, that we you know are in the position to make a case that that one is more important than the other. Um, I, I do appreciate that you know TV is 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 a medium that allows allows candidates or or the CFB through our NYC votes campaign to reach a lot of voters quickly. Um, I mean, one other kind of piece of wisdom that you kind of learn that, that I've kind of absorbed from watching campaigns over the years, uh, and certainly through our work, is that, um, you know, that reaching voters just once, you know, is not always the most effective thing. And, and again, it's just not to, not to dismiss, um, but to suggest that, like, the most effective forms of outreach are ones where you're touching voters, you know, multiple times, three, four, five, six, seven times, to ensure that the message is absorbed and, uh, and understood, you know, and so that, you know, uh, in that vein, we have invested in platforms like, you know, like, like, like promotion on social media, like, like building out, um, you know, text campaigns, um, you know, such as, you know, multiple mailings um, and kind of building a strategy around the voter guide. So I, 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 I appreciate the suggestion. The analysis of, of candidate spending, I think, can be helpful in making the case that, um, you know, if, if, if there is a discussion about more resources, it certainly is a way to help make the case um, of, of how they can be effective. I, I would also say that, you know, again, given, given the constraints that I think all of us face on, on our budgets, you know, we have really worked hard to identify those media that allow us to conduct multiple outreach to, you know, multiple waves of outreach to voters to ensure they're not just hearing from us once, but hearing from us two, three, four, five, six times. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Council Member Miller. Council Member Miller, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. I can start now. Okay, thank you. And, and I do want to hear from my next panel. So 
I'm, I'm going to try to be brief. I just will say that I do recall some of the messaging that came out of the media around uh, the referendums, which included ranked choice voting, and they were, they, they were not subjective at all. They were definitely leaning in a particular way. So um, I hope that uh, um, we can do a better job uh, in, in the future. Um, but two things. There has been a lot of talk around diversity here and, and underserved communities and how do we reach target audience and stuff like that. And I often preface it, many of the, the, the uh, uh, my uh, questioning and, and around testimony, agency testimony with um, the specific demographics of agencies. And I see um, that this would be as appropriate time as any to talk about the diversity of uh, campaign finance. So what is staffing, uh, particularly executive policy making uh, folk uh, uh, at, at uh, campaign finance look like? Um, well, we have a five member executive team, um, uh, three of whom are minority. Uh, and I mean, I can get you more detail on the breakdown of the rest of the leadership of the organization, uh, you know, both the leadership of the organization, the rest of the organization, but that, you know, just to give you an answer right now, we have a executive team that is, you know, five members and three of them are minorities. Okay, definitely, uh, because I've not much seen much diversity coming out of this or any um, policy that really represents the voice of the communities that of the five million that we represent from the caucus here. And then, and, and finally, in, 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 in your, your deep dive, uh, to take a look nationally of the impact of, uh, of um, ranked choice voting uh, throughout the country. Uh, and some of the places in, in, in my reading, I have seen that, uh, that oftentimes where people are not as familiar with five candidates or whatever the, the uh, determined amount of candidates to be ranked, that they often go with the uh, their first choice, and and then the safe uh, second choice, and the safe second choice. Um, and what I've been able to determine has often been a white male. Have you found that in your studies as well? You know, I, I again, I think I, I'd want to, you know, do a little bit, you know, collect a little bit more of the research before I speak. Uh, more about about the specific, uh, specific question like that about what's happened in other jurisdictions. I, I know uh, you guys have just spoken so glowingly about it. I figured that you guys had had really analyzed all this information um, leading up to it, and that was the reason why that you were able to take such a position. Um, as my colleague said, I think that the duties of, of CFB is merely education and implementation, and not to really take a position uh, that. I think that you clearly have demonstrated to be overwhelmingly in, in favor. Uh, so that being said, I want to thank you all for a very long day. Look forward to uh, the list of questions that we will be sending over as the chairs indicated uh, being answered and, and, and making sure that that happens expeditiously so that we can really uh, uh, come to a head and see what our next steps are as a community as to how we will be addressing um, this uh, ranked choice voting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our work. Thank you, Council Member. And I want to thank CFB again for coming. Uh, looking forward, working together uh, and bringing those resources so we could, so you could execute the mandate that has been given and doing it effectively and efficiently. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back to uh, committee council. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer.
Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome Susan Lerner to testify, followed by Chris Hughes and then Sean Duger. Susan okay. Lerner, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you very much. I'm Susan Lerner. I'm the Executive Director of Common Cause New York, and I'm one of the um, uh, members of the Board of Directors for the Committee for Ranked Choice Voting, which you may know is Rank the Vote NYC. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the election efforts, the education efforts that we've been involved in. I'm going to defer to some of the panelists who follow after me who have detailed information about how ranked choice voting works in other cities. Um, and we'll be able, I think, to shed some light on the amount of time which other cities take and how ranked choice voting has really performed in the cities that have it, like Oakland, San Francisco, Santa Fe, Milwaukee, and now the state of Maine. Um, and I'd like to uh, focus my remarks on the specific bills which are in front of us after talking a little bit about our education efforts. Um, we've been hosting candidate and campaign staff trainings um, since the beginning of March, which we started in person with a uh, African-American um, consultant from uh, Minneapolis uh, to come in and work with the two people that we had retained uh, from the community here to be our trainers, uh, Debbie Lewis uh, and Andre Richardson. And on a weekly basis, we've been providing training free of charge, primarily to candidates and campaign staff, because what we learned in discussions with our colleagues who support ranked choice voting in those cities is that for a ranked choice voting education effort to be successful, you really need to have engagement from three different entities. First, you need good engagement from the election jurisdiction itself, the city, the election officials, and here it be the campaign finance board. But in all of the other cities, what we learned is that that was not sufficient, that a very important part of education is engaging advocacy and community groups, but equally important is engaging candidates and campaign staff. Um, because as has been mentioned earlier in the questioning, they engage with, with the voters on a very regular basis uh, and are able to answer questions and frankly, it is in their own self-interest uh, to be educating the voters about ranked choice voting. So on a weekly basis, providing that training, we have reached out to community groups across the city to provide those trainings. We did actually provide an online training for the Women's Caucus uh, of the city council. Uh, apparently, uh, many of the questioners from the council uh, chose not to attend that training. Uh, and we've learned what exactly uh, people ask about ranked choice voting and how to explain it uh, very uh, succinctly. Time uh, expired. Okay, sorry, I didn't realize I had that tight of a time deadline. Um, may I just say that we strongly support um, intro 1994 and I hope that the energy that we see in this uh, hearing will be devoted to educating the voters. I think having a clear instruction to agencies to be sure that they pick up and disseminate the materials so that, for instance, the Department of Aging ensures that all of the agencies that they deal with, Meals on Wheels and other agencies that provide direct information to seniors, have large print information about uh, ranked choice voting. And uh, I'm looking forward to further discussions about council member Lander's proposal with the board of elections and figuring out the best way in which to go forward and being sure that the results of ranked choice voting are as clear and transparent to the voters as possible. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to welcome Chris Hughes to testify, followed by Sean Duger and then Pedro Hernandez. Chris Hughes, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. 
Hi, my name is Chris Hughes. I'm the policy director at the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. And thanks so much uh, for the opportunity to present today to the council. Um, I'm gonna keep this fast. I have a couple slides I was hoping to share. So I'm gonna attempt, oh, I don't have sh screen sharing, that's fine. Um, we, so the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center is a national nonpartisan 501c3 nonprofit that uh, educates voters, election administrators and elections officials and anyone else who's interested about ranked choice voting. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, we have also applied to that RFP that was discussed earlier today, offering up our universal ranked choice voting tabulation software, which is open source uh, election software to count the round by round election results for New York City's elections starting January 1st, 2021 for any ranked choice voting elections. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions about that as well. Um, I already have, only have two minutes left. So we, um, one major service we provide, one major thing we research and, and study is the display of ranked choice voting results and timelines followed in different jurisdictions to actually produce ranked choice voting results. This was discussed in a lot of detail earlier. I'm just going to cover this quickly. Um, Different jurisdictions do follow quite different timelines for uh, for how they produce ranked choice voting results. Some jurisdictions like Maine produce just first choice total results uh, uh, starting on election night and wait until all ballots are counted, which in Maine takes about a week and a half uh, to run their round by round count. Other places like San Francisco begin on election night producing round by round results using those cast out record files that um, that were discussed earlier. And CASVO record files are essentially just digital representations of how every voter ranked uh, each candidate on their ballots. Um, so there, there's just a lot, there is quite a bit of variation. Um, and we've seen different jurisdictions have different comfort levels with different levels of information, um, depending on the timeline and the um, the speed of their results reporting. San Francisco does things quickly because they've been using ranked choice voting for about 16 years now, and had, their voters have gotten more comfortable with, uh, you know, seeing early round by round results um, in ways that the main uh, election administrators feel their voters are not yet uh, ready for. Um, there's also other implementation challenges in Maine related to how quickly they can centralize ballots. This was another thing that was discussed earlier. One of the major bottlenecks with reporting ranked choice voting results is just getting all of that data into one place. And so we are happy to work with the BOE on developing best practices for producing those ranked choice voting results. And I'm expired. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any of the questions people have. Thank you. Uh, first, we'll hear questions from Councilmember Miller, followed by Councilmember Yeager. Councilmember Miller, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, implementation. Um, Susan, uh, always a pleasure. Um, there, there, there is, you, you uh, testify with a great deal of confidence. Um, about the merits of ranked choice voting. Do you feel the same way about implementation uh, for uh, January, February and beyond? Okay, I'm unmuted. Yes, I do. We have devoted substantial time and energy. We have already started doing outreach in CD24. Um, we had a online um, RCV seminar uh, last Thursday evening that was sponsored by assembly, by assembly members Rosick and Rosenthal yep. uh, to uh, publicize within that uh, council district. We formed a uh, affiliation with the Queens uh, Public Library. Um, they're going to start including large print uh, RCV explanations with the books by mail program that they run uh, sometime after the first of the year. Um, and we are doing aggressive outreach to community board eight and to groups on the ground. Um, and we partner with a large number uh, of uh, groups in various different communities. So yes, I think this can be that's done. sufficient. Um, okay. Well, I think that there are a lot of different things that, that are planned. Uh, for instance, 
uh, ensuring that social service agencies include material in all of the discussions which they have. Um, we have a fully featured campaign plan for CD24 that we're now going to expand uh, to the second Queens. Okay, Having, considering that CD24 is my neighbor, I share the community board with them and, and parents are there and all that good stuff there. I hope that you're right. I would submit that that is not the case, right? But as we move forward, Chris, um, your software, which is which is the uh, voting tabulator mm -hmm. and universally ranked, uh, ranked choice voting, um, how successful has this uh, software been in other municipalities throughout the country? Yeah, so we've been used in um, two other municipalities to produce official election results. We've also been used in, in, in the state of Michigan and in the state of Utah. We were also used to produce results in statewide Democratic primaries earlier this year for Kansas, Wyoming, and Alaska. Okay, what, 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 is, the, uh, what, what is the largest demographic that you've, that you've uh, worked with? Yeah, the largest um, that the tabulator has ever been used in is the state of Kansas, where there were time expired. Uh, I believe three hundred fifty thousand votes cast in that election. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we heard questions from Council Member Yeager. Council Member Yeager, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Ms. Lerner, Ms. Hughes. Um, and thank you for being here and thank you for, uh, for taking the time to uh, stick around for this very long, but I guess educational hearing. Uh, Ms. Lerner, I have great respect for your work. You're legendary in New York for your advocacy on uh, good government on, uh, or what, what you believe is good government, and sometimes I agree with you, uh, and uh, particularly uh, a focus on campaign finance and campaign finance reform and the cleanliness of money and politics uh, the transparency that money ought to be in politics uh, and, and when it ought to be, uh, how transparent it needs to be uh, so that the voters know, um, because I think that we can all agree that that's the most important. So now I have a question about last year's election. Last year's election, the committee that you referenced spent 2.2 million, raised and spent $2.2 million to advance this referendum on the ballot, which received, as I stated earlier in my questions, 500,000 votes in New York City a city of eight and change million people. Of the $2.2 million, it came from approximately 20 donors. Um, five donors alone contributed two of the $2.2 million. My question to you is, do you believe that that reflects good government? Well, the fact that you have all of those figures and are able to question me, I think speaks for itself. Yes, I think that uh, there are various supporters who contribute and there is complete transparency to it. Our education efforts this year are being supported by the Revson Foundation and by the New York Community Trust because they're concerned, as is everybody I think on this call to be sure that New Yorkers have accurate information about ranked choice voting so that they have the benefits uh, of the system when they cast their votes either in the special election or in June. All right, so the same question, um, but looking for a different answer. $2.2 million from 20 donors to advance a measure in an off-year election where the majority, the heavy majority of New York, in other words, more than 90% of New Yorkers didn't vote. And now we have this question that is, or this, this measure that is supposed to take effect this year. Given, and you, I know you were here for the earlier part of the questioning, given the concerns of a number of members, whether or not the city is ready for this, do you believe that there's any merit to, uh, to delaying the implementation in this election cycle? Do you believe, and I guess part of that question is uh, the question that I asked uh, Director Lopress and, uh, and Mr. Friedman, do you believe that the Campaign Finance Board no matter how hard they work, and I think you and I both agree that they work incredibly hard and do an incredibly good job, uh, no matter how hard they work over the next several weeks, Fine. they're ready uh, to, to give the education necessary to teach New Yorkers 
uh, in an election, two elections in February, two elections in March, and obviously the citywide primaries in June, uh, how to use the system in the proper way and how to actually expand, uh, not, not detract from the number of voters participating in the system. So uh, I disagree. I do believe that there is time. I agree that the February time deadline um, is coming upon us. But when I look at the experience in um, um, East Point, uh, Michigan, where the Department of Justice entered into a consent agreement with the city, requiring it to run its next election in ranked choice voting, and the city had approximately six weeks. Oh, and that was the settlement of a civil rights claim, by the way. Um, that the city had approximately six weeks to gear up and run ranked choice voting uh, there. And all reports are uh, that the public was able to use that system. Uh, as you'll hear from the people who are gonna testify after me, um, it would be highly unusual and I'm not aware of any jurisdiction which started its education for RCV voters uh, at the time frame that people here have been talking about. Uh, on average, it appears to be four to six months uh, at the most uh, that jurisdictions start their discussions about RCV. And that's borne out by our experience in reaching out to different communities and frankly to different elected officials who told us that RCV was later and they would think about it later when we offered trainings to them. Um, I also have had the personal experience of talking to voters that I know of, acquaintances, and they've asked, what are you working on? I've exchanged, I've explained ranked choice voting in September and October. They got very excited and they said, can I use that in November? And the answer is no, you can't use that in November. So there's a very good reason why things are uh, sequential here um, because the truth of the matter is much as we wish voters were paying attention the way the political class pays attention all the time, they just are not going to pay attention until we're closer to the election. That's why we chose to concentrate on outreach to political clubs, to community groups, and most importantly, to campaigns and candidates. And the response there has been very strong. Um, though that's why we chose to concentrate there during 2020, knowing that we were going to have to gear up very quickly for a very broad campaign in 2021. With the chair's indulgence, just to follow up on this, uh, you know, given, given the number of people uh, and Ms. Lerner, you're, again, as I said earlier, your work is legendary on, on getting people to vote and, and campaign finance. And you're right, uh, you, your answer on the transparency of my being able to discover the information maybe speaks to it, but I still, you know, we'll, we'll, we can agree to disagree on 2.2 million from 20 people being good government or not. But I do have a different question on a totally related but unrelated topic. Given the number of people that are going to vote, we anticipate and we are hopeful on paper in advance because the more people do it that way, um, particularly February and March, the more likely we'll get more voters out. Um, and frankly, I, I think that we all know that February and March people are just not going to be ready to be voting in person the way we used to at this point. Um, uh, there's not going to be, when people get the ballot, there's not going to be anybody to ask how to do this. Do you believe that there's any merit to the question of, of pushing this off to the next election cycle? Or is it absolutely imperative that it has to happen in 2021 Starting February, it must, there's no merit whatsoever to having this conversation even in advance. I think if we were to push it off, we would be having exactly the same conversation if there were a special election which came up in anticipation of whatever the later date would be. The truth of the matter is there are a lot of different modalities to communicate with voters. Text has been, has been mentioned. Phone services have been mentioned. There are direct services which are provided. Um, and I know from my own experience talking with community partners across the city that there are numerous groups that are focused on how we get this information out to voters and what um, resources we need to be able to get the information out and to answer the questions in any way possible, including the possibility, frankly, of just having people canvassing right outside polling places, providing information to voters as they go in to vote to be sure that there are, if there are people who are planning to vote and they haven't gotten the information that they will get it. There 
will be there will be phone outreach there will be text outreach there will be advertising and if anything i think there may be a bit more of that in cd24 and in cd i think it's 31 which is the february 20 the february um special elections because they are the first. And we wanna be sure that the communication modalities that we are all using reach the maximum amount of people. Um, I do agree with uh, Chairman Cabrera that uh, although, you know, if anybody had asked me, would you have chosen a special election in February? I probably would have said, hey, can we start in March? That the February and March special elections give us an opportunity to really uh, get the system tight to be sure that the education and outreach takes place the way it should and that if there are any um, unexpected uh, adjustments that need to be made that we can make them after a single council district uh, election rather than uh, having the first run for the system in June, which as everybody has pointed out, is an extremely large election. And frankly, I personally am going to be grateful to have ranked choice voting when I'm looking at the multiplicity of candidates that I'm going to need to wade through. Okay, I, I'm gonna turn it back to Chair, but my, my last point though, just on the education that you've been talking about, the text and the phone calls and et cetera, you're referring not to the government's work, you're referring to the work that nonprofits and organizations like yours are gonna be doing to chip in, but the government itself is not actually at the point where it's committed to doing this kind of outreach, as you heard from the earlier testimony, um, uh, the, the, the uh, Director Lopez was still gonna get back to us on, on how that education is gonna work, what the budget she thinks she would need. Um, all of these things you're talking about are wonderful, but they're happening because you're putting together the resources and the plan. Government needn't necessarily rely on the nonprofit sector, the, the public education sector, the good government sector to make these things happen. It ought to be the government doing it. And that's the point of this hearing is that is the government ready to actually do it? That you can ship in, I, wonderful. I think it's great. You know the respect I have for your work. We've spoken many times about it. But the, the idea that we're relying on you to do it, I don't think is the best possible plan. Good that we have it, not the greatest thing that we have, that, that we have to rely on it. And with that, oh. you can answer if you need to, but I, I just, I'm <laughs> going to tell the my last question. I appreciate the chair. Thank you uh, so but much. Quickly, I would yeah, like ahead, to say that I don't believe, as I said, that the voters are relying only on the nonprofits. I think it's a collaborative effort between the city resources, candidates, campaigns, and the nonprofit community. And that's what you need for a successful education campaign, not one or the other, but all of them working together. Thank you so much, council member. I do have a question, but I wanna remind uh, the council members that are still on, that we still have 13 panelists. Uh, that have been waiting patiently now for uh, four and a half hours. So, um, Really quickly, uh, Susan and Chris, thank you for coming. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question. I, I don't know if, if you have the data uh, that I had asked previously regarding uh, exit polls. Uh, anybody ever done any exit polls to see how many uh, knew about RCV prior to coming to the polling site? So off the top of my head, I can't answer that question, but I suspect that Pedro Hernandez from Fair Vote who's okay. going to be testing shortly is probably the right person who has that information and can help um, shed some light on that. Fantastic, I'll definitely keep in mind. Uh, and just for uh, Chris, real quick here, uh, re your software is the one, uh, you say open source, meaning free, just- Yes, yeah. We Free 99, as we say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. the software itself is free. We have also offered uh, support and training services um, in the RFP as well at cost. And how secure is this software? Uh, it's very secure. We've had it tested by uh, ProVNB, which is an EAC certified testing lab multiple times. And we've, we've passed every security audit and security test that they have put us through. And your knowledge, have you ever had an experience of anybody trying to break into the system in any of the races? We have not ever experienced any sort of intrusion attempt, no. That, that's good to know. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your insight. 
And uh, let me pass it on now to the committee council because we, we do have uh, 13 more panelists, but thank you. And we're gonna be leaning on both of you. Thank you, Chair. Now I'd like to invite Sean Dugar to testify. After Sean Dugar, I'll be calling on Pedro Hernandez and then Josh Pierre. Sean Dugar, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good afternoon and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you. My name is Sean Dugar. I am the Education Program Director for Rank the Vote NYC. Um, and I hail from the Bay Area of California where for the last 10 years, I've advocated for, done education campaigns on, and helped candid local candidates get elected under ranked choice voting. Um, I've also spent um, over a decade and a half working for the NAACP at all levels of the organization. And I am here to say that in the Bay Area and in California, we've seen that voters of color, especially black voters, understand ranked choice voting once it's explained to them, same as anyone else. In fact, a 2019 peer review, reviewed study published by um, Social Science Quarterly analyzed data from five Bay Area cities um, that have RCV, Berkeley, Oakland, San Leandro, and San Francisco, and compared that to non-RCV cities of Alameda, Richmond, Stockton, Anaheim, Santa Ana and San Jose, California, to examine whether there were any racial disparities in voter understanding. In terms of understanding voter instructions for RCV, there were no differences between whites and people of color. There were also no differences in RCV cities in how whites, African Americans, and Latinx respondents reported understanding of the system. Let's dive in a little bit deeper. In San Francisco, uh, Mr. Chair, you asked about this, um, a 2004 exit survey done by San Francisco State University found that after RCV was first implemented, that 87% of voters said that they understood the system well, that 61% of voters said they preferred RCV to the old system, and that 69% said they knew how to rank candidates even before coming to vote. What we've seen is that with RCV, we have more women, more people of color elected to office, including the first black woman to be mayor of San Francisco, who would not have been able to get into that position without ranked choice voting having been implemented. So just quickly, what are we doing as Ranked to Vote NYC? Susan talked a little bit about our education plan. In addition to that, we're bringing in organizers in every borough we're doing small grants to community organizations that are already on the ground and have networks. Um, we're providing libraries with cards and other services so that they can be included in the book deliveries. Um, and we've been doing trainings. We've had trainings of the Women's Caucus of the City Council. Um, we've done trainings for three in time expired. And we've done trainings for 55 current candidates and campaigns. We are on the ground doing the work and are ready to go. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear questions from Majority Leader Cumbo. Majority Leader Cumbo, you may be on upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Hi, Sean, how are you? Good, thank you. Good, Sean, I just wanted to ask you because that's part of the comparative that we're making. How much money did they spend in San Francisco when they initially rolled out ranked choice voting and how long was the education period? When did it begin and up until the point of when ranked cho choice voting began? Sure, so San Francisco actually rolled out their education plan three months before ranked choice voting was um, implemented. So they started, um, they adopted their campaign plan in July and ran August through November. During that time period, they spent a total of $776,000. Um, 210,000 of that were grants that went to community organizations. Um, during that time period, they did over 700 outreach events and ensured that all of their materials, including billboards and signs, were translated into five languages. So you'd say they did about 700 events 
They did 700 community outreach events and spent a total of $776,000. So then a lot of volunteer-based work went into this. Um, I think it was really a, the main focus was um, providing community organizations that were already on the ground with the tools and resources they need needed to reach out to their constituents. Um, but also, as Susan mentioned, it's kind of a trifecta. You have to have government outreach. You have to have nonprofit and community outreach. And then you also have to make sure that candidates are doing education and outreach as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I appreciate that information. I mean, the, the ability to have that level of community outreach is a large part of what we're talking about today. I mean, New York City is much larger than San Francisco, um, with a much larger Black population than San Francisco um, and communities of color, but also the fact that a main aspect of what we're talking about is that for Black and Brown communities, we generally do benefit from those types of community forums. Um, such as those 700, we will be um, in an unpredictable way of knowing whether those types of events could take place or not. So, you know, I would, I would just, because we're in the heart of a pandemic, it's hard to say what it would look like. I think at this point, from what I'm hearing, it's, it's more, for, I don't know how it is in other cities, but I imagine it's everywhere. Sometimes the slam dunk of, of a legislative process is, becomes more exciting than the actual work that it will do. And so I feel like this is, you know, one of those, it was a good idea, people are excited about it and we just wanna make it happen, whether it's a good idea or a bad right. idea or it's problematic. And I kind of feel like that's where we're at, but I, I appreciate you sharing practices from San Francisco um, with the body. Can I just, just a quick response? Sure. Um, I will say we did, Susan mentioned it, we had last Thursday, um, a, community um, training, if you will, uh, with two assembly members. And just in the couple of days since then, we've had a dozen organizations reach out to us, um, mm -hmm. NCD24, saying, will you do another training for us? So there is definitely the desire by community organizations. They're still meeting. They may be meeting in a different format and in a different way, but these community events are still happening. Um, and we are committed as Rank the Vote NYC to go anywhere that we're asked to go. Um, we'd be more than happy to, to conduct um, train the trainer events uh, with the council. Um, we're doing the same with the um, Queens Public Library. We're going to be training all of their librarians on rank choice voting so that they can explain it to people. Um, we're here and we're committed to the process and to making sure that all communities, but especially the communities that the DLAC has highlighted, um, have the education and the tools that they need to understand RCV. No, I appreciate that. I just, I just want to reiterate again that um, those types of events and you know, you being so open to going wherever we need you to go is wonderful, except that you can't go where we need you to go because we're in the heart of a pandemic. So, you know, that's a huge part of the challenge here. And it's also a huge part of the challenge that as elected officials who participated greatly in census and early voting, um, we're now scrambling at this time to get food to our shut-ins and our seniors um, with food and resources um, drying up. Um, so the majority of my day is spent around getting food to seniors. It would not be able to be bifurcated with information on how to rank choice vote while I'm trying to get people signed up to the mayor's food and food program. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a few questions, uh, Shine. Thank you for the data that you provided. Uh, uh, we had uh, Council Member Miller mention that in some states, RC the RCV legislation was uh, repeal and, and they turned back uh, to a popular vote. Uh, do you know why that took place in those states? You know, I'm not quite sure. Um, my experiences have been more so California-based, where we've seen ranked choice voting expanding. Um, hey, Bernie. And so, um, yes. 
Pedro okay. Hernandez. Oh, so kids in points for California. Uh, uh, Councilmember Miller also mentioned that the governor uh, put an executive order, if I understood him right, uh, regarding uh, stopping the expansion of it. Uh, do you know anything about that? Um, so the governor vetoed a piece of legislation that was introduced that would have allowed, um, we have charter cities and non-charter cities. Um, it would have allowed non-charter cities to um, implement ranked choice voting. My understanding is that it is more so because of uh, the personal preferences of the gover governor on ranked choice voting. Um, but again, which is, which is for the record, huh? which is for the record, you would have to ask him that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he hasn't made that public. All right. <laughs> yes. Um, but we've seen his allies. London Breed is a close friend of his, um, elected again as the first Black woman as mayor of San Francisco. And without ranked choice voting, she wouldn't have been elected as supervisor, which allowed her to become um, elected as mayor of San Francisco. Now, uh, Councilmember Miller mentioned that uh, uh, the mayor of San Francisco was elected 20% uh, margin and then it went down to 1%. Was, is there a correlation there to the RCV? Um, Causation, uh, rather? Give me one moment. Um, so I believe my understanding of that race um, is that once um, ranked choice voting was um, once the process went through with ranked choice voting, she actually came out with a much higher percentage of the vote. Um, after so, after the ranked choice. After the rankings, yes. Interesting. Yes. Uh, let me ask you: Do you believe that a million dollars uh, is enough for CFB to be able to execute the mandate that they have in terms of public education with RCB? Um, again, I just use San Francisco as the example. And so San Francisco, which is a city roughly about a quarter of the size of New York, um, spent $776,000 to do education over a three month period. Um, the current proposal for New York is to do it over a six month period. Um, and so I think, you know, that's a double the time frame. Um, I think it's doable. I think, you know, as long as all sides of that trifecta are working together, that you have the um, government agencies doing outreach, that you have the nonprofits doing outreach, and that you have the candidates. Again, we've trained 55 of them so far um, on how to do education and how to campaign under ranked choice voting, that um, yes, it can be done. And so, but based on what you just mentioned, 700,000 with a quarter of our population, that would be more like 3.5. You know, we, we're talking about two, almost $3 million that in order to make it compatible, unless there's some kind of economy of scales uh, involved here. I would just add in on that, that again, it was done in a three month period, which is a very condensed timeline. Right. Um, with six months, you have a little bit more time to spread that out um, and do um, more targeted outreach. Got it. And my last, well, that was my last question. I know there are a couple other council members that have their hands raised, uh, so I'm going to give it back to the committee council. Thank you so much, Sean. Very valuable information. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, now we'll hear questions from Councilmember Miller, followed by Councilmember Carnegie. Councilmember Miller, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you, Council. <laughs> um, Sean, uh, we've actually, I, I guess we first got acquainted about a year ago when you came into New York uh, on behalf of ranked choice voting. Who was you employed by then? Um, I was a staff member of California Common Cause. And how long have you been in New York City? Um, I've been helping out in New York for the last couple of months on this project. Okay, and how do you quantify your 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 um, 
how would you quantify your ability to kind of move and understand the political dynamics of neighborhoods throughout New York City in comparison to San Francisco? I think that's why we have um, our team is being led by locals, um, by folks who are on the ground. That's why we're hiring organizers in every borough who understand the local dynamics. Um, for me, it's really my role is one of coordinating the best practices for voter education, um, RCV voter education and messaging and tools from across the country um, and ensuring that um, New York City has all the resources and tools that they need at their disposal for the education process. So, so in, in, in terms of a lot of talk about San Francisco, um, uh, during, during its rollout, um, on, on public education, particularly around senior centers, that mm -hmm. there were 14 different centers that were being engaged and that they had regular, um, that, they, um, that there were regular education around ranked choice voting at each one of these centers. Um, how, how do you make up for that? Did, has any of this, and, 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 and this for you, as well as Susan, we talked about some of the education that went and what the timelines were. Have we, are we considering that we are in the midst of a, a pandemic and, and, and intend to do what we've seen uh, nationally in some places, obviously with, with uh, a tenth of the population that we can do this in, in, in New York City, considering our, circum our, our current circumstances? I think, you know, we are, our campaign plan is one of meeting voters where they are. So that means whether it's Meals on Wheels, and whether it's the library delivery, book delivery services, um, whether it's organizations that are providing meals in their communities, whether it's churches that are still um, doing social distance visits, um, whatever it may be that we are providing the tools and resources to those organizations. Were, were you were you in March and April? I was not. May. Time expired. Were you here in May? I was not. Then you didn't. Then 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 you have not really felt the the bite of of COVID nineteen here in, in in New York City and and the impact that it had on these communities. And then finally, let me just say that you know I I think you were being a little disingenuous when you talk about Mayor London Breed and her ascension to mayor. Um, uh, from her leadership position that she had taken over and was clearly the favorite. And, and the fact is that she pulled that high double digits and won by nearly a single uh, uh, 1%. Um, and the person that nearly bested her is the person that uh, introduced the legislation uh, that was vetoed by Governor Newsom. So th th there seems to be some, some inside baseball happening here and, 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 and we're very cognizant of that and we're not trying to see that here in New York. So forgive us if, if we're a little overbearing in this process here uh, because uh, we don't believe that uh, some of the things that have occurred and the way they occurred in, in San Francisco and other places are gonna protect the integrity of the democracy that we, particularly people of color, have come to know and master here in New York City. Council Member Miller, I will say London is a close personal friend of mine. Um, going back to our days in NAACP Youth and College Division together, um, I say with all authenticity that had it not been for ranked choice voting, she would not have been elected to the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. Um, we are talking about mayor. Huh? We're talking about mayor. But she wouldn't have become mayor had she not been on the board of supervisors. But, and but, but she was on the board. She she was the mayor, and she became uh, uh, she she upon the, the the death she became the the interim. So she clearly she was she was the favorite. She was the favorite by high numbers. And in fact, because of ranked choice voting, the person that architect this and architect the legislation to expand it uh, throughout the state of California nearly bested her. I think you left that out. No, sir. So I'm talking specifically about her being elected to the Board of Supervisors, which at the time there was an open seat that was filled by Mayor Ed Lee. 
um, to, and someone else was appointed because her mentor, her best friend in the world um, decided that she wasn't ready to be a supervisor. That person was Willie Brown. Um, it was through her using a ranked choice voting strategy and ranked choice voting messaging that she was able to best the person who was the appointed incumbent into that seat um, and win her race to become, to become a supervisor on the board of supervisors. It was that coalition that she built during that campaign that got her elected by her colleagues on the board of supervisors as the president of the board of supervisors. And, and, and what, president of the board of supervisors. what turned the corner on that when she ran for mayor? What was different? I'm saying that it was that process that led her to the point of being. What, um, what, had, what, what, what was different when she became mayor? It was that process that led her to being able to become mayor. Yeah, but she was interim and, and, and when she ran, right? Because she, she was interim, correct? She, yes, yeah, she became interim because she was president of the board of supervisors. When, when, the, when the mayor, the previous mayor, yeah. upon his demise, right? Correct. And, and obviously you, you do a fairly good job, you're gonna win. And based on this strategy, she nearly lost. But so, sure. you know what, I don't wanna belabor that. Let's, let's just move on. I just think it was a little disingenuous how it was presented. Okay, uh, I'm, thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging me. Thank you. Next we will hear questions from Council Member Carnegie. Council Member Carnegie, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Hello? Did I lose you, Sean? You're all muted. We can hear you. Yep, so um, I don't know if I missed some very important demographical information for San Francisco. If you could just indulge me if I did miss it, I apologize. Um, can you tell me what the demographic uh, numbers are for, uh, for the African-American community in particular in San Francisco? So I can say San Francisco has had a drastic drop in their black population. Um, so the city of San Francisco overall is 66.7% people of color. Um, but of that um, total population, the black community as of the last census, not the current one, was at 6.1%. Um, but you have a 33.3% um, API population and a 15.1% um, Latino population. So I, I will just go out on a limb and say our numbers here in New York, uh, the city in particular are significantly higher. So mm -hmm. when, we, when we consider the, the um, the ability to disenfranchise with a new system without robust education, it's a little different. So it's not really apples to apples. In this instance, it's probably more apples to oranges or something even a smaller fruit, apples to grapes or something. But um, I just wanted to make that uh, because while I appreciate your testimony and all the hard work you've done around ranked choice voting, I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to take that away from you. Uh, the demographics are just, are just so seismically different. Plus the external factors like redlining on, on black folks here in, here in New York, uh, like the crack e epidemic, like uh, being, the, 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 being the most segregated school system. So there are these extenuating factors that actually have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and then on top of this, so in and of itself, the narrative around ranked choice voting, uh, like they say in the hood, might sound fly. But with all of those mitigating circumstances that are compounded, it conspires to disenfranchise folks. Right now, I'm dealing with a, 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 a lean sale, third party transfer, deed theft epidemic. While there's, a, while there's a health epidemic going on, we have that disenfranchising, we've had redlining, we've had like, so all of these things conspire to disenfranchise voters. We had the Voters' Rights Act of 1968, which was designed to protect voters. Like, so, so, so somewhere in our history, they understood that we were disenfranchised and attempted to right the ship. It didn't do everything it was supposed to do and clearly it's non-existent at this point. And now to compound that history. So I just wanted to give historical context to why uh, the Black, Latino and Asian Caucus, which is on this call, feels so vehemently opposed to moving forward without 
the robust education that's necessary because of the historical context of what's happened to 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 to, to black time in the, in the city of New York. So thank you for your um, testimony, but I, I I needed to just jump in and give some historical context and all of the mitigating factors that have found us disenfranchised as a people through education, through healthcare, and how the, the pandemic has exacerbated all of that. And then you have this on top. So thank you. Thank you, council member. I'll just briefly say um, San Francisco is probably more so to scale um, population wise. Um, but if you're talking about demographics, you have places like Oakland that have implemented RCV, have followed a very similar timeline and educational plan to what was done in San Francisco. And again, you know, you continue, continue to see people of color get it. You have the most African Americans on the city council there in its history. Um, you have the most African Americans on the school board now coming in in its history. Um, and all of that is because of ranked choice voting and the strategies that they've been able to utilize um, under RCV. You're, you're muted. Somebody unmute me. I would, I, would debate, I would debate that they have the most amount of city council members because of ranked choice voting. And I would argue that because it's the, large, the largest African-American uh, county in, in, in there that may have an impact on it. So again, I, I'm not going to you know, uh, get into an argument. And then I would compound what I didn't mention was the onset of gentrification in communities of color um, mm -hmm. as well, which is another mitigating factor that looks, that seeks to disenfranchise people, uh, black people in particular, from home ownership, from mm -hmm. quality education, and now from the one thing that they've held sacred, which is the ability to choose their leaders in a fashion that makes sense. One person, one vote. So thanks, thank you again. Uh, for your testimony. You seem very knowledgeable about what's happening in San Francisco. And as somebody who does a tremendous amount of research, uh, some of it meaningless, I can appreciate uh, uh, your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, next, we will hear questions from Council Member Adams. Council Member Adams, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Uh, Sean, it's been a pleasure to listen to you. I just wanna say that, it really has. Um, thank you for the work that you've done around New York City um, and really uh, in, in your efforts across the country to get this message out. Again, I just want to reiterate, you know, um, we are about, and I'm co-chair of the BLAC uh, for, for the council with, with co-chair Miller, and um, this is just so vitally important to us um, in so many ways. It has the potential to make or break um, the backs, literally, um, you know, of, of a people that have been disenfranchised historically, quite frankly. So we take this very seriously. Um, I just want to say, you know, at the top of the testimony, it was, it, it sounded a little like uh, we were saying that, you know, Black folks can't get it. They're not going to get it. And that's not the message that I want to relay in this hearing. We are not saying that Black people do not have the capacity to understand ranked choice voting. I think that what we are saying is that people of color, Black and brown people, need to have the same opportunity to get the education that is afforded everyone else that has had this system implemented in their jurisdiction. So I think that it's, it's one thing to say, oh, you know, we're, 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 they, they don't get it. That's not the message. Of course, people of color can get it. We are in the middle of a pandemic right now. We are up against a brick wall right now. As, as Majority Leader Combo said, we are right now trying to feed, uh, you know, my district is, you know, almost 170,000 people, um, you know, and, and that's just me alone. Uh, we are trying to feed families. We are trying to educate children. We are trying to make... Uh, you know, bring Wi-Fi where there's never been Wi-Fi. And to have this, I'm going to call it an obstacle, to have this obstacle right now at this particular time. And that's not to say that we want to overturn the law. The law is the law. But what we are saying is that now is not the time and the preparedness is a concern, you know. Um, and, and again, your efforts are terrific. I'm just going to ask in the and maybe Susan can answer this as well. Um, in the uh, outreach to District 24, uh, what was the uh, turnout as far as the electorate is concerned? We know that we were there with, with our colleagues in government, but as far as the 
um, the, the turnout to get the education. Uh, last week, I believe the training was. What was the turnout like? Thanks. There we go, I'm unmuted now. Um, so I believe we had at the peak 170 participants on the conversation last Thursday. Um, and this was just, again, the first of many of these. You know, we would invite every member of the city council to host I'm expired. in their community. And we'd be more than happy to provide the education. Um, I know we've offered to the BLAC a couple of times the opportunity to do a train the trainer event um, so that you all are as versed on RCV as possible. Um, we are still committed to doing that with you all. Um, we're here for whoever wants that training, whoever needs that training. Again, in specifically in CD, sorry, specifically in CD24, since that event um, last Thursday, we've had a dozen organizations reach out to us and say, we want to help host trainings um, in our community. Can you do it for us? And we've said yes to everyone. I have nothing to add. Thank you. Uh, seeing no more hands raised, we'll move on to the next panelist. I'd now like to invite Pedro Hernandez to testify. After that, I will be calling on Josh Pierre and then Rachel Bloom. Uh, Pedro Hernandez, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pedro Hernandez. I'm the senior policy coordinator at Fairvote. Um, Fairvote is a nonpartisan electoral reform organization that's been around since 1992. Um, and it's been a leading resource on ranked choice voting. Um, since 2016, I've been active in the Bay Area doing voter education and have worked with the Department of Elections here in the city to improve its education materials and have worked with community partners to educate voters on ranked choice voting, as well as changes to the ballot. Um, our organization has provided ranked choice voting resources in English, Spanish, Chinese, uh, locally, our organization has presented to thousands of voters in the Bay Area, and not just San Francisco, Oakland, and San Leandro and Berkeley as well. Um, in 2019, I helped craft the education plan that was used in East Point, Michigan, that was referred to earlier. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Um, there are some things that I wanted to cover, mostly around the implementation of ranked choice voting, where we've seen it uh, be implemented across the country. And I can start just kind of adding to some points that Sean made earlier about San Francisco. Um, in 2004, when San Francisco first implemented ranked choice voting, it finalized its plan in July 20, 2004, five months before that November election. And in that three, and it said in that plan that over a three month period, uh, the Department of Elections was going to work with 11 community-based organizations on an outreach strategy in the, in the supervisor districts that were having ranked choice voting ele elections. All the ranked choice voting materials were translated into Chinese, Spanish, Tagalog, Russian, and Vietnamese to assist those English language proficiency efforts. Uh, the department outreach also uh, dedicated efforts to uh, educate those who are disabled, the elderly, and first-time voters. Um, the education mostly needs what we've seen in San Francisco and other places is an emphasis on the actual ballot layout, a picture of the ballot, what the ballot looks like, and then some graphics that kind of show how you mark the ballots in order of preference. Um, and you, in San Francisco, it's also included a kind of a graphic showing the application of ranked choice voting to eliminate candidates and transfer votes and you know the impact that overvoting and undervoting would have in those contests um, i also can speak to the voting experience in santa fe they had about two months to implement the ranked choice voting plan and the experience was overall positive turnout increased from 28 percent in 2014 to 38 percent i know that doesn't seem like a huge jump but it was significant because uh, we didn't see large turnout in santa fe uh, typically, and in that election, only voter, 40 voters casted in an undervote, meaning they skipped out that ranked choice voting contest, um, and that, you know, 26 Time expired. had an, uh, casted an overvote, meaning that 99.9% .9 of voters casted a valid ballot in that election. Um, thank you f so much for your time. And I, I could also just add about um, 
uh, election reporting in San Francisco and some of the questions that folks have about that. But we generally see San Francisco uh, put out a report um, on Election Day, four reports, the first and, four, and the fourth, having the ranked choice voting count. And what it's led is to greater understanding and just more transparency of the voter process. The Department of Elections actually releases a press release outlining how it will roll out the election results. And that's been really helpful and informative for the press as well. I have a quick question. Uh, have you had any research done uh, on the percentage of candidates that were first prior to RCV, then when the RCV tabulation came in, there was a change? Yeah, we call those uh, from behind winners, and I, there have only been about 15 of those elections, and they're outlined on the Fair Vote website, actually. Um, and I can put that in my notes and written testimony and send that over. Um, it doesn't happen too often. That doesn't mean it's n not going to happen. <laughs> uh, but just like in any runoff election, someone who comes in in second place in a first round could eventually end up winning in the final round. And if you could talk about, because this came up earlier by my colleagues, out of those 15, uh, was there uh, uh, a person, of what percentage of people of color were ahead and then they end up losing the election or they were behind, they end up winning? We actually see a lot of the from behind winners actually be candidates of color. I only know of one election where we saw a candidate come in second place and end up losing in the final instant runoff. And I think that was a judge sheet, a judge election. Um, but we have generally seen actually candidates of color uh, recently win because of ranked choice voting from behind as well, just in the last uh, 2020 election that was just conducted. Uh, and that was the election of Mirna Melgar as a District 7 supervisor. Thank you so much. Let me uh, give it back to the council. Uh, Committee Council, I know there are this one question at least by one of my colleagues. Thank you, Chair. Uh, next, we'll hear questions from Council Member Miller. Council Member Miller, you be, may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Okay, I'm unmuted. So I, I have no questions for the panel. Um, I, I simply was was wondering where all our New York folks were. I, I, I know they've been on the line since about 11 o'clock here. I saw them when I came on. Uh, when we, we had enough San Francisco insight. We want to talk about the people who are really being impacted. And we want to hear their voice with all due respect, Mr. Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'm going to yield my time in hope for, hopes that we can hear from the New York panel. Thank you. Well, your wish. Uh, it's about to come true. You must be a prophet. <laughs> uh, back to the committee council, I believe uh, we have a New Yorker coming on right now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would now like to welcome Josh Pierre to testify. After Josh Pierre, I'll be calling on Joy Williams and then Rachel Bloom. Josh Pierre, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Okay, now, uh, good afternoon, Chairman Cabrera, committee members and BLA caucus members. My name is uh, Josh Josier Pierre, candidate for New York City Council in the 40th District Brooklyn and Democratic State Committee member. I'm here testifying today to ask the city council um, and the city itself to immediately fund a robust public education campaign on ranked choice voting. If our goal is to increase voter turnout and participation, then it is absolutely crucial that voters understand how to interact with ranked choice ballots, understand their electoral system, and be able to cast a meaningful vote for the candidates of their choice. We must intentionally include historically disenfranchised communities of color, like mine in Flatbush, in every part of our electoral process as we transition into ranked choice elections. Despite the pandemic and disenfranchisement efforts by the Trump administration, we had what would be considered a successful 2020 census outreach effort. The effort was funded by the city, had a dedicated team, and partnered with local organizations to ensure outreach was intentional and inclusive. 
Without these strategic investments, we would not have achieved an increase in response rates. To put it in perspective, about $40 million was invested in the 2020 census effort. And the current budget, as I heard stated earlier in this five hour long um, sitting for ranked choice voting is a million dollars. I wanna be clear as it relates to ranked choice voting, it is on all of us, the government, candidates for office and community organizations to engage all voters as a uh, part of the democratic process. But the city should be the leader in this effort. So similar to the 2020 census, an education campaign for ranked choice voting should include direct mail to voters, television, radio ads, digital advertising, and an on the ground outreach effort, especially in those communities where English is a second language. When leaders in communities of color say they don't feel that their residents are being invested in, please do not dismiss them. And please do not dismiss us, I should say. Instead, partner with us and take immediate action. Community-based nonprofits, uh, minority women business enterprises stand ready to do the necessary work needed to educate historically disenfranchised residents in, electoral in our electoral process as we transition into ranked choice elections. The implementation funding of a robust education campaign is New York City's opportunity to ensure that the success of our new voting system um, comes to fruition, but they have to take action right now or else they will in fact be excluded Time expired portion of the population. I urge you all to um, work towards a strategic plan and immediately fund that plan. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pierre, really quick here. Have you had the opportunity, have, you, have anybody reached out to you from any other good government groups uh, regarding ranked choice training, any emails or correspondence, or have you reached out to them? He's muted, can we put him? Yes, um, so I should state clearly that I did work with Common Cause last year to push for the effort. I have worked with my local Democratic Club this year to help educate some of our residents. And there have been a number of um, MWBEs that are in that space that have offered to come into the community and do that. But resources are a major impediment to that. Good point, good point. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Joy Williams to testify. After Joy Williams, I'll be calling on Rachel Bloom and then Kirsten John Foy. Joy Williams, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good late afternoon. I'm L. Joy Williams, president of Brooklyn NAACP and also the legislative coordinator for the New York State NAACP. And I should start by saying um, that the NAACP as a national organization does not have a position um, specifically on ranked choice voting, that they leave it up to the state conferences and the branches and in individual states and localities um, to decide based upon implementation and education whether or not they will support ranked choice voting. Last, um, during that uh, charter revision, we raised some of the very same concerns that we are talking about during this hearing today was the reason that we ultimately decided um, as the organization not to support the uh, ballot question. It was not as um, we have been characterized, I know as myself has personally been characterized as being rank against ranked choice voting, because I believe ranked choice voting like any other tool is a, a tool that you can use in terms of expanding democracy. Um, however, like any tool, if people do not have the proper information on how to effectively use it, um, then it can disenfranchise them. So NAACP of New York State's position um, has been to answer these questions about education and implementation. Now, setting aside, I'm going to talk about real quickly the education and implementation. I actually agree with um, a number of the folks on um, uh, today, some of whom we are often in coalition with, that if funding is given to organizations, particularly in the areas um, that this needs to be directed to, we can do an education campaign. In fact, Brooklyn NAACP began our education of our members 
who we will then be training as the trainers to go out in the community in July during a pandemic. So the issue is not whether or not community organizations will be fit to be able to educate the community, is will we be backed up? with the resources necessary to do it because Brooklyn NAACP and our other coalition members that particularly service commu uh, communities of color and particularly black folks, I'm just speak for us, right? There are no other organizations that are going to be in the in internal of a community to work on these issues. Our larger concern, which were the list of questions and that we had larger concern, including some of the questions, the direct questions I asked Sean um, about this before, and I, um, you know, he put some of this in his testimony, and I'm about to run out of time, was specifically on implementation, particularly on ballot design. Yes, there are other cities that have ranked choice voting and implement that, but New York City would be the largest and the most diverse. So if we're talking about ballot design, which people already had a problem, if you remember, of how small the text was for the ballot design in the first place when we voted on those charter, um, those charter questions. So we had questions about ballot design design. We had questions about funding necessary to properly do an education campaign. You know, in the context, you're talking about $10 million overall. $10 million, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is how much the city, the city put in just to ethnic media for the census. So when we're talking about the context of what education campaign, we're going to do what we're going to do because we know city and the federal the federal government, state government, or whoever is never going to get penetrate as deep in the community as organizations like ours were. We're going to do that, but you're asking us to put take on the full weight of education when you also you meaning the city have not also met the benchmarks in terms of actual implementation. As uh, uh, the last thing I will say, and I'm sorry for time, and I've been waiting for four and a half hours, so I, I imagine that y'all can deal. Um, is that as uh, the executive director of the uh, Board of uh, Elections is mentioned, as an adjunct, adjunct trainer for poll workers, I understand deeply the amount of education that needs to also happen for poll workers and making sure the materials are designed in a way, the training is designed in a way that actually will be effective um, to implement a complete overhaul and change of our elections process. And so if we can just think about that for a, cent, uh, a minute, that there is 197 days as of today, not to take into account the special elections, but 197 days to not only educate uh, voters about this process, but also to get the implementation and the nuts and bolts that needs to be done from Board of Education, from CFB and others to make the trains run on time so that there is not a problem where we will be suing at the end of the election process because you did not get it right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the, for the insight and we'll certainly follow through and thank you for the forecasting. Uh, some of us were saying the same thing. Uh, I stood with Council Member Miller uh, in a press conference uh, during uh, prior to the vote uh, that took place. And that was one of our, our biggest concerns. So thank you uh, for lending your voice. I do believe that we have a question by Council Member Carnegie. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I just wanted to ask um, the NAACP a question. Has, has uh, the Campaign Finance Board reached out to you for support and, and offered any resources uh, to do this work? I can say that partly because we're in coalition with groups like Common Cause and others, um, while they specifically have not reached out about the rank the uh, uh, rank the vote um, campaign, partly because again, I think we've been NAACP has been characterized as sort of being against it. Um, I, I, we are privy to more information because we are in regular coalition with uh, voting rights groups. Now, in terms of the, uh, the CFB. Um, um, you know, we received their information and let's put it, we have not been asked or invited to be part of how they are designing their education campaign. Um, if it, 
you know, if I miss an email, please let me know. But um, in terms of a, comp a, a cultural competency of what the CFB has put together in terms of their plan, we have not been invited to the table to be a part of that. And to, your, to that point, I think that it's important to note that quite often organizations like ours who actually have the you know, uh, closeness um, to the voters that people want to reach, but we're often the last um, to be invited to the table um, and to the conversation about how to execute something effectively. Um, we, uh, you know, welcome in all and, you know, we make it very plain what our position is. And even here, as I have publicly stated on behalf of not only in uh, Brooklyn NAACP, but New York State NAACP, while at the same time, you know, we were against the question, particularly because of the timing and working out the um, logistics of implementation, that does not at all mean that we will not do our job of educating our community about the best, uh, the best way that they can participate in this process. Um, and so both things can happen at the same time. As some of the council members on this uh, Zoom will know, I've been texting them and calling them about ranked choice voting for a very long time. Um, and so while at the same time to advocate that the city, um, and in this case, the city council who has oversight actually do a process that would be um, implemented fairly for people, we can educate people as well. Look, we don't believe of usurping voters um, who voted for this. That That is not our place, and I don't think that's what we believe. But this, voters also have this understanding that the city will do the best of its ability to not only educate but implement this process in a way that doesn't disenfranchise people. And I remind you that voter suppression does not require some evil racist person to be trying to pull strings or stand out in front of the door to prevent people from voting. The mismanagement of information and education is also a form of voter suppression. Thank you so much. Um, next, we will hear from Rachel Bloom, followed by Kirsten John Foy, and then Kate Doran. Rachel Bloom, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairman Cabrera and members of the New York City Council. My name is Rachel Bloom and I'm the Director of Public Policy and Programs at Citizens Union. We are an independent and nonpartisan democratic reform organization. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. So we at Citizens Union um, worked very hard to um, uh, put ranked choice voting uh, ahead in front of the Charter Revision Commission. Um, we worked hard to get it passed and we remain supportive of it as do most New Yorkers. Um, last fall, over 73% of New York City voters voted to approve ranked choice voting and uh, to suspend the implementation of a reform that was passed with such overwhelming margins only a year ago would be overturning the will of the voters. I know there's been a lot of talk today about the amount of people that voted in the November 2019 election. Um, and, um, you know, we, in fact, many advocates suggested at the beginning that it wasn't the right timing, but this was, I remind, um, a charter, this, this charter revision was actually called by the New York City Council, um, and when they called it, they knew the timing would lead to um, the questions of the charter being put forward on the 2019 ballot when they, everyone knew there wasn't going to be a lot of people out voting. Um, so, you know, um, we remain, as I said, we're supportive of ranked choice voting, and we are incredibly supportive of intro 1994. I think what was part of the charger, what was part of the charter, um, and a million dollars as everyone's been talking, not quite enough for education. When you look at what the census got, and when you look at the outreach to other things have had, um, that's a floor, not a ceiling. Um, I think everyone probably at this hearing would be supportive of well, of more money and more resources being put towards this. Um, and I think that, you know, there are, as, as a lot of people have spoken before this, there's, you know, the, what's happening from the city, there's what's happening through the campaigns, and then there's what's happening through community organizations and good government reform organizations. Um, we at Citizens Union are planning a giant project for the 2021 election called Elect NYC to serve as a one-stop shop for people looking for information about the hundreds of candidates who will be running, as well as how ranked choice voting will be working. And we are just one of many organizations who are looking to fill that role um, across the city. 
we believe that there is enough time, that there's more than enough time for the BOE and the CFB to conduct a public, a robust public education campaign. Um, you know, realistically, people, first of all, aren't paying that much attention to an election, you know, a year out, um, the average person who we're talking about educating about how to cast their ballot. Um, but they couldn't have started sooner with a presidential election to do this admit, admit amid um, a presidential election would have been a waste of time and money. Um, so in close, we support it. We support more education, more funding for education. Time expired. And as many resources as can be put forward to making sure all New Yorkers understand how to cast their ballot. Thank you. Next, we will hear questions from Council Member Miller, followed by Council Member Yeager, and then Council Member Cornegie. Council Member Miller, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. You mentioned that you will, and, and your organization, as well as other advocates, was well aware of the potential uh, that this was an off election year, that despite the narrative of overwhelming that less than 10% of all New Yorkers uh, had, 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 had voted for this referendum, um, understanding this premise, um, was it a matter of strategy to move forward? With this, to uh, obviously you were in favor of it, and and other you and others that may be on the Zoom, um, this current Zoom, when you were in the room, was this considered as a matter of strategy as to uh, how do you best move this forward? Um, I'm going to answer for myself, although I know there are other people, um, but absolutely not. In fact, we worked extraordinarily hard in 2018 to have that Charter Revision Commission take up ranked choice voting. I would have to check my uh, files, but I testified, and I know other people that are here at this hearing, testified multiple times in front of the 2018 Charter Revision Commission, um, urging them to put ranked choice voting. People were extremely disappointed that they did not put it on the ballot for 2018. Um, and you know, when I think no one even expected there to be a Charter Revision Commission in 2019. So the idea that we had the foresight um, to think ahead like that is just, um, you know, especially this was the first charter revision commission uh, that was at the behest of the city council and actually had a voice of, you know, not just the city council, but the mayor and the controller and the public advocate. So um, we were we we were hoping to see it on the ballot in 2018, to be quite honest, and pushed extremely hard for it then. Okay, and 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 um, those members who supported it, I, I don't see them here on this this uh, Zoom this afternoon at all, uh, leadership, uh, colleagues or otherwise. So uh, thank you, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I know we need to move on. So I'm, I'm going to uh, end my question in there, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Miller. We'll now hear questions from Council Member Yeager followed by Council Member Cornegie and then Majority Leader Cumbo. Council Member Yeager, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Bloom, it's good to see you again. Uh, I feel uh, unencumbered by the notion that the City Council passed this because I was the one no vote. And um, I was the one no vote at the committee. I was the one no vote uh, in the council on the floor uh, in, in my first month here in this body. And one of the things I said uh, at the hearing on this was I specifically recall asking this question to a panel that consisted of uh, uh, then public advocate James and uh, my hero, Borough President Gail Brewer, who I think is a giant in government, even though she supported this, I still think she's a giant in government. Um, uh, my question was specifically what you indicated that uh, it was going to happen. It was likely going to happen in an off-year election because even if we enacted in 18, uh, the mayor had his own business going on with charter revision. So this was likely to happen in 19. And sure enough, it happened in 19 in an off-year election. And as you indicated, uh, and as we've talked earlier today in this hearing, uh, the turnout um, was abysmal. Um, the, the number of yes votes were about a half a million. And in fact, 100,000 people who came out to vote didn't even bother opining on this question. They just ignored the question. Maybe they didn't flip over the ballot. Maybe they skipped the question. I don't know. But 100,000 people came out to vote and didn't answer the question. And so here I'm going to ask the same questions that I asked Ms. Lerner, which were a repeat of the questions that I asked uh, uh, Director Lopress. Even assuming the Campaign Finance Board does everything that it can, and it works as hard as possible, 
given the circumstances that we see today, uh, the fact that we've changed the way we vote in many respects, the, way, the fact that we are now facing, uh, or in the midst, not facing, in the midst of a pandemic, second wave, who knows, God, you know, help us all. And I hope that there isn't a third, but who knows what happens until there's a vaccine and, and things go back to the relative normal that we once had. We know what February and March elections are going to look like. We don't know yet what June is going to look like, but we have to assume uh, that it'll look more like the present than it does the very past. So given all that, isn't it just a good idea to put a pause on this and say, let's do this the rightest way possible. Let's pass on doing it this year in 20, this coming year in 21, and let's get it right so that we can do it in the next election cycle. Is there no validity whatsoever to having that as a conversation? I mean, look, I'm going to say the people voted, they had a deadline. Uh, the people, did the people, vote the people didn't know about the pandemic. Of course not. But, you know, just the same way that we figured out how to get people, we had to totally, you know, if you look at what happened in the primary and the general election in 2020, um, we had to respond, we had to adapt, and we did. Um, and I Time think expired. we'll be done for ranked choice voting. You know, Ms. Chair, just one, one more quick. You know, Ms. Bloom, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, I apologize, but did, did the people really vote? Uh, you know, and I, we keep saying the people voted, the people made a choice. The people, the people of New York, we're talking about a half a million out of close to 9 million people. 100,000 people who voted didn't even bother checking the question. Did the people really speak? Have we heard from the, I mean, I know I'm defending the people in my district who voted against this. Um, so I feel very comfortable doing that. But, but did the people really make that choice in the city of New York? Are we comfortable? saying that we're going to throw out the way we vote because a half a million out of nine million, eight and change million people, nine million people have made this decision in an off-year election where even then 100,000 people didn't even bother answering the question. And therefore, in, given everything, I'm just asking for your opinion, I'm not asking for you to change the law, but given everything that's going on, is there no validity to saying, pause, we'll take a break, let's get this done right, and let's put it, let's put it off until the next cycle. The next cycle being only two years later, where we don't have a mayor race at stake, where we don't have controller and, and the borough presidents at stake, where we can do the test drive that, um, that Ms. Lerner talked about, you know, testing it on a small council race here and then another one there. We could test it on just the council races in 23, but getting it right, putting the time and effort and the money necessary to educate the people of New York and getting it done right, if this is what the people really chose. Is there no validity to that? I mean, the, my response to that question, um, I think there's, my response to that question is how many people are going to vote in a runoff if there's a runoff? Um, you know, we have runoffs that are decided by, I think, potentially even less people than voted for this ballot referendum for citywide elected officials. Um, so if we look at the election of Tish James back in 2013, was her runoff? Um, you know, I, I don't know the specific number. I'm sure someone in this Zoom does, but it was quite likely less than 500,000 voters. Um, for And she represented the city of New York and she was elected as a citywide elected. And we might have those runoffs um, this 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 coming spring without this. Your, your point is very valid. Your point is well taken. I will say that... Uh, uh, with respect to Tish, who's a good friend, I think the, the, the public record is clear about what I think about the public advocate's job. I'm more concerned with the mayor, with the controller, with the city council. And yes, the, you're right. Uh, a runoff is concerning, but a runoff requires 40% not having chosen a candidate and that, ha that is in the state election law and that has worked to give us mayors in the past and it hasn't completely failed, although I, in some of those runoffs, I would have chosen otherwise, I hope. Um, but yes, even with the runoff being a possibility, here we're taking an absolute certainty over the possibility maybe there's a runoff and saying, let's choose the absolute certainty of what I anticipate to be chaotic and disenfranchisement of, of, of voters who I don't like to call minority because they're actually the majority in New York. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a funny term, but they're the majority. They're not the minority. But the way it's cut up in this city, 
they will, there are districts in the city that are currently represented and you can come back to me in a year if, if, if this happens the way it's set up right now and we do this system and tell me that I'm wrong and I think I'll be right. There are districts in the city that are currently represented by black and Latino council members, which will not be if this election is held this way. They will be, those districts will change and they will be represented by white members in majority, majority districts where the majority of the residents are black and Latino. That's not, I believe, and I think that the members of the Black and Latino and Asian Caucus believe is a good thing for this city. So I'll leave it at that. I don't think that was really a question. That was just my chance at the mic, but it's really good to see you, Ms. Bloom. Thank you. Oh, it's Thank you so much, council member. I believe we have two other council members uh, for me to council. Yes, uh, next we'll hear from Council Member Cornegie, followed by Majority Leader Kamba. Council Member Cornegie, please begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. So, okay. Uh, hey, Ms. Boom, how are you? I'm good, how are you? <clears throat> good, thank you. So, um, in my committee, the Housing and Buildings Committee, we had uh, a site safety training for the safety of uh, individuals working on sites. And because of the inability to get the proper education, we had to push that out to 2021 and not impose the, the, the required fines and fees on people who couldn't do the site safety training because there was just no ability to do it based on the closing of sites, based on the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so what, we what, 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 was, what was not a factor in any of this in 2019 was the pandemic, which had the city frozen for between six to eight months to date. And, and you know, it's not, it hasn't thought out quite yet. So with that as a backdrop, the ability to disenfranchise is so large. It seems to me that uh, like, 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 like Council Member Yeager said, that there should be a conversation around a pause and getting it right. I would think that the greater concern would be to get it right than it would be just to stay with the prescription that's in front of us because we heard from uh, CFB uh, who said, listen, this was the referendum and we're gonna stick to the referendum. And I get that and appreciate and respect when there's a referendum, but sometimes there are mitigating factors that make you go back to the table or go back to the drawing board so that you don't inadvertently disenfranchise people. Or as the NAACP chair said, we're not now in a lawsuit because it wasn't implemented correctly. So I, I'm just confused as to, as, a, as, a, as somebody who deems themselves to be on a progressive side, why aren't more progressives up in arms about the possibility of disenfranchising voters? The, the, the slight possibility, the slight possibility of implementing a program of site safety training was too large for us to even do. And that, that law, wasn't even under my chairmanship. That was under the Germani chairmanship. So several years prior to that, but we we went back to the drawing board because of COVID to make sure no one was unnecessarily hurt on uh, on construction sites, uh, and we had to revamp that. Uh, so I don't know why with something as large as voting, right? And we talked about the, we talked about the Voter Rights Act. We talked about all of the things that were put in place in place to protect Black people in a climate that this is, I'm not making this up, that we okay. were disenfranchised in, right? So this is not a, I'm not making it up. We were, we've had, we've had, the federal government had to literally step in to ensure that our vote was, 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 was pressure, was precious enough to be covered. And, and I'm not here to argue the merits of ranked choice voting. You've never heard me say that. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not even saying that. I'm saying that the education Time expired. robust enough for us to move forward. I just wanted that on the record. I am not saying, I am not arguing the merits. I don't want to be confused with arguing the merits of ranked choice voting. That's, that's a conversation for another time. I'm here saying that the, I'm scared that my seniors uh, will be disenfranchised, disenfranchised with a system that is not conducive for them on top of everything else that's happened and all the other changes that have happened to them through, through, through the pandemic. So that was, again, Ms. Bloom, it wasn't a question, but it was like, I, I don't know what the, the, the conventional wisdom is on um, making sure that people are taken care of. And I haven't heard any real robust education system that would, de that would debunk what I'm saying. And I've been on this call for four, four hours and I haven't heard a real robust pathway 
to people being educated and a satisfaction for the education that's necessary. You've been in this call for five and a half hours. Yeah, I was hoping that wasn't the case. Started at 1130. <laughs> I'm, I'm lost. At this point, I'm lost, but I, it's like a train wreck. I can't turn away. Yes. And, and we appreciate your input in the, uh, to my colleague. I believe we have a couple of more questions. That's right. Next, we'll hear from Majority Leader Cumbo, followed by Council Member Miller. Majority Leader Cumbo, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Um, I, I will defer my questions. I'd like to be the first on the list uh, following um, uh, Reverend Kirsten Foy's testimony. So I'll go right after that because I know he's been also on the call for five and a half hours. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Miller. You may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Councilman Miller, you're not mute. You're you're muted. I'll 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 also defer. I simply wanted to quantify what my colleague Councilmember Cornegy said about the Construction Safety Act. The fact that more than 60, 60 construction workers over the last three years, when that before that bill that legislation was passed and enacted, uh, had lost their life on construction work sites. That legislation was predicated on training. Uh, additional training, outreach, and education, which could not and did not happen because of COVID. Certainly, um, we cannot diminish uh, uh, the voices of those who lost their lives, but we use that um, as a parallel to talk about, to, to highlight the impact on communities that can be di potentially disenfranchised because of their vote. And if it was good enough for the Construction Safety Act, it's certainly good enough for us to do the same here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would now like to welcome yeah. Kirsten John Foy to testify. After that, I'll be calling on Kate Doran, followed by Rob Ritchie. Kirsten John Foy, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Uh, good day to all, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Majority Leader Cumbo and uh, uh, Council Member Cornegy and Miller and everyone here, I feel like this is one big family. So I'm going to just speak as I would from the heart, from the pulpit. First and foremost, I want to thank Council Member Yeager for his very heartfelt, impassioned, authentic, and courageous statement on behalf of Black and Brown voters and the people of the city of New York. Um, I am quite disappointed at what I heard, and I'm sorry that they're not here to receive my disappointment. The grotesque ineptitude and incompetence that was articulated or inarticulated by the CFB and the Board of Elections with respect to the implementation of ranked choice voting is not only disheartening, it is at the core of why many Black and Brown uh, voters and communities feel disenfranchised and disenchanted with government. They are tone deaf and totally unresponsive to the realities that are bearing down on the majority of the city of New York. Let me just give you some of my own facts. The last 12 years, we've had three governors, one of whom was Black, two, UN, two U.S. senators, one of whom is a woman, three attorney generals, one of whom is a black woman. In New York City, we've had two controllers of color, a Latina speaker, two black public advocates, several borough presidents who are black or and or Latino, several district attorneys who are black and or Latino, four out of the five county leaders are black. We elect black and brown men and women to all levels of government in very high numbers. Our congressional delegation is one of the most diverse in the nation. We elect state representatives, women, people of color, women of color at a higher rates than anywhere else in the nation. And so is reflected in our city council. Can we do better? Yes. But to throw the baby out with the bathwater is simply 
folly. It seems to me that ranked choice voting is a solution in search of a problem. What we are doing now is as a black and brown community and a collection of leadership is imploring those of us, those of our friends and allies who we stand shoulder to shoulder with on reinforcing and strengthening our democracy, like Susan, who is a friend, like, uh, like Citizen Union and others, to hear the voices of those who are on the margins right now. COVID changed everything. It is folly to ignore the impact that a global pandemic, which by the way, has caused our governor to in, enact one executive order after another, suspending privileges and rights, empowered our mayor to enact one executive order after another, to suspend privileges and rights, that we would not find it incumbent upon ourselves to protect the sanctity of the vote in the midst of a pandemic, whereby you have 40% of New Yorkers who are going to bed every night food insecure, where you have food lines wrapped around the block. You can huff and puff, but those who are huffing and puffing at that reality, I guarantee you are not out there serving the people the food, are not out there trying to meet that need. This is a very elitist conversation and debate that we're having. But what I'm imploring our allies to do is consider the cries of your friends. What we are saying now, and I'm not here to debate the efficacy of ranked choice voting, although I do believe it may be a duplicitous subversion of the voters will to replace a direct system with an algorithm that by our, our, uh, Brad Lander's very own words, round by round tabulation will choose the winner. Not the vote of the will, not the, the will of the people, not the will of the voters, round by round tabulation. So that means that the will of the voter, the direct will of the voter is being replaced by an algorithm. And we're supposed to just be quiet about that. So what's the next step? Let's just not have an election at all. Let's just plug in Watson and have artificial intelligence choose our choose our leadership. Or let's what is this? The 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 uh the the foray the 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 prologue to uh to nonpartisan elections i mean we're not stupid about what's going on here so what we need to do is if you are truly uh, uh authentically sincerely uh committed to protecting voting rights is to hear the cries of those who will be most impacted you can point to individuals who may have benefited from low turnout elections. We're not talking about an individual here or there. We're talking about upending a system. We're talking about replacement of an entire system, which by the way, proved in the last election to be good for voters of color. We had one of the highest voting turnouts in modern history under this last, under the old system. So all of the all of the fluff around why it's important to have ranked choice voting does not bear fruit in New York City. New York City does not have a problem electing black and brown people to office. We do not have a problem electing women to office. What we do have a problem with is grappling with a pandemic which has disproportionately impacted black and brown people. Put us in the graves more put us on food lines more, took more of our children from, ed, from a, a place of schooling and education and put them on the streets or put them on uh, behind some inactive or ineffective device. So instead of having a conversation that lasts almost six hours about upending an election system that most black and brown people will not pay attention to, why don't we spend five or six hours talking about how to strengthen their hand as voters today. Spend the last six hours talking about how to educate people. If you take a thousand people a day from now until the election, you will not reach a critical mass. If you take 10,000 a day and educate them, you will not reach a critical mass of the electorate that is competent enough 
to uh, to to uh, uh, benefit off of ranked choice voting. Not to mention, you're not eliminating the old system. You're bifurcating it. To borrow a word from my majority leader, you're not saying we're going to do away completely with the old system. You're saying we're going to apply the old system to the council and leave all the district attorneys. Uh, we're going to apply ranked choice voting to the council and to the executives and leave the district attorneys and others under the old system. So now we're saying to, to voters, well, no, 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 you got to get this right. It's ranked choice for this election, but it's the old way for that election. We're imposing too much of a burden on an overburdened electorate without meeting their most basic needs. The most basic need of the electorate today is food, education, and not being evicted from their housing, not trying to retrain them about how to exercise a vote that they are already competent in exercising. So until you can justify to us the potential injury that's going to be caused to black and brown communities, then you need to be prepared for a lawsuit on the federal level for intervention. You need to be prepared for executive, a uh, push for an executive order. If we can have children ripped out of schools, 70% of whom are now remotely learning. If we can have uh, bars and restaurants and our entire lifestyle upended and chained by the stroke of a pen, then we can certainly, we can certainly take a breath, pause and say, this is not the right time to implement an entirely new system of voting on people that are trying to figure out how to feed themselves and educate their children. This is a very elite debate we're having here. And I guarantee you, none of us are going to bed hungry tonight. I guarantee you, none of, that, none of us are going to bed, or well, maybe some of us are going to bed trying to figure out whether or not we're gonna be evicted, but I doubt it. None of us are figuring out, oh my God, are my kids gonna, are my kids gonna get an education? We're figuring that out but that is not the reality for the majority of New Yorkers. So we need to get off the pedestal, come down into the real world where people are living and realize now is not the time to upend the election system. We can have a debate as council member Carnegie says about the efficacy of ranked choice voting. We could talk about that at a different time, but right now for people to say, man, you know what? Uh, no, we're not pausing is not only tone deaf, it's injurious. And it shows a lack of respect and regard for the pain that your neighbors and your allies are feeling right now. I would implore those who I fight alongside to strengthen our democracy, to hear the cries of your allies. Every single person who's gotten up today to speak against, with the exception of Council Member Yeager, to speak against ranked choice voting right now has been a person of color. Yet and still there's been no response. Yet and still there's been, and I'm sure there's somebody out there from New York that believes in this, but I guarantee you ain't going to bed hungry tonight. And I guarantee you ain't been on the food line serving nobody either. So why don't we take a breath, take a step back and say, now is not the time for this. What is the rush? And I'll close with this. I'm a Pentecostal preacher. You shouldn't have gave me the mic and you shouldn't have made me wait for five hours, but I'm gonna close with this. If we do not recognize the potential injury that is caused to voters of color, communities of color, then we ought to not be out here pretending to be good government. We ought to not be out here pretending to be civil rights advocates. Good government people would be up in arms against a incompetent board of election, against an incompetent campaign finance board that is ill-prepared to execute this election, that is ill-prepared to answer a direct question of any of the questioners. Not one question was answered directly about the educational uh, campaign. Not one question was answered directly about how much money is going to be spent or how it's going to happen, not one. So where's the good government outrage against the failures of the campaign finance board and 
in the Board of Elections to be properly prepared for this moment. So now we have to take it upon ourselves. It's incumbent upon us to educate ourselves about a system that we didn't implement, that we didn't execute. 90% of New York did not vote on this question. 90%. There is no mandate. There is zero mandate to implement this. And there's certainly no mandate to implement it in the midst of a global pandemic, which, by the way, struck New York harder than anywhere else in the country and could do so again. I'm done. Thank you. Majority Leader Cumbo, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you, Reverend Foy. And that is certainly why I wanted to wait. Um, you've summed it up completely in terms of everything. And I, I just wanna say um, in the first election cycle, the voters that voted for ranked choice voting were neither educated about the dynamics and the, and the intricacies of the program when it appeared on the ballot in the first place. There was no education, there was no pro or con, people that were going voted for it the same way they may vote for the four out of six judges that they don't know who they are either and choose a name that most identifies with one that they are familiar with from their ethnic perspective. So I wanna be clear about that. I think what uh, Reverend Foy also has brought forward is the need for us to have some black and Latino good government groups. Because what we're seeing on this call is that you're seeing black and Latino leadership speaking truth to power about the realities of our community and good government groups that are represented by white individuals speaking about protecting this particular uh, uh, referendum that was placed on the ballot without any kind of consideration about the fact that it's underfunded. As you can see with the San Francisco model, per person, San Francisco got far more money than New York City than we had. So that's a reality there. And everybody that I wanna say when we talk about we're electing black and brown and women in that, everybody that's black and brown is not representing black and brown interests. So we need to be clear about that. I've seen that particular instance in my own district. Not everybody that's black and brown is representing black and brown interests. And was stated as well, we have closed our educational system. We have closed local businesses. We have closed houses of worship. We have changed the way we are doing business in order to accommodate the fact that we have a pandemic. And I just wanna say, you know, in, in the long run, what I believe that this is going to do, ranked choice voting, is that sure, we'll be able to educate people to pick their preference, but those that are more in tune with internet, broadband, social media, those individuals will be able to, on the drop of a dime, change up the dynamic and say, I'm, I need my people to vote for me in this way. Pick me one, pick this one two, pick me this person number three. And if they decide to change it at the drop of a dime at night, they can put it out on Twitter or Instagram or whatever services that they're utilizing to get the word out to change the whole course of an election. While our seniors and many other disenfranchised groups will not be able to move as quickly. And you're gonna see through a process over the course of the next couple of years, you're gonna see this process further disenfranchise and eliminate uh, many good and positive and powerful candidates um, right from our community. So I just wanted to just, you know, close with that. And, and again, it's like Council Member Carnegie. I've been on this uh, Zoom call for five and a half going on six hours. My son's been watching Paw Patrol for most of it. I just cannot stop watching this because of how critically important this is to our future. And if we don't get this right, we can't just say we're gonna experiment on one election in February and whatever comes of it comes of that. Every single election and every single seat is critical. We can't just let one go. And this election cycle coming up, this is gonna be the largest transfer of power ever in our history. And if we don't get this right, if our communities are disenfranchised, we will never get that back. Once a new paradigm shift has come into place, we will never get our footing back to be able to bring it back to the level of success of black and brown and women and LGBTQ candidates that were elected as Reverend Foy pointed out. We will never get that momentum back. And to just say that we're electing black and brown faces has nothing to do with where those black and brown faces come from, who's backing them, 
who's supporting them and how they represent our communities and our people. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Councilmember Yeager, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, Reverend Foy, good to see you. Uh, first of all, thank you for, you know, if I would have known that you were going to do that, I guess none of us needed to come. We could have just let you do it. Um, you all. carried it. Uh, you know, I, I first, first of all, before I even get into that, I do want to say, I, you know, my first hearing today was 10 o'clock and I came straight into this one at 1130. So uh, I'm, this is not a, this is not a winner takes all system, but uh, I appreciate very much my colleagues who who really, you know, I'm, I'm riding on the shoulders of, of the BLAC who have been leading this battle. When we stood together outside City Hall uh, a year ago in advance of the election, and, and we talked about it, and, and my words then were, you know, uh, it, it's wrong to call a particular community in New York City that is the majority of New York minority. Um, but if we're gonna call anybody minority, we're all minorities. Um, there are, you know, as much as Council Member Combo looks as she does, and I look as I do, uh, if you look at how we're represented in this city, uh, in government, we have always been a minority, and it's hard for folks who uh, to get elected, except in these drawn districts, and then it relies on the system that there aren't going to be four or five or six or eight or 12 of a Robert Carnegie running in his neighborhood, and then somebody who just moved in from as my borough president, I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this, but as my borough president referred to, somebody just moving in and running and then being the one who wins. And that's why we have the system we have because it's worked. That's why the council was expanded from 35 to 51 seats because it works. That's why the board of estimate was disbanded in 1989 to give council uh, representation to communities that hadn't been getting it, but for the board of estimate and rolling the dice and hoping for the best. So. With that, I, I want to ask uh, Reverend Foy if, you know, I've said before, and I recognize um, uh, the hindrances that come with this, I maybe don't have the best credentials uh, to talk about um, the challenges of, of fair representation for Black and Latino communities. Spent my life, my entire life since I was a teenager, um, uh, my entire professional life trying to elect Black and Latinos to office. And I've worked on historic races and I talked about it earlier today, but I don't have those credentials and I know that. So what I'm gonna ask you, and I only have 30 seconds, but you can keep on going after the sergeant calls you out. Um, don't tell me that. Suppose, why do you suppose this is so important to a certain segment of New York City that they are, you should see the things that are being said on Twitter right now about me because of the things I said today about this being a system that I, as I described it. Why do you suppose it's so important to those folks in New York City who are pushing this so hard? And I'll leave it to you. I, I, I think um, time expired. Majority Leader uh, Combo um, said it, Beth, this is probably the most critical local election in modern New York City history. I think every time Black people, brown people, people of color have ascended in this city, they changed the rules. We saw Mayor Dinkins get elected and all of a sudden we had to have term limits. Now we see that the majority of political power in this city is held by people of color. And so now we've got to do something about that. I think there is a great deal of fear and consternation by the, the um, upper elites of this city, the 1% of this city who are afraid of what they see, who are afraid that the city is, is moving beyond their direct control. Uh, powerful interests are becoming less powerful. And so this is a response and a reaction to, I believe, the diminishing political power of New York's political and financial establishment. I also think that we have been gentrified out of our communities, geographically, demographically, and this is a natural extension of that. This is a function of political gentrification, which seeks to do to us politically what was done to us uh, financially and geographically. We've been moved out of our homes. We've been moved out of our communities. What makes us think that we won't be moved out of our political power? And so it's really an affront to, I believe, 
all things democratic, big D and small D democratic, to embrace a system where you cannot have a clear determination by the will of the voter who the winner of an election is. That's like saying to me, and I heard this announced earlier by, again, Council Member Cumbo, is this is akin to the Electoral College for the city of New York. It is replacing the direct will of the voter with a process. The process isn't exactly the same as the Electoral College, but it is a process that now adjudicates the winner of the election, not the counting of votes, not the expressed will of the voter, the majority of voters who are forced to make a decision. And then if there's a runoff, forced to make another decision. This is an algorithm which will, which will interpret for us what our will is and then make a decision on our behalf that we must now learn to accept. What they're saying to us is we need an education process that will, that will ameliorate your indignation just in case you don't understand the outcome of an election. Well, why wouldn't we understand an outcome of an election? An election is you have a bunch of people running. The, the one that gets the most votes wins. That's an election. So if we are complicating that process, we are doing so at the expense of the integrity of the vote and at the expense of the confidence of the electorate. I hope that answered your question. Reverend, uh, thank you so much. So good to see you. Thank you for your voice. Uh, consider you not just a friend, but a close friend. Yes, sir. And uh, thank you uh, for pointing out the ills. And so I'm going to have to move on. Uh, as you say, if you give a pulpit to a preacher, uh, we could go on forever. And uh, we have much to say. Uh, we have eight people left, eight panelists. I'm gonna ask my colleagues to please to hear. Uh, I believe I've been beyond gracious today with the time. Uh, we did have a clock, but largely ignore uh, because uh, for the sake of those eight people, they have been waiting uh, in fairness to them. Please adhere uh, to the three minutes. And so with that, I give it back to uh, committee council. Thank you, Chair. I would now like to welcome Kate Doran to testify. After Kate Doran, I will be calling on Rob Ritchie and then Laurie Daniel Favors. Kate Doran, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Hello, I am Kate Doran. I serve on the board of the League of Women Voters of the state of New York. And in New York City for the City League, I am the election specialist. We have several recommendations for the New York City Board of Elections that we believe will serve voters and make for effective implementation of ranked choice voting. And I'm speaking principally here because I've been a poll worker since 2004 and I worked uh, at the recent election early voting and on election day. So number one, create a new ranked choice voting specific privacy sleeve. This sleeve should feature simple graphic instructions prominently on the front cover. Poll workers should be introduced to this new privacy sleeve in training classes, but should not be expected on election day to explain RCV to voters. Number two, set up a tablet or a laptop in each poll site with a video illustrating how to fill out a ballot using RCV. Information clerks can advise voters that this is available. Ballot station and election district poll workers can direct voters to this video and let them know that clear instructions are on that privacy sleeve. Number three, reach out to the vendor knowing who um, manufactures the electronic po uh, poll um, sign-in books to fix the screens that vote for voters who wish to void ballots. On election day, I learned that the electronic poll book has no clear way to indicate that the voter has give, been given more than one ballot. As you know, voters are entitled to a maximum of three ballots, and we expect a higher than usual number of void ballots until the RCV process becomes familiar to voters. 
Number four, transparency is critical. We have an open meetings law in New York State. The New York City Board of Elections is to be commended for live streaming their commissioners meetings. And they have even introduced sign language interpreters for hearing disabled voters. What the BOE must do is to make public their committee meetings, in particular, the ballot design committee and the voter outreach and education committee. Announcements of these meetings should be on the board's website and the committee meetings should be live streamed. Voters have a right to have a transparent view of how the Board of Elections is designing the ranked choice voting ballot. Number five, we understand the need to drive voters to all the electronic media, specifically the Board of Elections websites and the Campaign Finance Board's websites, but there are regular active voters. We have heard about- I'm expired. Who do not own smartphones or computers. These folks made phone calls. What is the Board of Elections planning to do to train these employees about ranked choice voting? Will they take the names and addresses, for example, and mail the information to the voters? So uh, we thank you very much at the League for inviting us to comment today and uh, good luck to all of us. Thank you. I would now like to welcome Rob Ritchie to testify. After that, I will be calling on Larry Daniel Favors and then Benny Poy. Rob Ritchie, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Hey, uh, <clears throat> thanks so much. Uh, thanks for your stamina. Um, my name is Rob Ritchie, I'm president and CEO of Fair Vote. Um, we're a nonpartisan electoral reform think tank um, that since 92 has been the uh, nation's leading resource on ranked choice voting. We've also uh, played a leading role on a number of other electoral reforms like voter pre-registration for 16 year olds and automatic voter registration. In New York City, um, we worked uh, back in the 90s with a range of civic groups on, on voter education about the proportional form of ranked choice voting for the local school board elections that included providing information to the voting section of the Department of Justice about the use of RCV when in 1998, the DOJ reviewed a state law that would have replaced that form of RCV in order for the city uh, school board elections to be held on the, the old lever voting machines. The DOJ voting section denied preclearance to this change, meaning that they kept ranked choice voting. Um, and that was really based on how effectively voters from BIPOC communities were using uh, RCV and how often uh, they were electing candidates of choice with it. That was the last time the DOJ blocked such a change uh, of a law or procedure in a New York City, which just uh, shows kind of uh, what the data uh, uh, was indicating to them. Uh, last year, ranked choice voting won support from 74% of New York City voters. You've been hearing that. It did also earn a, a higher share of support from uh, uh, people of color voters than white voters. Um, as a broad point, um, all evidence from a growing number of implementations of RCV suggests that New York City does still have sufficient time and know-how to implement RCV. It's been introduced in major cities with a BIPOC uh, majority like Oakland, San Francisco, and uh, New Mexico's second largest city of Las Cruces, and in significant statewide uses in, 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 in multiple places. Um, this year, it was used in five presidential primaries um, that we had a, a big role in the voter education in. These were, these were Democratic primaries. Um, four of them were held during the pandemic, had to be all vote by mail. About 99.8% of voters cast valid ballots. In Nevada, which is, uh, you know, ha ha has a, a heavy uh, uh, number of voters who, who are non-white, um, they had to rank three people, three candidates to have their, their ballot be valid, and 99.7% of people did that the first time out with um, ranked choice voting. The principle of RCV is, is a simple one, really. Um, we've been hearing some suggestion that, you know, voters may be told to vote in certain ways. It really is is any other way of voting than just saying who your first choice is and who your second choice is and who your third choice is really isn't a smart way to vote. And, 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 and so getting that information out is key um, and having a ballot design that's, that's, that's good for that. The, the ballot design that's, that's being planned for New York City is based on a precedent used on that machines that, that is good and is tested. Um, and it really does solve a uh, problems that we're seeing with, with crowded fields like you're gonna have in a New York City next year I'll say that was common in the Bay Area cities uh, that my colleague Pedro Hernandez- Time expired. And I'll just sort of finish that thought, which is that um, there were uh, 53 seats in, in the Bay Area that were elected um, with ranked choice voting. And um, during the time after its adoption, 
the number of people of color in those seats went from 40% to 60% within a decade. And, part, and the greatest growth was in the white plurality, non-white majority districts, where essentially it was uh, allowing the majority preference to express itself and voters to have the freedom to do so. So thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Larry Daniel Favors to testify. After that, I will be calling Lynn Benny Poy and then Mona Davids. Larry Daniel Favors, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Greetings and good evening. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present for you today. My name is Larry Daniel Favors and I am the interim executive director at the Center for Law and Social Justice at Medgarver's College, also known as CLSJ. Uh, CLSJ is a racial justice law center explicitly focused on advancing the needs of black New Yorkers. And because of our unique combination of research, public policy advocacy and litigation from a community-based perspective, we are a focal point for progressive activity. In fact, one might call us a racially justice motivated good government group that centers the needs of black New Yorkers. We have consistently worked to defend the voting rights of New Yorkers of African descent and other racial minorities um, uh, in our city and state. And our support for ranked choice voting is one that has been a matter of principle and consistency. And while uh, ranked choice voting certainly may be less advantageous for incumbents and candidates, the history and the data suggest that systems like RCV are simply more benef beneficial to the voters, particularly black and brown voters um, than our other systems. It is a voting system that better centers the, the needs of groups and communities that um, traditionally see their electoral issues frequently discounted or paid only lip service. And during the early years of the Bloomberg administration, CLSJ both testified and sent a letter to the Department of Justice in an effort to preserve a voting, this, uh, a voting system that was very similar, as was just mentioned by a uh, fellow, fellow panelist, that was very similar uh, to the ranked choice style of voting elections uh, that was then used during community school boards. And we did so, and we uh, indicated our support because of the phenomenal ways uh, that that type of voting uh, tended to impact voters from these communities. More parents participated in those school board elections than they did in their local PTA associations because there were vigorous campaigns that were run that were specifically designed to speak to their needs and had the candidates had to clear articulate what it was that they were going to do to meet the vast uh, electoral issues that the parents presented. It was highly effective. And in fact, several of the first New Yorkers of Black and Asian descent to be elected into public office actually came from that ranked choice voting style of uh, school board election, including notable giants like Bed Stuy's own uh, beloved assembly member, Annette Robinson. And these are the same types of elections that were championed by none other than the great Shirley Chisholm herself. Um, CLSJ's continued support for ranked choice voting today is consistent uh, with our historical support support for expanding the franchise for Black voters. Uh, and for more than 30 years, we've been a part of a national push um, to advocate for alternative election means, including ranked choice voting for the benefits that I just mentioned. Now, while today's conversation has seemed to center more on the merits of RCV, um, the time for that conversation has passed. This conversation would have been perfect in the lead up to the 2019 referendum. Uh, many of those in opposition today did not necessarily make their same concerns known at that time um, and, and or, or with enough time to impact the referendum outcome. And the voters have spoken and history tells us that in choosing RCV, New York City voters selected a system that is more likely to produce better results for traditionally marginalized voters. Again, even if it is not ideal for candidates. And frankly, if only 500,000 people participated in that referendum, that's certainly a reminder that the current voter system doesn't work as well as it needs time to expired our question today is about how to properly prepare voters to engage in an electoral system that they chose over a year ago. Yes, COVID is a factor. We thought we had planned for everything in our census campaign, and we did. We planned for everything except a global pandemic. And so we had to adjust our education campaign. That's why as leaders, the demand is properly placed upon you, our elected officials, to work in partnership with city agencies, community and faith-based organizations to actually lead and create solutions uh, to the challenges that we are facing. And if whether it's uh, having to go from a full in-person census campaign to doing census outreach um, at food distribution centers while we're passing out food and passing out census information, we are able to do this if we have the partnership that we need. And in fact, the Center for Law and Social Justice actually began in spring of 2020, earlier this year, to prepare an education campaign that was designed to do exactly that. However, we are small and we need the might and the power and the partnership of our elected officials and uh, those who are in positions of power to be able to partner with us to ensure that 
there is a full and robust infusion of dollars that seeks to ensure the electorate is pop properly educated about the nature of ranked choice voting, what it is, how it works, how winners are determined, and most importantly, how they, the voters, can best engage. And as I have frequently said to many constituents uh, within my own community, if you can play spades or bid whiz, you can certainly learn how to do ranked choice voting. It's not that Black voters don't uh, have the capacity to understand this system, it's that we need to ensure that there's going to be an investment in research, uh, excuse me, an investment in education uh, so that our voters are best prepared uh, to engage and embrace a system that is shown in the past to be far more beneficial to centering Black needs um, than have systems that we are currently in place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cornegy, you may begin upon this urgent announcement. Time starts now. Hey, Lori. So everything Lori said, plus time. <laughs> That's it. They don't want to say about that. Everything, everything Lori said, plus time. Thank, Thank you, you, Council Member. Thank you for the brevity and parsimonious response. Thank you. Uh, next, I will be calling on, I would, I'll be inviting uh, Benny Poy to testify. After that, I'll be calling on Mona Davids and then Rukaya Lee. Benny Poy, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. All right, great, thank you. My name is Benny Poy and I'm the Northeast Program Coordinator with the Naleo Educational Fund, where the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials the nation's leading nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that facilitates full Latino participation in the American political process. And we do this from citizenship all the way to public service. We thank Chair Cabrera and the esteemed members of the Committee on Governmental Operations for the opportunity to testify on this very lengthy meeting. So thank you so much for your stamina, um, you know, to talk about some of the issues regarding New York City's implementation of ranked choice voting. Uh, full transparency um, and offering you uh, something that the other speakers have not offered you. I'm probably going to go over about 40 to 50 seconds. <laughs> Next year, New York City will become the first the, the jurisdiction with the largest and most diverse electorate, including the largest Latino electorate in which ranked choice voting will be implemented. We firmly believe that low propensity Latino voters would benefit from a robust, culturally competent and linguistically accessible outreach and education campaign to increase their awareness on the new method of voting and to increase excitement about voting in general. Empowering the Latino community to be actively engaged in elections is even more important now due to the COVID pandemic and its disproportionate effects on the Latino community in terms of fatalities, infection rates, and job loss. City leaders elected in 2021 will be responsible for policymaking decisions that will facilitate recovery efforts, and it is essential that Latinos have a voice in the election of those leaders at this crucial time. Latino voters still face significant obstacles to accessing the ballot. For example, on election day 2020, 87% of the 2,633 calls to our National Election Information and Election Protection Hotline, 1888 Bay Bota, concern basic inquiries about voting. This shows the persistent gap in the way Latino voters receive information and education from election administrators. Longstanding information and accessibility gaps coupled with the implementation of the new method of voting could lead to Latinos being further disenfranchised. The measures in intro 1994 are a good start, but the city needs to do more. Be because of the complexity of RCV, educational materials which do not provide voters with an opportunity to ask questions about the specific issues they may encounter when using RCV will not be sufficient. From our own community engagement efforts on census, naturalization, voting, we know that community members raise questions when provided with trainings or materials and the ability to have live real-time interactions is, criti is critical. This type of engagement was critical to San Francisco's implementation of RCV. The city partnered with community organizations to conduct face-to-face -face workshops, as we heard before, where voters could actually have- Time expired. Thank you, I'm almost wrapping up. Hands-on experience with RCV voting procedures, such, such as, a, as a mock election. In conclusion, this cannot be done without the, without the on-the-ground civic organizations to do this very important work. The city should work with trusted local organizations to offer community members live, real-time interaction that offers them opportunities to raise questions. 
While this kind of face-to-face -face education may not be possible under current public health conditions, community organizations who, who have experience in Census 2020, to echo the point made by Council Member Ampry Samuels, and nonpartisan uh, voter engagement in election 2020 have enormous expertise in using visual tools to reach underrepresented communities, and the city should partner with them as much as possible during the implementation of ranked choice voting. Thank you again for this opportunity to share testimony, and I look forward to working with you all to educate our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Miller, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. No, uh, Benny, I, I just wanted to, uh, I, I just wanted to say that I didn't get this memo as a member of the Latino uh, Legislators Association, so uh, I, I need, probably need to pay my dues, right? So, so because uh, certainly I think that that this would be uh, worthy of a, a really robust conversation amongst the uh, community, and um, it is also. But I would say that. We have amongst the, the caucus members here in New York City that we have we have been engaged um, and and we are not monolithic on this, but have under certainly um, we have taken to account all of the views and 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 of of those members um, and, and and clearly uh, what we have seen is those that are impacted by the, by, by the emerging changes in communities hold different views. And, and, and so uh, we want to take that into account, but also ensure that the voice of the community is being heard. So certainly make sure that I'm on the mailing list in, in the future so that we, we can have this really robust conversation. So um, that, that's it. Uh, and, and I'll throw it back to uh, the chair so he can continue to get us out of here expeditiously. Thank you for your time, Benny. Thank you so much, Councilman. Thank you. I would now like to invite Mona Davids to testify. Mona Davids, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Uh, am I unmuted? Yikes. Yes, you are. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to uh, Chair Cabrera. Uh, to the council members and especially uh, BLAC for, um, for conducting this hearing and providing me the opportunity to testify. My name is Mona Davids. I am the president of Social Impact Strategies, a black African immigrant woman owned business in the Bronx. We are not a nonprofit. Allow me full disclosure to state my company launched a ranked choice voting voter education service at the end of this past October because I was deeply concerned about the lack of RCV voter education in my community and throughout the city. Our RCV voter education is an approved campaign related expense for candidates and their campaigns. We do not charge the general public for our trainings. We seek sponsors to cover those costs. Testimonials from, atten from attendees speak to the high quality of our trainings. We are committed to providing information to the public with the greatest integrity and in full compliance with the letter and intent of the law. In November 2019, I voted no on the referendum for ranked choice voting. I was outspoken about my concerns on the lack of education, about this new electoral system that was being voted on in a low turnout election without enough education to the public on what it is or how it works. The voters in Massachusetts just voted no on their referendum to switch to ranked choice voting. When the Massachusetts voters were interviewed, they said they voted no because they did not understand it and there was not enough information provided to voters to educate them about RCV. New York City voters need to know the layout of the new ballot, how to mark it completely and successfully, how to avoid ballot errors, and how their vote will be counted. The election in which ranked choice voting was voted on had a low turnout, so voters in 2021 may be shocked to see a new configuration on their ballot. I fully understand the position of those who say ranked choice voting must be delayed, because the majority of New Yorkers do not know what it is or how it works. 
I understand why they say the lack of ranked choice voting, voter education will disenfranchise their communities. That's their reason, that's precisely the reason why I started this voter education in late October. I expected a robust, comprehensive, massive city public awareness campaign. Please bear with me, I've waited six hours to say my piece. Public education awareness campaign once ranked choice voting was passed in November 2019, but there was none. I expected the proponents of ranked choice voting to have Zoom webinars when COVID-19 hit and then to launch a mix of citywide in-person and virtual trainings on ranked choice voting when restrictions were lifted. But there was none to our communities, for our senior citizens, or our immigrants in their languages. I understand the Board of Elections was dealing with her with an Herculean task of conducting primary and general elections during a pandemic. I thank and applaud the BOE staff and poll workers for the extraordinary work they did. I have worked as a poll worker and coordinator for the BOE. The Campaign Finance Board, which is mandated under the city charter to provide voter education, has done a great job through their program, NYC Votes, engaging New Yorkers to vote in this year's primary and general election, and with managing the historic number of 2021 candidates registering in their matching funds program. However, I also do believe there still should have been RCV voter education during 2020. The Campaign Finance Board, the Board of Election, ranked choice voting proponents that pushed for this new electoral, electoral system, and you, city council members, and the city all dropped the ball on engaging the public and providing RCV voter education through a public awareness campaign. There is no reason for zero voter education and information to our communities these agencies and the city could have hired additional staff or contracted out the voter education campaign. There could have been mailings, digital campaigns, and information distributed at poll sites in June and November titled, Ranked Choice Voting is Coming to NYC in 2021, What You Need to Know. The same vigor that went into passing this new electoral system should have been applied to educating voters throughout this year. New York City's first RCV races will be two special elections in Queens. If you start wrapping up, or appreciate it. I'm going to wrap up, yes. I do, I lost my train of thought. I'm about to finish. New York City's first RCV elections will be two special elections then followed by special, in Queens and followed by special elections in the Bronx. I do believe that the city can prepare New Yorkers for RCV working together with stakeholders on the ground. But, and this is the most important part, stakeholders must, be proper, must properly understand how RCV works. Two examples that people need to understand that was brought up before. For example, absolutely nobody who claims to provide RCV education should tell voters that it is acceptable to rank just one candidate unless that statement is immediately followed by the warning that ranking just one candidate bullet voting is the fastest and easiest way to get your ballot exhausted and no longer included in the election. The very problem RCV is supposed to solve Another example is voters being told you need 50% to win with RCV. That is incorrect. Candidates need 50% plus one. In closing, lack of voter education equals voter disenfranchisement and voter suppression. Next year's municipal elections are too important. We need all hands on deck. No more excuses. No more delays in educating voters about RCV. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I believe Council Member Miller has a question. Time starts now. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mona, for waiting. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, and, and I will say that this bill was first introduced in July, understanding the, 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 the uh, urgency of it. And, and so um, you, you see, we are just here today. 
and and all of the the nuances of of, of the uh, hearing being changed and 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 so forth. But we are here and we are addressing it. One of the things I, I just want specifically to, to to ask you about the service that you are providing, and, and you said that you had a a tremendous response uh, to uh, to your outreach. Is it culturally competent? Uh, 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 in, in a way that it, it, it really speaks to the needs and the values of the, of the Bronx constituency, as opposed to some of the cookie cut and generic stuff that may come from uh, 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 campaign finance. And, and again, not sure whether or not the, they, they have the type of voice that could put together uh, a package that would be relevant to communities of color. Uh, that would be said, but, you know. Yes, um, cultural intelligence is very important when it comes to our presentations. And um, with, with us, we model and we target um, our presentations and give examples, interactive examples for our attendees that relate to their community, their district. Because we are New Yorkers, we are based here, we are from these various communities throughout the city we customize our presentations according to the attendees of our presentations. And I would like to just add, uh, uh, Councilman, we have conducted presentations where members of the Board of Elections have attended, as well as members of the Campaign Finance Board, and we've conducted attendees for the media because they need to also understand, and we'd be happy to conduct a training for members of the City Council. Thank you, thank you much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, at this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, seeing no hands raised, I will now turn it over to Chair Cabrera for closing remarks. Thank you so much. I want to give a special thanks uh, to my colleagues, uh, many who stayed throughout six and a half hours, over six and a half hours on this hearing. I want to thank uh, the staff who did a marvelous job uh, here today and all the panelists uh, on both sides on these issues. What's clear is we have much work to do. We have to properly fund uh, RCV. If in this limited amount of time that we have left, um, we got much work to do be before us. We got to get this right in light of the fact that uh, it's, we, we have a limited amount of time and we have people who place their trust on a government system and democracy in New York City. And so we're gonna be uh, reviewing uh, all of your testimonies and uh, we're gonna put it into action and to work. And with that, uh, we conclude uh, today's hearing.